Okay, members. Moving on to item three on the order paper. Uh, further consideration stage of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. And I call the Minister of Justice, Naomi Long, to move the bill. I beg to move. Uh, members will have a copy of the Marshall list of amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. Members should note that the Marshall list is dated for the 15th of December, and both it and the grouping list supersede the ones which were issued for the debate that was uh, scheduled to take place on the 7th of December. Members will have received both print and electronic copies of the documents, but additional printed copies are available in the rotunda if needed for the debate. That is the papers for the 15th of December. There are two groups of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in each group in turn. The first debate will be on amendments 1 to 8 and 13, which deal with additional protection for children and support for victims of domestic abuse. The second debate will be on amendments 9 to 12 and 14 to 17, which deal with implementation and operation of the offence and technical matters. I would remind members intending to speak that during the debates on the two groups of amendments, they should address all of the amendments in each group on which they wish to comment. Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the bill, and the question on each will be put without further debate. That's clear then, members. We're happy enough to move on. We now come to the first group of amendments for debate, with Amendment 1 that will be convenient to debate, as I've said, Amendments 2 to 8 and 13. And I call the Minister of Justice, Mr Naomi Long, to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I beg to move Amendment 1. Before turning to the detail of that amendment, I would like to highlight that both prior, and to, uh, prior to and considering uh, following consideration stage, there has been ongoing engagement with the Justice Committee to further develop, refine and improve a number of provisions in the Bill, including the clause on information sharing with schools. As a result, the amendments that I withdrew or did not move ahead of consideration stage have been further enhanced and will better serve the needs of all victims of domestic abuse. I want to thank the committee for their constructive engagement on this. As a result of our collective collaborative uh, efforts, we are able to bring forward further improved provisions in the bill, strengthening how the new offence will operate and be reported upon, as well as the safeguards and protections that will be afforded to victims of domestic abuse and children affected by it. As a result of the constructive engagement with the committee, we are able to make a number of positive changes to the bill provisions. For example, Amendment 1 on information sharing with schools has been widened to include preschools and is greatly expanded upon in terms of the framework of the enabling powers. In addition, the provision on protective measures for victims of abuse, which is the next amendment in this group, now includes a subsection providing that steps or measures to protect individuals are not limited to the notices and orders set out in that clause. The framework for the enabling powers within that clause has also been greatly expanded upon. This would enable other provisions for protective steps and measures to be made, entirely separate from any domestic abuse protection notices and orders. I welcome the Committee's engagement and hope this will allow us to positively progress those amendments today. There will no doubt be a lively debate on the legal aid clauses, and I would ask the House to support my amendments in that respect. I will now turn to the details of the amendments that I am bringing forward and advise the House of my position in relation to the other amendments in this group that the Committee and individual members have tabled. Amendment 1 relates to information sharing with schools to advise them that there has been an incident of domestic abuse the previous evening. The amendment allows for the expansion of the current provisions in terms of the enabling regulation, making powers as well as a number of small textual refinements. This new clause A26 replaces the current provision which would be removed from Clause 28 through Amendment 8. As I have noted earlier, the amendment builds upon, strengthens and improves the current provision in the Bill through more expansively setting out what can be provided for in regulations. <clears throat> the amendment ensures that the regulations can set out who information can be shared with and to, what is deemed to be an education provider, including a school or college, providers of preschool education or any other body, facility or setting that provides education or training of any kind, who are pupils or students of schools, as well as who are education providers. This will include colleges or other bodies, facilities or settings providing education or training programs. 
what a domestic abuse incident concerning a child is, circumstances in which information can be shared, and unauthorised disclosure of information as well as the offences and penalties associated with this. The Justice Committee had asked the preschools be captured within the Bill, both those that form part of a primary school as well as independent entities. This is now provided for with the Department of Education content that early years education should be covered within the Bill. Importantly, the amendment now includes reference to preschool provision outside of a school setting with a school already captured in the Bill. Changes have also been made to the provisions to ensure we can capture instances where a child or young person is educated other than at school, with around 30 such centres across Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, this amendment, which the Committee is supportive of, ensures that the enabling powers are as robust as possible in terms of what can be achieved via regulations and that we have the necessary coverage in terms of what is to be provided for through the scheme going forward. Turning then to Amendment 2, this is a substitute amendment to Clause 26 on protective measures for victims of abuse. Similar to the approach that has been adopted for the information sharing with schools uh, provision, this is intended to build upon and expand the committee amendment, setting out a more detailed framework for the underpinning regulation making powers. This is also another area in which further changes have been made in light of constructive discussions with the Justice Committee. The amendment provides that the regulation powers will enable protection of a person from abusive behaviour and will set out steps or measures that can be taken in connection with this. As I have clearly set out before, my preference remains to reflect the detail of these provisions in the next Justice Bill, the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. However, it is also vital that in order for this enabling power to be effective were it to be utilised, it is as robust as possible. While the amendment provides for the possible scope and introduction of new domestic abuse and protection notices and orders, following further discussions with the committee, it now also ensures that we are not limited to this. Without prejudice to the detail that has been set out in the clause on possible domestic abuse protection notices and orders, the amendment includes a new subsection providing that steps or measures to protect victims of abusive behaviour are not limited to the notices and orders covered in the clause. I would thank the committee for their intervention in that respect. Their deliberations have been an important part of ensuring that the enabling powers are as wide as possible and do not unnecessarily constrain us. This would enable other provision to be made entirely separate from domestic abuse protection notices and orders in order to protect victims of domestic abuse should that be considered necessary. A further key change is that the amendment makes it explicit that requirements including restrictions or prohibitions for notices and orders would apply to children of or living with those for whom protection notices and orders are made. The provision now makes this explicitly clear for the avoidance of any doubt. Before turning to the detail of Amendment 2, members will also wish to note that I have today published for consultation proposals for new domestic abuse protection notices and orders. The new notices, which will be issued by the police, would aim to deliver immediate short-term protection from all forms of domestic abuse, whether physical or non-physical abusive behaviour. The intention would be that these would then be followed up with longer-term protection through domestic abuse protection orders granted by the courts. A domestic abuse protection order would provide flexible, longer-term protection for victims. The duration of orders could be from around six months to one or two years, but could be longer where that is deemed necessary and proportionate. The amendment provides that in relation to protective steps or measures, that this will apply in relation to abusive behaviour and those that are personally connected as set out in Chapter 1 of the Bill. In terms of the detail of the enabling powers, it makes clear that any protective steps or measures can apply in terms of both alleged or proven abusive behaviour. Importantly, in terms of the protection that may be afforded, an offence does not have to be committed and this could be based on the risk of abusive behaviour that is present. The new notices and orders would apply for the purpose of directly protecting those <clears throat> that are aged 16 years or over as well as associated children. Perpetrators or alleged perpetrators would need to be aged 18 or over. This reflects concerns that the new notices and orders could potentially criminalise young people for breach of the notice or order, but where no offence may have been committed. Furthermore, a lower threshold of, say, 16 plus would result in young people potentially being removed from their home, again, where an offence may not have been committed. Both of these age thresholds also reflect the position 
on the domestic violence protection notices and orders that were passed by this House in 2015, as well as draft legislation in England, Wales and Scotland. This is also a position that is supported by the NSPCC, as well as being accepted by the Commissioner for Young People. The enabling powers provide that regulations can make provision about setting out the grounds for giving notices and orders, conditions to be met and the circumstances in which they can be given. It is intended that in the short term the notices and order would set out what requirements could be imposed on individuals in terms of requiring an alleged perpetrator not to contact the victim, not to come within a certain distance of their home, not enter their home or require them to leave the victim's home. The operation of these prohibitions would be introduced, stabilised and mainstreamed ahead of any longer term provisions that would enable positive requirements to be introduced subject to the necessary funding being secured. This could include, for example, <clears throat> a requirement to attend behavioural change or substance misuse programmes or to be electronically monitored, with the latter most likely applying in criminal court cases. The regulations also make provision that would enable domestic abuse protection orders to be made by the criminal, civil or family courts of their own volition during other court proceedings which would not necessarily have to be domestic abuse related but were concerns relating to domestic abuse emerge during those proceedings. Applications could also be made to the court. The court would have the power to extend, vary or revoke the orders. Notification requirements are also provided for under uh, the enabling uh, power, meaning that the notices and orders would require individuals to notify the police of their name and address and of any changes to this information while the measures are in effect. There are also a range of provisions associated with breach of notices and orders um, that this would be an arrestable offence or could be dealt with by way of contempt of court. The provision in relation to complying with the extent of the order would also ensure that we could capture behaviour carried out elsewhere, but which must also have a locus back in Northern Ireland. Turning now to the amendments on legal aid. Amendments 3, 7 and 13. During the consideration stage debate, I made very clear my serious concerns about Clause 27, which currently stands part of the Bill. Since that time, my officials and I have had the opportunity to engage with members of the Justice Committee and with stakeholders to talk about those concerns in more detail. From those discussions, it is clear that we have a shared ambition to help victims who need help. That is the whole purpose of this bill. But it is important that our actions, particularly in such a technically and costly area as legal aid, are considered and evidence-based. Clause 27 is running, and running fast before we can walk. To put it another way, it is like trying to build a house without a clear design and solid foundations. Amendment 7 is simply designed to put those foundations in place, while Amendment 3 focuses Clause 27 in a way that will help victims, and more immediately whilst minimising unintended consequences. The most serious of those unintended consequences, Mr Speaker, in Clause 27 as it stands, it is, is that it is open to exploitation by abusers. That worries me greatly and it should worry all members of this House. Through the current clause, there is nothing to prevent abusers masquerading as victims in order to access legal aid and to use it to continue their campaign of tyranny through the family courts at the public expense. That undermines the entire purpose of what was a well-intentioned provision. To be clear, the feature of the current clause that makes it dangerous in this way to victims is that it allows people to use the waiver to bring as well as to defend applications. If we are going to help all of the people who need protection from the waiver, we will not be able to have the strictest of tests for identifying genuine victims. There will be people who will not have secured a conviction or court order against their abuser and who may not have previously reported their abuse to the police. Those people may still need and deserve help. So we need to set a test that these deserving people can pass. This means, however, that there will also be abusers who could manage to pass that test by trying to pass it dishonestly. What we cannot allow is for these abusers then to use the waiver to access public funds in order to repeatedly drag their victims back into court. The only way to avoid that terrible and perverse outcome is to limit the waiver to people who are defending applications by their abusers. 
This protects victims and locks the door on abusers trying to cheat the system. So Amendment 3 focuses assistance on enabling victims to access legal aid, to defend themselves in family proceedings initiated at the Family Proceedings Court by the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator of domestic abuse. That is my reading of the Assembly's intention in relation to Clause 27, and that is what Amendment 3 is trying to do, to support victims but do it in a targeted way. Cost is, of course, an important consideration. Legal aid is public money, and we all share a common goal of ensuring that scarce public resources are targeted to help those in greatest need. Budgets are under pressure, Mr Speaker, and there is no sign that the Executive's financial position will improve in the next few years. This makes it all the more important that any additional spend on legal aid is focused properly and for the benefit of the most in need and for those who are victims of crime. Clause 27, as it stands, part of the bill, will cost many multiples of what is needed in order to support victims. By our calculations, the current clause could add up to an additional £14 million to the legal aid bill each year. Amendment 3 would reduce that bill considerably by targeting support on those who have the greatest need of it, victims who are defending themselves from cases brought against them by an alleged perpetrator in the family courts in a vexatious manner. I know that for some, Amendment 3 does not go far enough. It will certainly not solve all of the problems that victims of abuse encounter in the family courts. No legal aid provision possibly could. That is why I am also moving Amendment 7 and the ancillary commencement provision at Amendment 14. Amendment 7 will place a duty on the Department to examine and report to the Assembly on what further protections would be useful for victims of domestic abuse involved in Article 8 proceedings. I remain to be convinced that a legal aid waiver is the most effective way to support victims of domestic abuse in the family courts, though I absolutely concede that such support is necessary. Amendment 7, however, gives the Department an opportunity to examine the operation and the effectiveness of the waiver, identify if and where it falls short in the support of victims um, who are in need, and what else needs to be done in order to supplement that. It is about building solid foundations for the future, and so complements Amendment 3. I am keen to ensure that the work on the report gathers and analyses appropriate evidence and involves key stakeholders. I believe that is the best way to ensure the right outcomes for victims in the medium and longer term. Legal aid is a complex and contested area of law, and it interacts in many different ways with the experience of people in contact with the civil courts. Because of how this issue has been introduced into the bill, that detailed research work needed to fully understand the likely implications um, of the cost protections offered has not been able to be undertaken. Therefore, it simply does not make sense to hold firm to the very wide-ranging changes in Clause 27, as it stands with no clear idea of the impact that it would have. So that is why I am urging the House today to support Amendments 3 and 7, while rejecting Amendments 4 and, most critically, Amendment 6. Amendment 3 ensures targeted help now, while the foundations for sustainable, evidence-based, affordable, long-term approach to the problem is developed through the work that will be undertaken if Amendment 7 becomes law. Turning now, Mr Speaker, to the other legal aid amendments, 4, 5 and 6, which essentially undo some of what is being done by Amendment 3 and largely restore Clause 27 as it stands part of the Bill. I will be resisting these amendments to different degrees for reasons that I have outlined. Amendment 4 seeks to broaden the waiver to cover advice and assistance. Advice and assistance is the most basic form of legal aid and is intended to provide limited legal advice on a point of Northern Ireland law, nothing more. It isn't needed in these circumstances, and in passing this amendment, it will create additional cost for no tangible benefit to victims. This is because the types of help offered through advice and assistance are already included as part of the service provided by a solicitor through representation in the lower courts. All of the advice and assistance that a person needs in relation to their case, including access to mediation and other forms of support, are available through the waiver without the need for Amendment 4. It effectively duplicates payment for a service already included within the waiver. Amendment 5 is well-intentioned and designed to extend the waiver to the higher courts. 
I understand and sympathise with the intention and I am concerned about rushing this provision without clear understanding of its impact on victims. But in particular, applying the waiver at this level will interact in a complex and ambiguous way with the other rules for the calculation of contributions that people need to pay towards their own costs. This could lead, for example, to quite high contributions being paid by people of limited means and very low contributions being paid by people of much greater means. In my view, victims of abuse would be better served by careful consideration of how existing and, if necessary, new protections can be used to protect those who need it. This is one of the issues that I feel should ideally be explored through the report envisaged at Amendment 7. However, Mr Speaker, in the event that Amendment 5 is adopted, it may be that as a result of those reports that we bring to the Assembly, we will need further legislation um, in order to address any issues of how it interacts. So while I am not in favour of the amendment, I do accept that there is merit in it. And therefore, while I will not support it, I will leave it to members of the House to judge for themselves whether or not they feel it should stand part of the bill. The vast majority of family proceedings start in the lower courts. 80% of cases are heard there. And with increased access to legal aid, there should be less and less reason for people to have to need recourse to the higher courts as access to justice in the lower courts should be significantly improved. For the other 20% of cases, a better approach would be to use the existing discretion available to the Director of Legal Aid Casework around the application of the financial eligibility test to support those victims who need to defend proceedings in the higher courts and allow time for the work proposed in Amendment 7 to examine whether this or an alternative is the best long-term way of supporting victims. For these reasons, I will not personally be supporting Amendment 5, but as I say, I will leave it to members of the House. I will, yes. Uh, the Minister for giving way, but can the Minister outline how many times the existing discretionary power that the Director for Legal Services Agency has has been used in the higher courts? Um, I can give the member an answer to that question because she has asked it before and it has not been used to date. And it is one of the reasons why, in moving this legislation, we intend to actually define how that would be applied, that discretion would be applied in order that it can be used in future. So with due respect to the member, looking at what has happened to date is not really a good place to start. It is looking what will happen from here on that really matters. And the importance of defining when that waiver would be able to be used in the higher courts is the part I think that is of most value. Um, and that is what we're intending to do because the waiver has not been able to be used um, up to date simply because of the risk of appeal and challenge against it because it is so poorly defined. It is the intention of the Department, obviously, to address that particular issue in response to the fact that this has been raised by a number of members. As I've said, however, Mr Speaker, Amendment 6 is by far the most problematic of the three amendments. It seeks to broaden the scope of legal aid waivers significantly. It enables individuals not only to defend themselves, but also to initiate Article 8 proceedings. The breadth of this application makes it much easier for a perpetrator to access legal aid to continue their campaign of abuse by masquerading as a victim. This is not a hypothetical or potential side effect. It is a gaping hole in the provision that we can be sure a coercive and controlling abuser will seize upon. We cannot, Mr Speaker, allow that to happen. Of course, my department will provide guidance to the Legal Services Agency on the definition of a victim of domestic abuse that will try to reduce the risk. However, against the backdrop of a very broadly drawn legal waiver as envisaged by Amendment 6, this risk cannot be removed entirely without defining very tightly the definition of a victim through guidance. This would mean that some genuine victims of abuse would then be excluded from help. That, in my view, would be wrong. In the event that Amendment 6 is adopted, however, there may be no other safe course of action. It would therefore be far better to reject Amendment 6 while supporting Amendment 3. By taking this course, we would be able to focus support on helping genuine victims to defend themselves in family proceedings brought by their abuser in a vexatious and controlling manner. In tandem, the Department will, through Amendment 7, invest time and energy in examining if and in what circumstances victims should be able to benefit from legal aid when initiating proceedings. I strongly commend that approach to the House. Turning finally to Amendment 13, I have been very clear that there are potentially large and currently unquantified risks associated with the introduction of the waiver. 
not least as regards the possibility that it could have repercussive financial impacts both here and in other UK jurisdictions. I have asked members not to introduce commencement provisions that would lock us into a course of action that we might all later come to regret. This amendment continues to take us down that unwise path. We have now decoupled the abuse provisions and the commencement of abuse provisions from the commencement of the legal aid provisions. However, this amendment would still require um, that we commence the legal aid provisions regardless of any advice that we receive um, and regardless of whether it is repercussive. I receive suggestions that if following proper economic appraisal of the waiver provisions in this bill, it is considered too unsafe to allow them to come into effect, they could simply be repealed. This is an extraordinary approach to making legislation. It is also wholly unnecessary. Mr Speaker, I have given a commitment and I give it again today. Minister, I thank you for moving the bill. Firstly, I think it has to be said. But on Amendment 13, could the Minister at least recognise that there is not a lot of confidence in this place beyond these four walls? And particularly regarding this bill, there is not a lot of confidence from the stakeholders that this commencement will happen unless it is on the face of the bill. And I appreciate the Minister has given assurances in other places. But would the Minister give an assurance in this House, on this floor, on Hansard, that she will be held account for for the remainder of her term. The commencement will happen on this. Well, Mr Speaker, had the member not intervened, um, I was about to give such a commitment on the record in the House, and I'll give it again today. Um, I will do the work necessary to understand the impacts of these provisions. I will share the analysis that is produced, and if it is safe to do so, I will commence the provisions in good time. That is the commitment made by an Executive Minister to the Assembly here today. I, we, Mr Speaker, we must continue to work on the basis of trust, and we must, if we want to raise expectations of our standing in the community, be willing also to trust each other when we make such commitments. I trust that this assurance will satisfy members. To require an alternative approach that might needlessly tie up Assembly time and legislative drafting resources in a very short term with a considerable amount of drafting pressure I think is unprecedented and unnecessary. But further to my commitment, Mr Speaker, there is already a case before the Law Lords that sets this out in, in, in clarity, that where a minister has a piece of legislation that requires commencement, they cannot simply opt not to commence that legislation. That is already decided in the case before the Law Lords in 1995. So a minister is compelled to commence all, all parts of that legislation other than where there is very good reason not to do so. And very good reason not to do so would need to be something off the scale of the repercussive costs in the rest of the UK. So members, if they do not wish to put their faith in me, can put their faith in the law. And it would be right, I think, for the Justice Committee above all to have faith in the law. So I'm asking members, Mr Speaker, to accept my assurance in that of the law on this point and to reject Amendment 13. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister. And as question time begins at 2 p.m., I would ask the House to take its ease until then. This debate will continue after question time, when the next contributor will be the chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Mr. Paul Given. Please take your ease. Thank you.
Okay, members. Uh, it's time for questions to the Minister of Health, and I call Martina Anderson to ask the first question. Martina Anderson. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I intend answering questions 1, 8, 12, and 15, uh, along with question 1. So, if I could ask for additional time in this response. Mr. Speaker, this response, uh, as I say, will also answer questions 8, 12, and 15. Northern Ireland has been planning for the deployment of the COVID-19 vaccine for many months, and along with the other devolved administrations, will adhere to the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation advice on the prioritisation of the vaccine. JCVI have advised that the first priorities for any COVID-19 vaccination programme should be the prevention of COVID-19 mortality and the protection of health and social care staff and systems. Secondary priorities should include vaccination of those at increased risk of hospitalisation and at increased risk of exposure and to maintain resilience in essential public services. The model for vaccine deployment has been designed to be pragmatic, agile and flexible. Teams of vaccinators have been trained uh, for a range of professional backgrounds and in addition to extant HSC staff and primary care staff, in addition to that, 870 individuals have now submitted application forms to help out at, as vaccinators during the vaccination programme. Phase 1 of the programme officially began on Tuesday, the 8th of December, with all four UK countries launching their vaccination programmes. In Northern Ireland, the programme began at the Belfast Trust vaccination site, where vaccinators from across Northern Ireland were invited to receive the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. All the trusts intend to start vaccinating health and social care workers from the week commencing the 14th of December, although in light of the planned delivery schedules of the vaccine in December and January, the staff programme will now have to be phased, starting with those at greatest risk or working directly with patients at the greatest risks. Ultimately, all health and social care workers will have the opportunity to be vaccinated, which is expected to be within the first quarter of 2021. There will be seven trust vaccination sites operating in Northern Ireland. These will be located at the Royal Victoria Hospital, the Ulster Hospital Dundonald, uh, South Lakes Leisure Centre in Craigavon, the Seven Towers Leisure Centre in Ballymena, the Foyle Arena in London Derry, Oma Leisure Centre in Oma, and the Lakeside Leisure Centre in Enniskillen. My officials have worked closely with the MRHA to develop a deployment model that will enable deployment in care homes and which takes into account the unique characteristics of this vaccine, which includes transport requirements. Teams from health trusts will be vaccinating care home residents, working closely with local GPs on their comprehensive health trust governance arrangements designed to ensure the integrity and efficacy of the vaccine is maintained throughout. Trust mobile vaccination teams intend to visit all the homes over the next few weeks, subject to dealing with any that have a current COVID-19 outbreak. We are currently considering how arrangements might be extended to include the over 80s living in the community, and due to the logistics, the strict handling conditions attached to the use of the Pfizer vaccine, it is very difficult to deploy the vaccine in a GP setting, but every effort is being made to try and arrange for either a trust-based or GP-based programme for the over 80s. From early January 21, subject to the availability of a suitable vaccine, it is intended to roll out the programme through primary care-led vaccination clinics, which will be responsible for the vaccination of the vast majority of eligible individuals over 50, 50 years over. GPs will work their way down through the eligible cohorts, starting with the oldest first. While the start of the vaccination programme is highly positive development, I must stress that it will be months before the vaccination programme is complete and we are entering an extremely challenging winter for the NHS in Northern Ireland. And I cannot stress enough the importance that the population follows the public health advice to drive down infections. Uh, Martina Anderson, supplementary. Uh, going me all good and Ira, thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, by common consent, the British government has been somewhat shambolic in their handling of this um, pandemic since the outset of it. I can't point to a single thing that they've got right. So, given what you said about the vaccine, I think it's unfortunate uh, that we have to depend on them for the supply of it. But in light of what you said about the phased mm -hmm. approach, Minister, can you guarantee that all healthcare and social care workers will have vaccine access to the vaccine within a clearly defined time frame, particularly the staff at Alton Gavin Hospital and domiciliary care workers who have been under considerable pressure for a, a very long time? Um. I thank the member for her comments, but as I'm sure she'll be aware, I don't agree 
uh, with them in regards to the vaccine. I think if we had been left to our own to procure this vaccine, we would neither have the buying power nor the financial capability to pre-buy uh, seven different vaccines to the extent that we have, or to be able to provide the accreditation and certification that MRHA has provided to us to allow us to be part of some of the first delivery of vaccines uh, across the world. Uh, we are now into our care homes and vaccinating care home staff and residents. So, in regards to the delivery of vaccines, we have already received upwards of 50,000 of the Pfizer vaccine, which allows us to vaccinate just over 20,000 individuals. And as I said, the JVCI, which is the Joint Committee on Vaccine and Immunisation, has a clear priority of those who receive the vaccine on uncertain levels. So, in regards to can I guarantee access to vaccine? Um, yes, I can, because we are part of that UK pre-buying, which will see a massive number of vaccines made available to us, and additional vaccines, once they receive the MRHA uh, accreditation and approval, will also be part of that additional programme. I call Pam Cameron. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. And can I just put on record my thanks to the British Government for for first of all um, coming up with this incredible vaccine at this time and being the first in the world to do so and also um, ma ma ensuring that Northern Ireland is part of that supply as is the rest of the UK. Um, in terms of the vaccination programme, I wanted to ask the Minister that you know, once the vaccination programme has completed within an individual care home, um, will the visitation then be relaxed and how soon will we see that happen given that many care home residents um, are often in the last years or months of their life? Um, I, I thank the member for, for the point that she makes and as I think as we've been clear in the past it's not the initial vaccine that's the important one, it's the second one and then giving it time to actually have that effic efficacy uh, kick in. I can give her an update that as of today we have had our vaccination teams across all five trusts and have vaccinated up to 54 care homes. Uh, so we have started with those with the largest number of residents and that will be in the region of just shy of 4,000 individuals, which includes care home residents, care home workers and also our vaccination teams themselves. So while the vaccine does provide a crucial tool, and allowing visiting to take part, we have to make sure that we not only get that first vaccine in place, but follow up with the second vaccine. And would encourage that as many residents and staff members take up the offer that is there of a free vaccine uh, delivered through the, the NHS and also supported and paid for by the British government. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, can I also put on record my thanks to the UK government for ruling out the vaccine first across the whole of the world? Um, could I ask the, the Minister, could he outline plans for the rollout of the vaccine in North Down and potential venues that they might be looking at? Um, I, I thank the member for his uh, ask for a press release. Um, I can give him, give him the update as well that there have been no geographical specific priorities for any area. It will stick uh, strictly by the JCVI uh, accreditation and deliberation of those who need it. Most, as I said earlier, the, the venues uh, that will be taken in the, in the, in the Southern Trust is the South Lakes uh, Centre in Craigavon, and then in the South Eastern Trust will be the Ulster Hospital at Dundonald. So those programmes will start up for our initial programmes, but the care homes as well will also be, be, be in, in receive the vaccination within the members' constituency as well for the residents um, and the staff as well. I call Michelle McLevin. Speaker. Um, I thank the member for her question. Training for those administering the COVID-19 vaccine is mostly completed online. Uh, the HSC Clinical Education Centre has provided some one-to-one -one training within the existing service level agreement, and there have to date been no additional costs. Uh, I thank, thank the Minister for his answer. Can I ask what consideration is being given to review the policy? The only nurses who retired after 2015 can be added to the NMC register, when clearly there are a sizable number of qualified people who retired prior to that date who could assist with the vaccination programme. Um, 
the member makes a, a valid point in regards to, to the timeliness of the cut-offs of the accreditation. If there is anybody individually she does know of, I'd gladly receive you know, contact details for them. I have been contacted by a number of GPs who find themselves in exactly that same, same point where the timeline that has been set, where they can engage and maybe after an hour, an hour, an hour and a half online training. They can be part of the vaccination programmes. If the members have individuals that they do know of, I'm, I'm happy to take them forward because we are, you know, we are encouraged by the high number of people who have come forward to be part of this very important programme, 870 to date, uh, who are going through a process of what will hopefully be mass vaccination programmes across the entirety of Northern Ireland, including North Down. I call Colin Gildernew. Uh, I would ask Janet Corlea and thank you to the Minister for the answers. Minister, the Public Health Agency has been uh, in, in common with many agencies but clearly been greatly challenged by the significant demands of COVID-19. Will you ensure that the lessons learned and the experience gained over the past recent months is retained so that the Public Health Agency emerges from this crisis with uh, greater and wider capacity? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question. I'm, I'm, I'm unsure how it links in with the, the, the main substance of, of the question that uh, the member for Strangford actually asked, but I can do that. We have seen expansive uh, uh, investment not only in finance but also in people in regards to the PHA to ensure that they can complete all the duties that they have been doing over, over this pandemic, including what has been a very impressive increase in the test, trace and protect system, where they are now uh, contacting well over 90% well over of, of those targets within a 24-hour period and a 48-hour period, then to the lesser extent, uh, to a far more effective level. Uh, than other parts of, of, the juristic, of, of the devolved administrations. So the strength that we have in our public health agency has been uh, added to, has been improved and will continue to be invested in. And the, the First and Deputy First Minister, uh, along with myself, visited our test, trace and protect system in the PHA building in the County Hall in Balamina on Friday. And as far as I'm aware from, from their press statements and their public statements, they were very impressed with what they saw in the service being delivered. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I thank you for your answer so far. And Minister, I welcome the high quality and training that's been given to the vaccinators that maintain our health services' high professional standards. Can you, Minister, tell the House this afternoon how many vaccinators have so far been employed by your, depar by your department to administer the vaccine? Um, I, I thank the member for, for her answer. And I think, as I said, and the answer to the, the initial question, I think we have 870. Um, people who have come forward to be part of that vaccination programme. They are part of the initial wave of those who actually receive the vaccine. Um, so that's, as I say, 870 individuals have now submitted application forms to help out as vaccinations during the vaccination programme. And of course, they are also supported by administrative workers and delivery workers and everybody else who, who's playing a vital role in pharmacy as well in making sure that we can get this, this vaccine delivered uh, during the, the very strict delivery processes that need and management protocols that are in place. Moving on, I call Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, and Deputy Speaker, if we indulge, uh, maybe ask for a little extra time in, in addressing this, which is an important, important subject. Elective care waiting times were unacceptable before COVID-19, and unfortunately, they will, they will be even worse after COVID-19, because the need to redirect HSC resources to respond to the pandemic has had an inevitable and serious impact on waiting lists. The spread of coronavirus has continued to cause serious disruption to our health and social care system, and it was unavoidable that elective care activity would reduce due to the need to redeploy staff to COVID-related activity. In the wake of the first wave of the pandemic, I was clear that rebuilding services across all programmes of care, including elective, while protecting staff and the public from COVID-19, was a key priority for the health service. And thanks to the huge efforts of our health service staff, much progress was made to restart of elective care services. During the first wave, our health and social care system delivered 12,150 new outpatient consultations in April, and there were 29,163 in October. In terms of inpatient or day case procedures, 4,859 were delivered in April, and that compared to 13,301 in October. 
Similarly, there were 39,907 outpatient reviews in April, compared with 56,071 in October. Overall, there were over 73 per cent more activity in October than there was in April. Our surge and rebuild plans were effective in keeping services going. Each trust surpassed its target for the period of July to September, but the pandemic has undoubtedly exacerbated what was already a crisis with waiting times. And given the reduction in the level of elective activity that can be delivered by trusts as they focus their efforts on responding to the pandemic, trusts have been utilising the local independent sector capacity to support uh, the delivery of core health services activity and rebuilding our services. And during the period of the 1st of April to the 15th of November, approximately 3,500 patients have had their procedure carried out in the independent sector, and that was paid for by the health service. And rebuilding services trusts have taken into account of new and innovative practices that have introduced during the first wave of the pandemic. For example, the use of technology such as telephone and virtual clinics to a much greater extent. Outpatient appointments have, where possible and where appropriate, moved to telephone appointments. And in addition, a growing number of specialities are adopting virtual clinics using video conferencing which will embed those recent innovations will be essential to maximise elective activity during the pandemic and into the future. Waiting lists were a clear priority in New Decade New Approach. However, these plans have been delayed by the pandemic, and I am conscious that public spending is likely to be very constrained next year, and that all departments will be facing seriously funding pressures. Tackling waiting lists will not be possible without sustained and substantial investment and additional staffing. Call Robin Newton for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his, his uh, very detailed answer. And it's obviously a subject that uh, he is taking uh, very seriously. I do want to pay tribute to the Minister in the sense that when I have raised matters uh, around the waiting list or when procedures will take place, he has always been extremely helpful uh, in that, in that uh, regard. Can I ask you, Minister, though, the, the picture you've painted is rather a bleak picture for those who are perhaps in the uh, diagnostic area wanting uh, treat, wait, awaiting treatments, cancer patients, diabetes patients. Uh, I assume from what you've said, Minister, that you will be making a bid uh, to the executive for increased funding uh, in the forthcoming de days. And if that, if that funding becomes available, when might we expect to see waiting lists come down to what approaching a normal situation? Um, I, I thank the, the member for, for his pertinent question. In regards to, to bidding, of course, I will be bidding to, for, for as much as I can possibly chance my arm in regards to how we can tackle these waiting lists. As I said, when I took up this post back in January, it was an executive priority. There were additional monies under new decade, new approach assigned to that because as an executive, as an assembly and as a society we, we realised that our waiting lists were too long, they have got longer uh, and we are looking now about how we actually reconfigure some of our services um, from day elective units uh, in Lagan Valley which I, which I visited last week where the surgeons, the nurses and the staff themselves have um, what I would call exciting plans about how they can reconfigure how we del deliver services across Northern Ireland. One of the things we've seen coming out of COVID is a breaking down of silos that weren't, weren't, weren't created either intentionally or systemically, but just grew up over time. We've seen now surgeons from Belfast willing to travel to the Swall and take lists and patients with them to make use of our facilities that are in another part of, of Northern Ireland. So we're no, look, no longer looking at simply working in trusts or trying to centralise services. We're now looking at a regional approach, which I am hopeful once we get through this pandemic, and I firmly believe we will, that the new working procedures and the new collaborations that we've seen across a number of specialities uh, and a number of disciplines will make a, seriously dent, a serious dent into our waiting list. But it is necessitated on the additional funding that we need to be able to do that, because through that funding we can support more staff to actually deliver the services we need. I call Emma Sheeran. Ken Corley, Minister, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, in the past, um, some have used the cross-border directive um, as a means of getting treated in the 26 counties um, because of the long waiting lists. Minister, what actions have you taken to ensure that this method is still available post-Brexit? 
Um, that, that, that negotiation is, uh, our conversation is ongoing, not just with ourselves, but also between the Irish Government and Westminster as well, because some parts of it are devolved, but some parts of it are actually centralised as well. So there, there's a three-way conversation going on at this minute in time uh, with officials. Uh, there's a North-South Ministerial Council meeting due uh, in a few days' time where we will raise that subject again because we're fully aware uh, of not just uh, patients from Northern Ireland travelling to the Republic of Ireland, but also large numbers of patients from the Republic of Ireland coming into Northern Ireland for cataract operations and such. But we already have, and I think as we touched on yesterday, a number of cross-border working uh, relationships, uh, children's uh, cardiac surgery, uh, been performed in Dublin, the support that we can provide in Alton Galvin for, for cancer services and palliative care. Those all work extant of Brexit. They're, they're, they are negotiations and, and relationships that we have with the Irish Government, so they'll be able to continue, uh, as we already have, and we continue to build on those as well, even in regards to how we uh, can provide some kidney transplant and organ transplant uh, services from members of the Irish Republic. I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his answer so far. Would the Minister have an update on the waiting lists in the Western Trusts, uh, which was recently identified as, as some, of the, some of the highest waiting lists in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the Member for her question. It is not statistics that I, I have to hand today, but I can certainly provide her with an update. But as I say, when we look at waiting lists now a number of, across a number of disciplines, uh, we are now looking at a more regionalised approach. Um, what I would like to see is the same level of access to a procedure, no matter where somebody lived in Northern Ireland, not, a, not dependent solely on where their trust was and the capacity was, was solely in one trust. And I think it's one of the things, as I said earlier, that we have seen through COVID uh, and coming out of COVID is that greater collaboration of surgeons willing to travel, of patients willing to travel, and of, as, as of us actually delivering the services to people when they need it, not, also, not always on their doorstep. And I think that, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, some of the challenges that we have politicians often face within our health service where um, the campaign starts to try and retain everything um, on our doorstep. But when we see now that patients are willing to travel and health professionals are willing to travel, I think this place uh, will be well placed actually to support the work that our health service is willing to do in regards to how it tackles our waiting list, but also supports the patients uh, that it wants to see and wants to support. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. With regards to waiting lists and pressures, Minister, I'm led to believe that there are no neonatal cots available at any hospital in Northern Ireland, and indeed even on the island of Ireland. Minister, can you clarify if this is the position, and if it is, what urgent action is being taken so that um, transfers are being avoided to GB? Thank you. Um, I thank the member for, for her question. I'm unsure exactly of, of the term neonatal courts and, and what she actually means or at what point of time uh, none are available. But if, if you look on the, the departmental website, we cover the number of ICU beds that are also always available uh, and, and paediatrics. I don't think at any time that that has shown them being completely full. Um, so I'm happy to take the, the matter specifically up with the member after this. But in regards to that transferability between us being able to, to transfer patients, especially paediatric patients, to the Republic of Ireland, we have a relationship built up there, especially in critical care, where patients, if need be, can move either direction, north-south or south to north as well, but also east-west as well, because, uh, as I'm fully aware as well, when, when we do need uh, to send some of our, our patients and more, more, the more vulnerable children when they do need some of the specialist surgeries. We do have access to those operations and those skilled professionals in Birmingham Hospital and Evelina Hospital as well, so those working relationships are there. But in regards to the specific issue that the member raises and, and no neonatal cots available on the island, we'll follow that up if she can provide the detail. Moving on, I call John O'Dowd. Uh, can call you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. On case ever question number four. Um, I, I thank the member for his question. Uh, the executive ha has discussed this matter many times and has sought uh, numerous pieces of legal advice. And I am pleased to report that the executive agreed to my latest proposals at our meeting uh, last Tuesday. The Regional Business Services Organisation has now been instructed to make the necessary arrangements for reimbursement of any deductions previously made to pay. 
call John O'Dowd for something. Uh, thank you, Minister. And the question was obviously tabled before the very welcome announcement uh, last week. I may claim in the press that my question forced you to do it, <laughs> but uh, it is a very welcome uh, announcement. Can the Minister indicate as to whether uh, those nurses will have this money in their wage packets before the Christmas break? I thank the member, and look, he won't be the only one who'll take credit for my announcements because, like anything else, success uh, and delivery has many fathers. Um, the payments will be made, as hoped that the payments will be made by my business services organisation, and they will be in the December payroll. Um, BSO has done a tremendous amount of work since I gave the direction to try and get this into place, and I can guarantee if it's not in the December payroll, they will definitely be paid in January, so our intention is to get it out to as many as possible before Christmas. And I want to thank and congratulate our business services organisation for moving so swiftly uh, to deliver this. Nicole Mark Dorgan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Does the Minister acknowledge the vital role played by our student nurses and midwives working alongside our paid albeit underpaid, health workers in extremely circumstances, and will he reconsider the decision not to pay them for their priceless contribution at this time, when the situation due to COVID appears as perilous as ever? That is yet another question clearly beyond the original question uh, the Minister may or may not choose to answer. Um, I, I, I thank the, the Deputy Speaker for his direction, but I often ask, answer many questions in here. Uh, in regards to, he talks about a decision being made, can I just clarify um, that in regards to the payment of student nurses, it's the regular requirement that nursing and midwifery students complete 2,300 clinical placement hours to be able to join the registry of nursing and midwifery council. Um, these emergency standards actually ended. Uh, on the 30th of September, with students returning to supernumerary status. There are no plans to reinstate these arrangements at the present time. It is a UK-wide uh, position. The Nursing and Midwifery Council have issued a joint statement, uh, which was signed by the four UK Chief Nursing Officers, confirming the present position on keeping programmes on track and safeguarding the supernumerary status. So, as members will be aware, that is a decision that was taken by the Nursing Midwifery Council uh, in regards to meeting their requirements uh, for students to be able to complete the 2,300 clinical placement hours. So, it is not the fact uh, that we do not value the work that they do. We do. Uh, we greatly value the work they do and the commitment that they give to those roles, even in a training capacity. Uh, but the statement has been made by the Nursing and Midwifery Council in regards to the supernumerary status of nursing students. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers so far. Uh, I wanted to ask the Minister around the whole strike issue, whether he is concerned that nurses will be forced to strike again in future, given there has been no movement on the safe staffing legislation uh, to date. In, in regards to that, I, I do not see any uh, opportunity where where nurses should be moved to, to strike, uh, because I do not recognise uh, the statement that there has been no movement to date in safeguard, safe, safe st staffing. There has been engagement and conversations uh, in regards to what the terms of reference like on engagement between my department and workforce planning and the unions involved. The member will be fully aware that I gave a commitment uh, and the executive gave a commitment when we were able to bring the nurses and our healthcare workers off the picket line. Uh, earlier this year that not just pay party, but safe, safe staffing was also a priority uh, for both me and uh, my department, uh, but not just them, but also the executive as well. So that work is ongoing. Uh, there are a number of avenues being looked at, whether we follow the Scottish model or the Welsh model, whether it requires legislation or a framework model as well, and what can be done uh, and what time actually we have left in the rest of this mandate as bringing forward that legislation to make sure that the safe staffing and the rest of the framework commitments that the executive signed up to are delivered. I call Sinead Ennis, but you may not get a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, question five, please. Um, I, I thank the member for her question. On the 10th of December, my department issued additional guidance on Christmas visiting arrangements in care home settings. It is available on the NI Direct and Department of Health websites. This additional guidance emphasises that care homes should recognise the right to a family life for those in care homes 
and in particular the importance many people attach to seeing family and friends over the Christmas period. Care homes are asked to make particular efforts at this time to facilitate visiting in line with the regional visiting guidance by offering a range of options for visiting. That includes indoor visiting rooms or areas, visiting pods, outdoor visiting and virtual visits that can take place in line with the care home's visiting policy. Visits into care homes are preferable to those out of care homes uh, by the residents. Longer visits away from the home carry greater risk and shorter visits. A daily for a few hours are therefore preferable if a visit away from the care home is to take place. If a visit out of the care home has agreed, a number of measures to mitigate the risk of bringing infection back into the care home are identified. While away from the care home, the resident should only be in contact with one household bubble. Members of this bubble should strictly limit their contacts with others in the two weeks before a visit from the care home resident. Other precautions, such as good personal hygiene and regular hand washing by everyone, should be maintained. And on returning to the home, even if only visiting away for a few hours, the resident will have to self-isolate. The impact of this period of isolation on the resident, as well as the care home's ability to accommodate such periods of self-isolation, should be carefully considered by the resident, families, friends and care home staff in any discussions. But I recognise the need for families to come together at Christmas, but it is critical that we keep doing everything we can to stop the virus spreading while we begin the process of vaccinating those considered most at risk from coronavirus. And that is the end of our period of time for our uh, listed questions to the Minister of Health. And we now move on to topical questions. And I call Joanne Bunning. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister when does he anticipate a move to rapid testing regime for care homes, please? Um, I, I thank the member for, for her question in regards to the support that we've given to care homes. Uh, you know, it is a welcome indicator today that we have are, are managing uh, 87 care homes that have outbreaks, although it's a challenging, for, challenging time for those homes and the residents in them. It's good to see that we are beginning to see that, that decrease and that has been brought about um, by the testing regime that we currently have in place, where we test weekly. What we've actually seen now is a greater ability to identify asymptomatic uh, residents and staff due to the weekly programme. And of those, um, of those 87 confirmed homes, um, only 40 are currently showing symptomatic, so our weekly testing programme has picked those up. So moving to the mass testing programme that we have seen being piloted in parts of South East England. It is something that my expert advisory group on testing is keeping an eye on to make sure that we can use that testing to the maximum efficiency and efficacy as well to sort of facilitate not just support for the care home residents and staff, but also allow safer visiting as well. Bunning for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for his answer. So moving now towards the vaccine, he'll be aware that there are numerous people who have underlying conditions which prevents them from taking the vaccine, um, but they remain vulnerable um, and will do until an alternative is found. When does he envisage something will be available to protect those people who have underlying conditions and who remain vulnerable in these circumstances? Uh, and again, I, I thank the, the member for, um, for, for that question in regards to vaccines. I suppose one of the things that we have been working closely with, and that's why we take our guidance from MRHA, MRHA and the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation in regards to what vaccines are suitable for certain particular cohorts. Uh, it is a welcome step that the Pfizer one is suitable and being able to use in care home residents and staff because we can get that, and we have got that vaccination programme started. As I said earlier, just over 4,000 people vaccinated to date um, since we received that accreditation. Uh, and as, it's, as each vaccine comes forward, as been accredited by MRHA, we look at the Green Book guidance as to see what clinical uh, groups it's suitable for, but also to ensure what clinical groups it's not suitable for. And that's the guidance and training that are given to all our vaccinators before they actually go out to deliver a vaccine to an individual. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, um, Principal Speaker. Um, Minister, it's my understanding that the PHA dedicated education tracing team will close for Christmas on the 23rd of December at 4 o'clock. Given some pupils across Northern Ireland will be in school on the 21st and 22nd of December, can you confirm who will be responsible for the contact tracing of any pupils who test pos positive after that time? The PHA's contact tracing team themselves, the greater team will take over that, but it has been the work of a very specialised cell uh, to support principals and staff. 
call on Kelly Armstrong for supplementary. And can I ask, as a parent of a pupil in Northern Ireland, parents aren't aware of how to report this because the children will be out of school at that stage. Will there be any um, work done by the PHA and yourselves to make sure that that goes through the education system before children finish for Christmas? Um, in regards to, to that specific guidance will be provided, I'm sure, by the Education Authority to schools, um, but I'll ask and ensure the PHA does carry forward that communication so that that clear line of sight and guidance is there and accessible. But should I say, no, any child that does present with symptoms um, of COVID-19 goes through the same process as an adult when it comes to identifying or access testing, then after that point, should they not be in school? Call Declan McLear. Minister, in response to a previous question, you indicated that residents of care homes have a requirement to isolate for 14 days following an outside visit. Um, there are situations where many care homes simply do not have that capacity. And what would be your advice to uh, care homes on how to respond to this? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member, and that is part of the guidance that we've given to the, the care home visit actually over Christmas. It is important that for those uh, individuals and families who are able to take someone out of a home for that family visit, but as, you know, over a special time of year as well, that we also take the same precautions uh, when that individual returns to the care home as well. So there are uh, additional pressures, and that's what I said in regards to someone refer or coming back into a care home as well, that on returning to the home, uh, the resident will have to isolate, and the impact of that period of isolation on, on the resident has to take, be taken into consideration. So, so for what may be a supportive and welcome three hours respite over a Christmas period, um, back into the family home also has to be balanced by the challenges, even to that individual of the period of self-isolation, that they will have to, to take part in uh, when they return to the home. So that's why I, I, I've said in, in an earlier answer that should be carefully considered um, by the residents, by families, by friends, and the care home staff, because of course the more uh, more residents that leave a care home and return, the more pressure it will put on some of the care home facilities in regards to being able to provide that support of self-isolation. Um, the Minister will also be aware that the visiting restrictions also remain in place in uh, maternity wards, for example. Um, has the Minister any um, plans to review this in the coming weeks? Um, our, our visiting policies is something that we keep um, under constant review, uh, especially in regards to where we see the coronavirus um, spread across the community as well. So where we see increased community spread, we also have to add additional uh, restrictions uh, to visiting capacity as well. So until we get into a place where we see a continued reduction in the number of COVID cases that are active uh, in our community, it is highly unlikely that we will see a massive change in any visiting policy. Uh, in regards to hospitals, because what we also must remember, even coming up to Christmas, as the member's original question was about, the virus doesn't recognise time of year, calendar, or social events, so we always have to bear the same due care and caution no matter what time of year. I call Doug Beatty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the, the Minister. Maybe we we'll get away from COVID a little bit and, and focus on some uh, good news stories that sometimes get missed. Uh, with all the doom and gloom, and we might even break a smile on the minister's face. Uh, but come the 21st uh, of March, 2020, uh, sorry, come uh, March 2021, Northern Ireland will be the only part of the UK uh, without an opt-out organ donation system. And therefore, I welcome the minister's decision to run a consultation on the soft-out um, option. Can the minister outline the next steps of the process once the consultation closes in February? Um, I, I thank the member. Um, I, I try to smile occasionally. <laughs> It's not easy being an Ulster Unionist, but um, <laughs> what I will say, say to the member, and he'll be, he will be fully aware you know, of the work that was originally commenced on this issue by our party colleague, Joanne Dobson. Um, so it is something that we as a party have committed to in the past, and that's why I was pleased to launch the public consultation on the introduction of a statutory soft update system um, earlier this week. The consultation runs to the 19th of February. Uh, at that point, my department will publish details of public engagement events uh, that will take place in the new year to ensure that all stakeholders have an opportunity to hear about the proposals and submit their responses. Legislation will be required to give effect to these proposals um, following the consultation period. It is therefore my intention to bring a draft bill to the Assembly at the earliest opportunity, subject to the advice of the Office of the Legislative Council. 
if feasible, within the current mandate and the agreement of the executive to proceed. And I would encourage everyone to read about the consultation and submit a, a response on the department's website. In the meantime, I urge everyone to discuss their wishes about organ donation and their family and friends, and look forward to the support of the health committee as well, and also bring them forward the, the legislation as expedient and as quick as possible. I call Doug Beatty for supplementary. Uh, th thanks, Minister. And I would want to go on record as well um, to recognise the work that has been done by um, Joanne Dobson uh, previously. But sticking on the donation um, uh, issues, uh, further changes to blood donation referral rules uh, have been brought in to allow more gay men uh, to donate. Uh, can, they outline, uh, can the Minister outline the changes uh, and the benefits to this? Thank the members also for an announcement that was made over the weekend. Um, I made that decision based on the advice from the Advisory Committee on the Safety of Blood, Tissues and Organs, uh, following its consideration on a report by, made for the assessment of individual risk steering group. Um, the recommendation uh, itself is to implement uh, the introduction of an ind individual behaviour based risk assessment that will allow some men who have sex with men MSM to donate blood if they have had one sexual partner who has been their partner for more than three months. And I'm pleased to be able to introduce this change to donor, the donor deferral policy in Northern Ireland, which means MSM and longer-term partnerships will no longer be automatically deferred from donating blood, provided they have been with the same partner for the previous three months. I, I want to see more people able to donate blood. Um, however, I want to make sure it's also safe. Uh, and my decision to reduce the deferral period for 12 months to three earlier this year was also based on SABTO and VICE. So I look forward to seeing more uh, donors on the Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion uh, Services Register. Uh, being a regular donor myself, I know the vital importance that giving blood actually gives because every, every pint or every donation given can save up to three lives or have an effect on three lives. So the more people we have eligible to donate blood, the better it is for all of us. Question number five has been withdrawn, so I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, a meeting will take place later today with the Four Nations, along with Michael Gove, to look at the uh, restrictions over the Christmas period. Uh, what assessment does the Minister give in terms of what action should be taken, if any, over that period? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his question, uh, and he's right that decision or that discussion is being taken by the, the three devolved nations and chaired by Michael Gove this afternoon. As you will be aware, the announcement was made on a UK-wide basis uh, by UK Prime Ministers, First Ministers and Deputy First Ministers. Uh, that discussion is being had, as being supported by decisions and recommendations coming forward from the four Chief Medical Officers across the nations as well. And as the member well knows, that I never comment before a decision or a discussion is had, so we'll wait to see the outcome of that meeting and what it recommends. Call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank the Minister for response. I'm going to put it a slightly different way. Uh, Dr. Tom Black had said that he believes that a four week lockdown uh, would be logical uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, wh what is the view of the Minister and what is the view of the Chief Medical Officer as to whether or not additional restrictions are required uh, prior or during the Christmas period? Um, I can really just say I refer the member to my further answer, but he will be aware that uh, in regards to where we currently see COVID and the spread uh, and the infection rates, uh, although stable, still slightly increasing, the number of inpatients we have in our hospitals has not decreased, in fact, has not decreased at all over the last number of weeks. So the two-week restrictions that we have have seen um, a stabilisation of those numbers still too high. Uh, so I don't think the member would be surprised to know that I will be bringing a paper um, to the executive on Thursday with a number of recommendations. But as I said earlier, he also know me well enough that I make those recommendations to the executive so the discussion can be had there. I call Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, I've heard you talk before about the care home sick leave support funding that is in place for some, uh, well, for all of social care organisations, but they're not all availing of it. So, what's the department to do to try and encourage those organisations to avail of it so that the carers can get some kind of financial support for sick leave pay? Um, and, and the member rightly, yeah, I think the member rightly identifies one of the biggest frustrations. Uh, that I have and the department has as well. At the initial outbreak and the initial waves of this, of this pandemic, uh, where care homes and their owners came looking for support 
uh, and the workers in them came looking for financial support um, so that they were impeded by having to take a statutory sick pay should they either contact COVID or become a, a contact case of COVID. We put financial supports into place that would support care homes to support their workers through what would be a very challenging period of, of isolation. We have regular engagement with care home providers. Uh, that is currently ongoing in a number of other areas. So I would encourage all care home providers, owners, uh, shareholders to take up uh, the financial supports that are provided my, by my department to ensure their workers are supported during any period of, of illness they have to take due to either being a, a positive COVID case or a contact case as well. That's what that finance is there for. That's what guidance is there for, and that's what that support is there for. Uh, the member has a brief supplementary. One of my constituents contacted me today. There's been a number across Derry, and I know they're being forced to take their annual leave. Uh, and they are not getting that kind of support. So can you do some more to try and encourage? And we are encouraging the organisations, but we need to get that message across, particularly to the carers. And I think by, by the member raising it here today, and my answer hopefully reinforces that message, uh, that support on funding was there for a reason. It was there to support the workers, to support the owners of the care homes, but mostly importantly, to support the, the residents of the care homes as well. So it's there. The message has been loud and clear, and it's one that my department will continue to make to the care home providers. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister of Health. I ask members to take their ease for a few moments as we change those at the table. Okay, members, um, if members just resume their seats, please. Uh, we will now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. I can see you, Sir Linda Dillon, and then Kate Cash to her. I call Linda Dillon to ask the first question. Gormay, I'll get to Lashkin and Corlea. Question number one. I can see you, Sir, and either Infrastructure. I call the Minister for Infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Uh, my department manages the adoption of roads that are proposed for adoption through the private streets determination process, which is undertaken as part of the planning process. Once planning permission is received, my officials work closely with developers and financial institutions to pursue adoption of these development roads in a timely fashion. My department has undertaken almost 1,100 private street adoptions and developments over the last five years, and progress has been made in adopting a significant number of unadopted developments that emanated from the property crash in 2007. The member will also appreciate that the adoption of private streets within developments is a developer-led process, and the majority progress to adoption without the need for intervention by my department or Northern Ireland Water. I also fully appreciate the concerns of residents in unadopted developments and the difficult situations some find themselves in. My department continues to work closely with developers, NI Water, financial institutions and residents to get roads and sewage infrastructure adopted. I am committed to ensuring that developers provide road and sewage infrastructure to a standard suitable for adoption in a timely manner and to impress on developers the need to, de to provide safe and adequate infrastructure for residents in the interim period prior to adoption. Uh, Linda Dillon, supplementary question for Linda Dillon. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer, but what I'm referring to is more the historical 
issue around unadopted roads of developments and streets. So this is not a new thing from 2007. We obviously have the bond, and, and we have been able to resolve a number of those within my own constituency. But there is an inequality, and there is an issue here for people real life every day, and this has gone on in some areas for up to 50 years, when the old councils built the developments and didn't do what needed to be done at that time. So we have a responsibility to these people, and I think that we need to start actually delivering for them now. So there are no developers that they can go back to. There is nowhere where they can turn, and we really need now as a, an executive to start dealing with these issues. And I would ask that the minister would engage with some of the residents in my constituency, particularly around Coal Island and Donoughmore, where there are a number of these estates and streets that have this, this historical issue. I thank the member for her question, and she is correct. There are a number of, of historical unadopted roads and laneways uh, within Northern Ireland that sit outside of the private streets process. Article 9 of the Private Streets Order 1980 allows my department to consider adoption of some roads um, if the majority of the owners or frontagers request it and the road or street is first brought up to the required adoption standard. While I do understand that there is a desire among front teachers to, on private roads and lanes to have improvement works carried out by my department, the reality is that it is not feasible due to the current budget position and the many pressures faced by my department. There was a scoping study carried out in 2011 which found that there were over 620 kilometres of unadopted roads and laneways in Northern Ireland. At that time, it was estimated to be in the region of £300 million to bring them up uh, to stand and that was excluding any land purchase or required structures or utility work. So this is an issue, but it is an issue requiring huge resource. Kelly, Cash, I called Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for answer. Minister, I know that your department is undergoing a planning policy review. Will that review include looking at some of the developer contributions in terms of uh, the adoptions of roads and ensure that there is a significant financial penalty for not doing so? I thank the member for her question. She is right. Um, my department is carrying out a, a review of the Planning Act. And the purpose of that review is to ensure that the objectives um, that were intended through that legislation are being met. Uh, I would also examine things that can be retained, uh, amended uh, or repealed. And my officials are currently going out to consultation with councils, with businesses, environmental groups and other key stakeholders. And I'm sure this will be an issue that will be raised with them. Call Johnny Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And the Minister knows that this is an issue that I have long championed in, championed in my own constituency in relation to Birchwood Manor. And I would echo the comments by the initial question from Linda Dillon that this is an issue that I know the Minister finds unacceptable, but to date, limited progress has been made on some of the outstanding issues across many constituencies. Uh, the, I thank the Minister since then in terms of. Uh, her department's willingness to engage with both uh, residents and indeed uh, with NI Water and roads development. Would the minister also agree that there's a need to engage with the banks now as well to ensure that we can get a timely satisfactory outcome and allow these residents to live at peace in their developments? I thank the member for his question uh, and uh, I thank him for his kind comments in respect um, of officials' work on this issue. It is a complex issue and it is one that my department is working to try to address with developers, with residents, as he's rightly pointed out, but as he has also correctly said, the importance of engaging with the financed, financial institutions as well as we try to resolve this difficult thing. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. That will be question two, Minister. I thank the member for his question. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, Northern Ireland Water and DFI Roads undertook measures to remove considerable amounts of stormwater from the foul sewage system. It was this excess stormwater during periods of intense rainfall which was the cause of out of sewer flooding in St. Field. DFI Roads has replaced a damaged storm culvert on the Studer Road, and Northern Ireland Water has undertaken repair work on sewer pipes in the same area. Additionally, the sewers in Old Grand Jury Road have been repaired by Northern Ireland Water, greatly increasing the resilience of the sewage system during heavy rainfall. Finally, Northern Ireland Water conducted extensive CCTV and flow surveys for use in developing a drainage area sewer network model in 2019. The model build phase was completed in December 2019 and audited for use in 2020. And the output of this model has been shared with NIEA, which will come back to NI Water once it has completed its assessment of the data. 
Marty Harvey for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. I appreciate your considering upgrades in all constituencies to allow building of new homes to continue. Could the Minister assure me that she will address current infrastructure issues within Strangford, particularly in relation to flooding, which poses a health and safety risk? Thank you. I thank the member for his question. My department has not identified any significant flood risk areas in the Strangford area. However, coastal areas and roads can be subject to large overtopping waves when strong onshore winds occur and sea levels are high. My department has well rehearsed emergency response plans that have been developed in conjunction with multi agency partners, should there be a need to respond to flooding in the area. I am also aware that some isolated properties that are at flood risk have availed of my department's homeowner flood protection grant scheme, and this scheme is intended to assist homeowners make their property more resilient to flooding. Call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister may be aware that elsewhere in the Strangford constituency, a major development at Rivenwood in Newton Ards is under threat because of an unexpected million pound bill for the developers because of a lack of sewage infrastructure. Can the Minister detail uh, how many planning applications are being withheld uh, due to sewage infrastructure being at or indeed above capacity? I thank the member for his question and he raises a, a very important uh, issue and difficulty. While I don't have at hand the number of planning applications that are currently being impacted, I can advise the member that there are some 116 locations across Northern Ireland that are either at maximum or almost at maximum capacity, thereby curtailing their developmental potential. This is an issue of huge concern. It impacts every constituency. It is impacting on every local development plan that is being developed uh, by our councils. It will curtail the number of homes that we can build, Mr Deputy Speaker, the number of uh, schools uh, and hospitals. Uh, and the utility regulator has identified £2 billion that is required investment for the next price control period. So this is an issue that affects every government department, every community, and it is an issue that we must tackle. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. As the member may remember from the recent Assembly debate on ammonia, I advised that I had written to the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs about the ongoing ammonia and nitrates deposition issues we face, particularly as they affect the planning system. I highlighted the need for DERA to urgently revise its current operational protocol on ammonia emitting projects, which is used as the basis for DERA's advice to planning authorities in its role as a statutory consultee. I also asked for an update on the current position with the ammonia strategy and how, in the interim, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency can provide the advice needed to enable planning applications for ammonia emitting development that are currently on hold to be determined. Furthermore, I committed my department to assist DERA in taking forward work on its proposed ammonia strategy, which I understand is to include a review of the operational protocol. In his response to me, Minister Poots advised that work on the ammonia strategy is in its final stages of preparation and will be completed before the end of this year and, when completed, will be issued for public consultation. He also stated that with regard to the ammonia-related planning consultations that have been delayed, they are currently under consideration and that he will be discussing them with his officials shortly. Chair Billy for our supplementary. Thank you. And I thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer, and that's very heartening to hear. Um, of course, the Minister will be very aware that the, of the ongoing high risk to both human health and the environmental damage that occurs the longer that we don't tackle this problem. So during the same debate in the Assembly, there was a commitment to also consult fully with the farming and agri-food sector, and I'm just wondering if that has happened by either yourself or anyone in your department? As the member highlights, this was an issue that was discussed, um, and my role on this is from the planning um, perspective, and I am conscious as well that in the same debate there was a discussion around implementing a moratorium on planning approvals, um, but I can confirm that I have engaged with the dear Minister um, directly. Um, we haven't as yet gone out further afield, because my view on this is that the urgency that is required is the review and updating of the operational protocol by DERA to ensure that it is able to respond to consultations consultations in a way that is based on the most recent case law and the most up-to-date scientific data on the issue of ammonia. I call her Leah Flynn. 
I'll ask um, and uh, uh, it's already been mentioned around improving the guidance on, on ammonia, but I'm just wondering if the Minister can elaborate on whether there's any scope in the planning review um, to look at improving other environmental aspects of the planning system. Thank you. I thank the member um, for her question. Um, as I outlined, I think, in the response to um, Dolores Kelly, the review of the Act is review and, uh, review to ensure that it's meeting the intended uh, objectives. But as I said, my officials are out going around doing a targeted consultation exercise, uh, and so I would encourage people to be engaging with my officials and to be raising those issues so that we can explore what can be done. If not within the, t the framework of the current review, then certainly um, at a later date. I call Andrew Muir. Very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister is aware of shared environmental services and the role they play in relation to this. Can the Minister outline when a review was last conducted of the shared environmental services? The member is, is, is correct to point out that the uh, shared environmental services is a service that's shared across all uh, of the councils. It was developed um, when we moved to the two-tier planning system. I'm not aware that there has been a subsequent review uh, to that. I am aware, though, that councils have been asked to increase their financial contribution towards the shared environmental services, given the increase in uh, consultation responses and the work that it is having uh, to engage with. But if there has been a, a review in the interim since the transfer of planning powers. I'm certainly happy to update the member. I call Jim Allister. Not for the first time we have a passing of the parcel between one department and another, but the victims of this are the many farmers who have been waiting out now for months running into years for planning approvals. And where it's at its most farcical is those who are wanting to replace old houses with more environmentally friendly houses with less output, and yet they are the very people who uh, are failing to have their needs met. When will the executive get a grip on this issue? I thank the member for his question, uh, and I think he was present during the debate um, on this issue, so he will be well aware that the difficulty here is that DERA has not to date updated its operational protocol. That is the issue that is causing delay in terms of the determination of the planning uh, applications. Uh, to my mind, if I recall correctly, there are around 19 planning applications that are being held in the planning system pending determination. So I think that one of the key issues in terms of resolving this matter would be for DERA to complete the work that it has indicated that it is currently undertaking so that it can update its operational protocol, ensuring that the most up-to-date responses are being provided to applicants and they can be appropriately processed. Era Mayor Declan McAleer for Hunya Kesht. I call Declan McAleer. Good morning, Mr. Kesht. I have a question for thank the member for his question. I want to reiterate my commitment to the A5 and to tackling regional imbalance, connecting communities and improving road safety. There are so many communities, particularly in rural parts west of the Ban, who can benefit from investment in the A5 project. The project has been subject to three separate legal challenges since its inception in 2007, the most recent being in December 2017 when a new decision to proceed with a scheme made in the absence of a minister was challenged, leading to the quashing of the statutory orders in November 2018. Since then, my department has been actively progressing the necessary work to enable a fresh decision to be made. In spring 2019, an addendum to the Environmental Statement of 2016, together with other environmental reports, were published for consultation. This resulted in a further public inquiry, which concluded in March of this year, and my department received the interim report from the inspector in September. My officials have considered the issues raised and recommendations made in this interim report and have taken legal advice. I will be considering this legal advice and all advice carefully before deciding on the next steps for the scheme and the timing of the publication of the inspector's report, but I can assure the member of my commitment to this scheme. Declan McAleer, supplementary question. Declan McAleer. And I'm glad to hear the Minister's uh, commitment to this scheme. Um, I thank her very much for her answer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that this is a, a very a crucially important uh, project for the West and indeed the North West of the island of Ireland. So I wonder, could the Minister update us on any um, recent contact or consultation she's had with her counterpart, Minister Ryan, in Dublin in relation to the Irish Government's part funding of this scheme? 
I thank the member for his question and I welcome the Irish Government's reaffirmation of its commitment uh, to contribute £75 million uh, to this project in New Decade New Approach. I can assure the member that I've had useful discussions with the Irish Transport Minister, uh, Minister Ryan, and the Taoiseach on delivering on our shared commitments. I think it's very good news that the Taoiseach announced in October that €500 million Euro will be made available through the Shared Island uh, Fund to deliver on the Irish Government's commitment to build shared island infrastructure underpinned by the Good Friday Agreement. And this funding is intended to contribute to the delivery of key infrastructure initiatives, including the A5. I can assure the member I am committed to working with my colleagues in the Irish Government to ensure that we deliver for our citizens and in fact we are due to meet again as an NSMC on Friday and I have no doubt that this matter will be raised. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. It's always a great honour to speak about the A5 and something that I feel very, very strongly about and uh, the SDLP absolutely very strongly support uh, its development. Minister, uh, your commitment to the A5 has been cast iron, and the people of West Tyrone are grateful uh, to your office uh, for making it such a strong priority. Uh, Minister, uh, many people are looking forward to seeing boots on the ground. Have you any indication as to when that might happen? As I indicated um, to the member, um, my officials have obtained detailed legal advice um, on the report that we have received. Um, I will be considering that very carefully uh, and all advice before announcing my next steps. It's not possible until that decision is reached to give a, a clear time frame, but I do want to assure the House that I've said on multiple occasions that I am committed uh, to this project and I'm keen to see it progress uh, as far as possible within my tenure. Gary Middleton for our question. Question number five, Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Uh, construction work is progressing well on the two flagship duelling schemes on the A6 road, the Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme and the Dungiven to Drumahoe scheme. Together, these schemes represent an investment of over £400 million to enhance the connectivity of the North West, improve journey time reliability, reduce journey times and improve road safety. COVID-19 disrupted or stopped many activities due to difficulties in the supply chain, social distancing requirements and staff absences. However, I am pleased to be advised that the projects are on track. I was pleased to see at first hand the new five kilometre section of the Randallstown to Castle Dawson scheme which opened to traffic last week. This means the entire 15 kilometre scheme is now open to traffic, although there are still works ongoing and temporary traffic management will be in place for several months. The benefits of this scheme are already being realised and fully welcomed by the public, and the scheme will be fully complete in the spring. The 25.5 km done given to Drummond Ho scheme is expected to complete in 2022, largely as planned. Finally, the delivery of Phase 2 of the A6 Derry to Dungiven Road project, which extends from Drumahoe to the Caw Roundabout, is key and will depend on a range of factors, including future budget settlements. A supplementary for Gary Middleton. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response. I also want to put on record my thanks to her department and the contractor for uh, working with local residents on some local issues uh, along the scheme, so I do welcome that. Can the Minister give any clarity in terms of whether or not uh, the, the scheme is on budget, uh, and are there any concerns around uh, lack of funds to, to complete the scheme? Yeah. In terms uh, of the funding that's been set aside, um, um, in terms of the COVID impact, um, I did, because things moved rather quickly, um, made a, a bid for £14.8 million to um, the executive and to the finance minister, um, and we increased the budget by that so that it could move ahead. So certainly from the advice that I'm receiving for, from officials, I don't have any concerns in that regard, and we are on track to meet all of the targets and deadlines in terms of the delivery of the project, particularly around the time frame as well, which I know will be welcome news to the member. Martina Anderson for your case. Call Martina. Good morning, August. Uh, Minister, as you would know, Chris Hazard, Sinn Féin, he championed this in 2016 and secured the funding. And I was glad to hear that you talked about the call roundabout uh, to drum a hole being crucially important and being key. So could you tell us what efforts is being made to take us through the statutory process before you get to the point where you're going to put in the bid? Uh, 
As the member says, yes, phase two of the A60 to Dungiven Road project extends from Drumahoe to the A2 call roundabout. This seven kilometre section is estimated to cost around £200 million and forms part of the A6 flagship project. As the member will know, parts of the works will encroach on the Maboy Waste site, and the final design will need to take this into account. Delivery of this phase of the project, which is not part of the current Dungiven to Drumahoe construction contract, is key, in my view, and will depend on a range of factors, including future budget settlements. Uh, and I look forward to the member joining me in making representations to the executive to secure the funding that is required. Roy Beggs for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the, the completion of the A6 will considerably improve the travel time uh, between the North West to Belfast and indeed to Dublin. Uh, undoubtedly that will have some effect on the viability of Derry City Airport where more people will choose to travel. Can the Minister advise uh, when uh, that road is expected to be completed and how that may influence subsequent additional public funding which is continuing to be passed to Derry City Airport? I thank the member for his question. Um, as I indicated in previous responses uh, today, uh, we are on track to meet the, the time frame for the A6. Um, so that section is due for completion in 2022, and we're on track um, to meet that. In respect of the issue of um, the City of Derry Airport, the member will, may be aware that York Aviation have been commissioned to carry out a study into the viability of the airport and it will analyse all of the surrounding factors. Um, that report has been submitted to a number of the departments uh, across the executive given the statutory responsibilities for airport cuts across uh, a number of ministries. So my officials are currently considering that uh, as I will be with my executive colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, I welcome the progress so far uh, on the A6 and uh, welcome the work from you and your department. Um, the route will have many major benefits for my constituents. Uh, my question pertains to uh, an update on the section of the A6 from the Castle Dawson roundabout uh, and to Dungiven. Thank the member for her question. Um, my department is currently developing a new regional strategic transport network transport plan. It's a nice snappy title, which will set out future investment and improvement for our strategic transport networks by road, rail and bus, and reflect my commitment to improving connectivity for the benefit of our, of our economy and communities across Northern Ireland. This will consider proposals for the further development of strategic road improvement schemes, including the Castle Dawson to Dungiven section of the A6 and how it might facilitate complementary improvements to promote sustainable travel choices, connect people and communities and create thriving and livable places. I intend publishing the draft Regional Strategic Transport Network Transport Plan for public consultation in late 2021 with a view to issuing the finalised plan in spring 2022. Call Mervyn Storey. Thank uh, Deputy Principal Speaker. I thank the Minister for clarifying because for some time we have been waiting on the sub regional uh, transport plan and on correspondence with yourself in relation to the continuation of the A26 in my own constituency, which would connect uh, Ballymena right through to Coleraine. Obviously, it's very important. So, you did say late 21. Are we saying that before the end of this year it will be published? Or, like most things, will it be pushed into 2021 in terms of uh, the, the, the latter part of the year? So it will not be published this year, it will be next year. For clarity, um, uh, I intend publishing the draft regional strategic transport network transport plan <laughs> for public consultation in late 2021 with a view to issuing the finalised plan in spring 2022. I call Chris Little. Question six. Thank the member for his question. Um, my vision is for Belfast to become a cycle-friendly city where anyone can have the freedom and confidence to use the bicycle for their everyday journeys. The bicycle strategy, published in August 2015 by one of my predecessors, set out the objective of building a comprehensive network for the bicycle. One of the elements of that was to develop bicycle networks for the main urban areas in Northern Ireland, and the intention was that the first one would be for Belfast. 
A public consultation on the draft bicycle, uh, Belfast Bicycle Network was held in 2017, and following consideration of the many responses, some of which were very detailed, a consultation report was published in 2018, during the period when the Assembly was suspended. There was general support for the idea of a network, but the consultation highlighted the need to look more closely at the north and west of the city, where levels of cycling were lower and where there was less walking and cycling infrastructure. My department engaged Sustrans to carry out further work on the active travel feasibility study for North and West Belfast in 2019, and a final report for those two areas was provided to my department earlier this year. Some work has been undertaken to revise the proposed network in light of this, and I have asked officials to ensure that a final document is ready for publication in the new year. Chris Little, first supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her update in relation to the Belfast Cycle Network Plan. Um, as she said, a, a delivery of a, an easy-to-access, easy-to-understand Belfast Cycle Network is a key aim of the cycling strategy, but progress has been delayed for the reasons she outlines. A Welsh Act of Travel Act places a legal requirement on local government to map and plan suitable routes for active travel and to build and improve their infrastructure every year. Is an Act of Travel Act necessary in Northern Ireland to see substantive progress on our cycle network? I thank the member um, for his question. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I don't know if it is um, essential. I think one of the biggest challenges around changing culture uh, within government um, and also outside of it. Uh, we have seen the success um, of active travel pilots, uh, limited in number though they are, um, during COVID and how citizens, if they are given the opportunity to be able to engage in active travel safely, then they will um, embrace it. To reassure the member, while I have initiated a number of policy changes in the department, while I have appointed a walking and cycling champion to ensure the culture change at the heart of my department, I have also asked my officials to bring forward to me a submission so that I can consider the merits of bringing forward active travel legislation. I also have to operate within the reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we do not have a significantly long period left in this mandate and we have many other pressures, if not COVID and Brexit. But I want to assure the member that where change can be made, whether that's through resource allocation, whether that's through policy change. Um, I am committed to exploring all avenues, including legislation. I have time for a brief question and a brief answer from Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know the Minister is, uh, is absolutely hard as in getting people on bikes. Um, would the Minister commit, I know it's not her purview, but to work with her executive uh, colleagues to ensure that there's no financial barrier uh, to those who are disproportionately financially burdened uh, to availing of bicycles to get them fit and uh, also to tackle their mental health? Yes, I think it's very important that we have um, inclusivity and affordability uh, at the heart of this. Uh, the truth is that there are so many families across Northern Ireland who can't afford to own a car, who are reliant on public transport um, and who could hugely benefit from being able to access safe infrastructure when it comes to cycling and walking. So this is an environmental issue for me, but this is also uh, an issue of social justice and I remain committed to doing what I can during my tenure to bring about change in the lives of our citizens right across the north. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Dr. Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and I thank the Minister for answers so far. I could ask the Minister what provisions are being made for local HGV drivers for operating in the EU after the 1st of January, please. I thank the member for his question. Uh, he raises an important point, and I am sensitive to the fact that discussions between negotiating teams are ongoing, and the outcome will be determined by the British government and the EU. Any outcome that places a limit on the number of hauliers permitted to travel south to transport and receive goods, such as the need for an ECMT permit, will have the potential for serious supply chain disruption and detrimental economic impacts in the north. I welcome the recent contingency arrangements for a no deal announced by the EU, which are subject to UK uh, reciprocity, and confirm that hauliers would not require an ECMT permit. I do, however, have some concerns that hauliers would not be allowed to conduct cabotage or cross trade, and my officials continue to stress the importance of free movement by road hauliers on the island of Ireland to the British government. 
Mr. Eakin for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, could the Minister possibly feed into the Joint Ministerial Council that Northern Ireland haulage firms should be given commitments that they will indeed be able to work unimpeded in Great Britain, the EU, and in Northern Ireland, particularly under the provisions of the protocol? I can assure the member that certainly my officials at every opportunity uh, are always stressing the importance and the uniqueness of the North and its situation and raising the concerns that hauliers uh, are rightly expressing to us. We have regular engagement as a department with the haulage sector as well, and I have written to Grant Chaps to raise these concerns directly. Uh, I raise them any time that I'm on Zoom meetings or conference calls uh, with the British Government as well, and I've also written to the Irish Government highlighting my concerns, so I can assure the member that we will continue to avail of every opportunity to raise the issues and the concerns of our haulage sector, given they are so critical to our economy. I call Gordon Dunn for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be very much aware that a large number of taxi drivers have been unable to access her department's financial support scheme. Will the Minister look at how the criteria can be amended to assist those who had the correct insurance, cover and licence at the time of lockdown and are now struggling to make a living? I thank the member for, for raising uh, this question and this issue. The Taxi Driver Financial Assistance Scheme was opened on the 13th uh, of November. That was 10 days after my department was given the powers to create a scheme. And it closed two weeks later on the 27th of November. The scheme, agreed by the executive, is designed to provide a contribution to the overhead costs, including PPA, that have actually been incurred a result, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this was designed in consultation with the taxi industry representatives who said that while drivers were eligible for the self-employed income support scheme, they still had very static and high overhead costs, not least their taxi insurance, which they were struggling to pay, which is why the, the scheme was designed to be a contribution to overhead costs. Um, the scheme uh, has been set up as a means, as I say, of helping drivers with their ongoing overhead costs. But in order to ensure value for money, the scheme is dependent on actual expenses being incurred between the 22nd of March and the 30th of September, because it is a retrospective um, scheme. Um, I am aware of issues where taxi drivers who had continuous insurance were not able to obtain evidence of that, and I'm pleased to say my department has worked with insurance companies who are now providing a letter, which we, which we are accepting as validity of that. But I'm also aware of a situation where many taxi drivers uh, dropped their taxi insurance during that typical period and I have said that I will continue to work with the sector to provide them with support during this time. But I must say I remain disappointed that opportunities have been missed for their inclusion in the Part B scheme uh, run by the Department uh, of the Economy because taxi drivers have been impacted by the restrictions on our hospitality sector. Mr Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Could the Minister, though, however, outline the rationale for the decision not to open the scheme for taxi operators, not drivers, I'm talking about, but for operators, and would she give a commitment to meet the taxi operators to discuss the particular circumstances that their businesses now find themselves in, obviously most difficult during this COVID crisis? I thank the member for his question. I have met with the taxi operators and my officials have also met with the taxi operators. Um, as part of the stakeholder engagement process for the financial support schemes, as I said, officials and I held meetings with taxi operators on the 30th of September and the 27th of October. Officials also met with taxi operators on the 20th of October and the 27th of November. And in looking at the available financial support schemes and sector eligibility for those um, because taxi drivers did not have premises, they did not qualify for the Northern Ireland Executive Support Schemes for Businesses. However, taxi businesses and operators that did have premises could have availed of one or other of the business support grant or loan schemes available. This was clear from the evidence and the information provided by them themselves during the scheme's development stage. And so for these reasons, the scheme I put in place is designed to assist taxi drivers who could not avail of the existing schemes but still incurred overhead costs from March until September of this year. In addition, taxi operators themselves advised that providing financial support directly to drivers would provide them with indirect support because we were helping taxi drivers to remain in business and in work. Mayor Mayor Colum I call Colum 
Um, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, the public inquiry on the A5 concluded in March of this year, and we're still awaiting on a decision. When can we expect construction to begin on this essential and long overdue road scheme? I thank the member for his question, and it was a question that was raised um, under the, the oral questions um, by your party colleague and by a number of, of other members. Um, my department received the uh, report on the A5 in September. It has raised a number of detailed issues that we had to get legal advice on. I will be considering that legal advice very carefully and all of the advice uh, before deciding on next steps. It's therefore not possible at this stage to be able to provide you with a definitive time frame, but I do want to assure you that I remain committed to the delivery of this project. It is a strategic road project. It's a key project in terms of road safety, and it's also critical to tackling regional imbalance. Supplementary question for Colin Gildon. And thank you, thank you for that answer, mm -hmm. Minister. But um, it, is, it is, of course, important that the Irish government honour their commitment to co-fund the project. Um, can you comment on how much of the Shared Ireland Fund the A5 is expected to receive, and if the Minister is considering multiple simultaneous phases of that project? I thank the member for his question, um, and uh, he is right to point out that the Taoiseach has announced 500 million euros uh, for the Shared Island unit, which is for north-south infrastructure um, projects. I have discussed the issue of the A5. I have discussed also Narrow Water Bridge and the other commitments under New Decade New Approach with my ministerial counterpart, Ian Ryan, and also with the Taoiseach. Uh, and we are due to meet again as an NSMC this Friday, and I have no doubt that the A5 and the other commitments in New Decade New Approach uh, will be discussed. Dolores Kelly. Dolores Kelly for a uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I know that you have been working hard uh, with the travel industry, and particularly Translink, in relation to keeping people safe during COVID-19, and I thank you for that. But in relation to Christmas and the particular challenges around road safety, drink driving and drug taking, have you any particular measures or in place? The member um, asks a very important question as families prepare to make their way home together uh, to bubble this Christmas in line with government regulations. Um, COVID remains very much with us um, and we are at risk, so we all must do what we can to protect ourselves and our family from the virus. And I would urge all travellers to plan ahead to wear a face covering, keep your distance and wash your hands. Uh, and today I issued a statement urging those travelling to take care, whether by private or public transport. I've also reminded drivers that my department will be carrying out parking and moving traffic bus lane enforcement as normal to ensure that vehicles are parked safely and are not causing disruption in bus lanes and elsewhere. And as many of us will hopefully uh, be able to safely enjoy time with our families, I want to very clearly uh, warn that driving while taking drink and drugs is never acceptable behaviour. One drink can impair decision making and cause a collision which can kill. I implore drivers to never ever drink or take drugs and drive this Christmas or ever. And finally, as your public transport services continue to operate all throughout the pandemic and they are available all over the Christmas period, I would remind passengers, including post-primary children, that they must also wear a face covering too, because I'm conscious it's an issue that members have been raising. Okay, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. And uh, it's a very comprehensive answer. But can you also advise uh, if the PSNI are providing any additional resources to clamp down on drink driving and drug taking? The member will know that last month I brought a change in law which will abolish the driver's right to request a replacement blood or urine specimen where a breath specimen is marginally above the legal alcohol limit. The removal of the statutory option is a much needed update to road traffic legislation here in Northern Ireland and is something that I work closely and in collaboration uh, with the PSNI uh, in terms of its delivery. There is no excuse for drink driving. I want to take a zero uh, tolerance approach to it. Uh, I know that the PSNI are taking a zero tolerance approach and so we will continue to work together to tackle drink driving and continue to send a very clear message that it is unacceptable and that it kills. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Cumber Greenway usage has increased by more than 75 per cent from April to November 2020, a welcome increase and an evidence base on which to target investment in walking and cycling at this route, not least in terms of lighting. Will the Minister commit to investing in a new network of cycle counters on key streets, roads and greenways to enable further targeted investment in active travel across Northern Ireland? 
thank the member for his question. And it is something that we are actively exploring as part uh, of our Blue Green um, Fund. As the member has rightly said, we may look at the usage figures for the Cumber Greenway. And in fact, uh, recently at the Waterways Ireland meeting, uh, we were reminded again of the exponential growth in the number of people who are embracing uh, our greenways um, and our uh, our our laggings as well. Um, so I want to do what I can to progress this. I'm a firm believer if you build it, they will come, but we always need an evidence base. And so that's why we are looking to see, can we put more counters in places so that we can provide the evidence of what is happening, this quiet revolution that we know is happening when it comes to people embracing active travel and reconnecting with nature and each other. Supplementary for Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, can, the, can the Minister provide some update then with relation to the, the budget allocation for active travel next financial year? I wish I was in a position to be able to confirm that. I wish I was able to say that we have seen a vast increase in the allocations to my department, enabling me to do so much more. But what I can assure the member is, even in the absence of having that information, I remain committed to doing what I can to progress this uh, agenda while I remain as Minister for Infrastructure. Okay, Gasto, Linda Dillon. Quick question from Linda Dillon. Minister, I'll, I'll roll my question and my supplementary into one, if that's helpful. We have discussed before the issue around dangerous trees along roadsides, and I know that you had outlined what the department's official position is. What I'm asking now is that the department do a scoping exercise to see if there's anything further that they can do, because I know that I certainly have reported many more trees that are dangerous, but also that have fallen across the road. And I would ask the minister would commit to meeting with me and a constituent of mine whose daddy was killed by a fallen tree last year, and she's campaigning to have this issue addressed. And I'm, I'm very aware of the case that the member has raised and the fact that she has made representations to me on this issue. The member will also know that there are complex issues around land ownership uh, as well and responsibility legally in that regard. But I'm more than happy to meet with the member uh, and with her constituent to discuss what the department is doing, our approach, and what we can do working with other partners. Thank you for that, Minister, and uh, that concludes our time is now up. If members choose to take their ease, please, while we change the top table and uh, to the prepare for the next topic.
Okay, members. Um, we now return to the debate on the further consideration stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, Group 1 Amendments. And I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just before I comment specifically on the amendments before us today, on behalf of the Justice Committee, I would like to acknowledge the early notice the Department provided of its intention to bring forward a number of amendments at further consideration stage, which was very helpful. I also want to welcome the engagement of officials on the proposed amendments to the provisions that the Committee had brought forward at consideration stage, which were supported by this Assembly, and the constructive approach adopted to changes that the Committee requested to the text of the draft amendments before they were finalised and tabled for consideration by the House today. Uh, turning to Amendments 1 and 8, uh, which, as the Minister has outlined, replaces the current provision in the Bill to enable the sharing of information between the police and schools for well-being as opposed to child protection purposes. This will ensure that schools are in a better position to understand and be supportive of the child's needs and possible behaviours as a result of being notified where a domestic abuse incident has occurred the night before in which police have been called out. The Minister had advised the Committee prior to consideration stage that she agreed that there was considerable merit in a provision to enable information to be shared for the purpose of an operation and compass type approach. And if the committee amendment was made, it was her intention uh, to table an amendment at further consideration stage to ensure the provision is as robust as possible and fully provides for the necessary regulations to be brought forward. The committee welcomed the minister's support for this provision and indicated that it would be happy to consider any amendments to improve it before the bill completed its passage. The committee considered the amendments to leave out subsection 2 of clause 8 and replace it with a new clause at its meetings on the 26th of November and the 1st of December. Following consideration of the initial draft of Amendment 1, the committee was content with widening the scope to cover instances where a child or young person is educated in centres other than schools, but asked the department to consider also including preschool settings both those in primary schools and other preschool settings. Officials undertook to consider this in conjunction with the Department of Education's colleagues and subsequently provided revised text that covered this aspect as well. The amendment before us today will now ensure that children and young people are better safeguarded against the short, medium and long-term effects of domestic abuse, regardless of whether they are being educated in a preschool setting in school or in centres other than schools. Amendment 1 also enhances and strengthens the provision brought forward by the Committee at consideration stage by providing increased detail and clarity to ensure the provision will fully meet the intended purpose and the enabling powers are as robust as possible. The Committee therefore welcomes and supports Amendments 1 and 8. Moving to Amendment 2, this is intended to replace Clause 26 of the Bill with a much more detailed provision, building on and expanding the provision and setting out a detailed framework for the underpinning regulation-making powers. The initial draft of this amendment provided by the Department focused solely on covering domestic abuse protection notices and orders and left out the provision of measures other than court orders that is currently provided for in Clause 26. The Committee believes that the flexibility provided by the inclusion of this is important and therefore ask the Department to reflect this aspect in the amendment it was bringing forward and this has been done. Committee members also questioned officials on the need for such detail to be included on the face of this bill and whether it was being too prescriptive or whether the text is modelled on the domestic abuse protection notices and orders being brought forward in England and Wales, whether the intention was still to legislate for these notices and orders in the justice miscellaneous provisions bill and whether there was enough flexibility to take account of the results of the department's proposed consultation on this policy area. Officials confirmed that the intention was still to bring forward amendments during the passage of the uh, justice miscellaneous provisions bill to provide for domestic abuse protection notices and orders and the aim of this amendment was to build on and strengthen the provision now in the bill and ensure it provides the required authority to enable the Department to take forward the notices and orders by way of regulation uh, if there was unforeseen circumstances that prevented them being progressed in the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. They also confirmed that 
account would be taken of the results of the consultation on the proposed uh, protection notices and uh, protection orders, uh, which has just been launched before legislative provision is made. Uh, yes, I will. Um, I, I thank the chairman for giving way, and I, I want to correct something that I said um, in my opening remarks, and that is that I had launched the consultation on DAPINs and DAPOs today. I actually launched it last week, um, so I was underselling what the department had managed in the, in the time available, and I apologise and hope that that corrects the record, Mr. Speaker. Okay. No, thank you for that. Um, questions were also raised in relation to the different age thresholds for protecting persons and in relation to perpetrators or alleged perpetrators in the amendment, and officials agreed to check the age thresholds that apply in other jurisdictions regarding similar notices and orders and to seek the views of the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People on whether there was a need to address the differential. Following further information and clarification on this issue from the Department, which indicated that the Commissioner for Children and Young People and the NSPCC are keen to ensure that measures do not inappropriately criminalise young people, given there are other interventions to deal with abusive behaviour. Protections would continue to be afforded where the alleged perpetrator is under 18 through non-molestation and occupation orders, and in England and Wales and in Scotland, domestic abuse protection notices and orders will apply to alleged perpetrators who are aged 18 or over. The committee agreed that it was content with the approach being adopted by the Department in this regard. Having received assurances on the range of issues raised with the change, we, we requested now incorporated. The committee uh, is therefore content to support Amendment 2. Uh, addressing Amendments 3 and 7, which relate to Clause 27 and eligibility of victims for civil legal aid, uh, before turning then to the committee amendment. As outlined at consideration stage, the committee did not have an opportunity to consider the amendment brought forward in relation to the eligibility of victims for civil legal aid, which is now Clause 27 in the Bill and therefore did not have a position on it. Following consideration stage, the Department provided information to the Committee, setting out its concerns regarding Clause 27, which the Minister has already articulated, and the text of a draft amendment. Members discussed these in detail with officials at the meeting on the 26th of November and expressed concerns that the proposed amendment made significant changes to Clause 27 and provided for a report to be produced rather than a specific outcome which appeared to undo what had been agreed by the Assembly at consideration stage. The Committee agreed that if the Department brought forward a revised amendment that it would consider it at a meeting on 1 December. Discussions did take place on 1 December on Amendments 3 and 7, and again a number of members raised a range of issues and concerns regarding these amendments and indicated that they were not content with what was being proposed by the Department. The committee subsequently uh, agreed to note the departmental amendments, and individual members could bring forward further amendments if they wished to do so, and these would be considered during this debate. Um, moving to the amendment that the Justice Committee has brought forward, Amendment uh, 13 uh, provides for Section 27 to come into operation 12 months after this Act receives royal assent. As most members, if not all members, will be aware, the committee initially brought forward an amendment to provide for Clause 27 to be commenced at the same time as Chapters 1 and 2 of the Bill. Given the Minister's clear opposition to the amendment made by the uh, Assembly at consideration stage to insert Clause 27 relating to eligibility to civil legal aid into the Bill, and the subsequent draft amendments provided by the Department, which appeared to be delaying or indeed deferring any implementation of this provision, which would be against the will of the Assembly, members were of the view that it was important to include more specific details regarding the commencement of Clause 27 in the Bill, rather than leaving it to the Department's discretion. At its meeting on 1 December, the Committee therefore agreed to bring forward the amendment um, that I had just described, which was Amendment 15 in the previous Marshall List of Amendments. On the day before consideration stage, which was due to take place uh, on a Sunday, a joint letter was received from the Ministers of Justice and Finance asking me, in my capacity as Chairman of the Committee, to consider not moving that amendment. The letter indicated that while the Ministers were sympathetic to the aim of supporting victims of abuse involved in Article 8 children order hearings, they were concerned that the potential financial implications of Clause 27 could be significant. When the Minister did not move further consideration stage last Monday, on the basis that I had not given a commitment to not move the committee amendment, I made it clear then to the House that I cannot unilaterally 
change a decision of the committee, even if I wished to do so. And no doubt, if I did, the members of the Justice Committee would hold me to account. With the, scar the, with the correspondence coming at uh, such short notice, it provided no opportunity to arrange a meeting of the committee before Monday lunchtime, when further consideration stage was scheduled to take place. However, in light of the deferral of further consideration stage, an emergency meeting of the committee was arranged for last Tuesday, and the Minister and Permanent Secretary were able to attend to provide further information and clarification of the financial concerns highlighted in the letter. And I want to place on record my appreciation uh, for the Minister and Permanent Secretary being able to attend at uh, such short notice. The session was very useful as it provided an opportunity to explore the position and financial concerns in uh, more detail than had been provided in the letter that was received by the committee and upon which the Minister had wanted the committee's uh, amendment to be abandoned. During the evidence session, committee members sought information on a range of issues, including the scope of the potential costs, the possible repercussive implications, the timescale for completion of the due diligence exercise, details of other court cases referred to by the Minister and Permanent Secretary, what victims would be eligible for civil legal aid under the Department's proposed amendment to Clause 27, and the threshold uh, or e evidential test that would be applied. Potential ways to alter the committee amendment was also explored with the Minister, uh, but she did not see any of those proposals as a satisfactory way to proceed. Following this session and before the committee um, discussed what approach it wished to adopt, a representative from the Women's Aid Federation joined the meeting uh, to discuss the civil, aid, civil Legal Aid Eligibility Clause, i.e. Clause 27, which is now already part of the Bill. And I would like to place on record um, the Committee's appreciation of both the work carried out by Women's Feder the Women's Aid Federation and the representative uh, for making herself available to attend the Committee meeting, which again was at very short notice. I do want to reassure other groups that support domestic abuse victims that it was only the very tight timescale within which the committee was considering this matter uh, that prevented us holding further discussions with those organisations. Women's Aid emphasised how pleased uh, women that they represent are that legal aid is being discussed and has been included in the bill. The representative highlighted that reform of legal aid has been promised in the past with little being achieved, and there is a fear that Clause 27 will not be commenced. She provided information on a range of case studies where perpetrators are already using the system to continue to abuse and which illustrated the cost to victims um, is substantial and ongoing for a considerable period of time. Further obvious reasons that they would like to see the scope of provision to be as wide as possible. She also indicated that those women she had spoken to before coming to the committee um, really wanted to see this issue fully addressed in this bill. Following the evidence sessions, the committee spent a considerable amount of time discussing the additional information provided and the most appropriate way to progress this issue. And I want to thank the members of the committee for the time and effort that they spent on this matter. While members were content to decouple the commencement of Clause 27 with Parts 1 and 2 of the bill, as provided for in the committee's original amendment, and which the minister had indicated would prevent her from taking the, uh, forward the rest of the bill, including the new offence, which everybody wants to see brought in as soon as possible. There were a range of views regarding whether an alternative amendment relating to the commencement of Clause 27 should be brought forward. While some members did not feel able to support a further commencement amendment, Others expressed the view that it was important to provide some certainty regarding the timescale for the commencement of the legal aid uh, clause, particularly given the views expressed by and the expectation of victims. Concerns were also expressed that a number of differing figures and costs had been mentioned by the Department, but there was no reference point for these, and it was clear that until the due diligence exercise has been completed, it is not possible to provide figures or the likely impact with any degree of accuracy. While the Minister during the evidence session gave a commitment to commence Clause 27, if the outcome of the due diligence exercise was satisfactory, timescales were vague for this to be completed. 
The lack of evidence and firm timescales was a factor for members. Yes, I'll give way to the Minister. I, I thank the Chairman um, for giving way. Um, with respect to timescales, um, we couldn't give a definite timescale in terms of how long the due diligence would take, but I was able to reassure the Committee that it would be my intention, if the due diligence proves that there are no repercussive of costs, that we would commence both the offences and the legal aid provisions at the same time, and that was also given in writing um, by myself and the Finance Minister in our letter to the Committee. Okay, I thank the Minister for that, and when I'm speaking individually, I'll, I'm going to go into to that more. Um, obviously, members appreciate I'm just setting out the context for the Committee uh, and how it considered all of these things. The, the Committee subsequently agreed then to withdraw its original amendment uh, and to bring forward Amendment 13, which, as I outlined earlier, provides for Section 27 to come into operation 12 months after this Act receives royal assent. Uh, members viewed this as a reasonable way forward to enable the Minister to progress the Bill while setting a time scale in relation to the legal aid provision. It provides more than 12 months for the due diligence exercise to be completed. If the exercise indicates that there are no or minimal implications, the Minister can commence the legal aid provision. If the exercise indicates that the repercussive impact would be such as she fears, then members who supported the committee amendment have already placed on record during the committee meeting, and I am sure will repeat during the debate today, that they would support her bringing forward either a provision in the Justice Bill uh, or a very short standalone bill through accelerated passage repealing the legal aid provision. While all committee members were content to withdraw the original amendment, not all supported Amendment 13, and I am sure they will outline the reasons uh, for that today. Uh, I'll also expand on why I'm supporting the approach of the committee when I speak as an individual MLA. Following the committee's decision to bring forward Amendment 13, the minister wrote to the committee indicating that she would resist the amendment. Uh, the minister also repeated her undertaking that, if appropriate due diligence, the legal aid provisions are not deemed to be uh, repercussive. Uh, she would accede to the assembly's wishes and commence clause 27. She also stated that, by convention, the minister's assurances in these matters are usually sufficient, and she was disappointed with the approach adopted by the committee. I would like to reassure the minister that committee members have made it clear that this is not a matter of trust in her. Uh, no one knows what will happen over the coming months, given no specific timescales could be provided to the committee with regard to the completion of the due diligence exercise and with the end of the mandate coming in approximately 15 months' time, following which there may be a change of minister. The committee amendment provides reassurance that Clause 27 will be commenced within a reasonable timescale, but with commitments that if there are the significant repercussive impacts, support will be forthcoming to repeal uh, Clause 27. So I would ask Assembly members to support the committee amendment which has been brought forward to balance and address the concerns of the Minister and the concerns of the uh, sector and to enable all the provisions in this bill to be enacted at the earliest opportunity. And that concludes my commentary and my official role as Chairman of the Committee. Mr Speaker, just to, to make some individual uh, remarks in respect of this. Um, and obviously, I do welcome uh, that we have got to, to the further consideration stage uh, today. Um, this issue was addressed briefly, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, whenever uh, the bill was not moved. Um, and I would just draw attention uh, to members in this House that, in respect of what originally was Amendment 15, which subsequently has been withdrawn, and now the Committee Amendment 13. Uh, the Minister, uh, in her letter to the Committee, um, makes it clear uh, that this does not address the fundamental point I was making at the Committee session. So, The fundamental premise upon which the Minister chose not to move further consideration stage a week ago, according to the Minister, has not changed, and yet further consideration stage was moved today. And I think that does in one moment, just as I elaborate, I think that does beg the question why the committee carried out its role with efficiency, with detailed scrutiny, uh, with an expectation that this would receive royal assent before the end of this year. However, in not moving last week, that is now not possible. 
final stage will not take place until January, and we have lost five to six weeks whenever the committee had carried its work expeditiously, wanting to com complete it this uh, well in advance of Westminster, and yet we now have a six-week delay, which, based upon the Minister, has been entirely unnecessary. I will give way to the Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm happy to clarify that the fundamental point that I was making was that to tie in legislation in my hands to commence a piece of legislation which was fundamentally flawed and could lead to repercussive costs had not been addressed. The reason I'm able to bring it this week and couldn't last week um, is that it is no longer coupled to the commencement of the offences, which means that the entire bill would not be destroyed. And I will correct the member on a further point that he made as he was um, elucidating um, on those points. A royal assent was never going to be received this side of Christmas. Final reading was intended for today, um, but royal assent would not have been forthcoming until January because of the delay between final reading um, and royal assent. There has been a one-week delay in terms of uh, this particular bill. That is regrettable, um, but I'm glad that we're here today in order to conclude the proceedings as quickly as possible. Well, yes, I'll, if, if, I'll, I'll give way to, to the member from South Belfast shortly. And I don't want to, to repeat because we are making progress. Um, th these are more points of accuracy and for completeness, so that uh, the record will show whenever we have this in years to come, if people are wanting to look back in order that there is a fulsome picture. And so these are more for points of accuracy. Um, and I mentioned in my role as chairman the responsibilities that I have to carry out the will of the committee, even if I didn't agree with the committee. Um, but it was made clear um, earlier in my commentary a letter was received very late on Sunday evening. Um, the minister subsequently um, was accusing me of um, having been the cause of this delay and indeed uh, in not moving it said that I had asked the chair of the committee not to move Amendment 15, but he refused to give me that assurance this morning. That was last week. I don't recall at any stage the minister phoning me sending me any text messages um, whenever it came to seeking that assurance. I do recall walking into this chamber and the minister and Mr. Frew were engaged in a conversation and I took my seat getting ready to make a point of order uh, and you asking me in respect of this and I was wanting to deal with assembly business and yet you took that as a definitive response that I was, I was not in a position to give you that response and that you would have to wait and you took that as the basis for them not moving and used it as justification in terms of what you said in this House and indeed what they had subsequently went out on Twitter. I would expect that whenever you're seeking formal communication from me as chairman, it would go beyond just me walking in on an exchange between you and this member. And that was the basis that you then proceeded to justify the action. Um, I, I will. I thank the member for giving way, um, and I'm happy to place on the record the exchange because I think it is helpful to other members to understand why. Um, as you know, the, the particular issue did not arise until the weekend, and therefore there was a very short amount of time for us to turn this around. I did write um, to the committee chair, um, and it was circulated to members of the committee. Um, they could not meet um, for whatever reason on the Monday morning, and that is not my business, nor is it for me to direct the operations of the committee. However, when I asked the chairman, in good faith in this chamber, face to face, which I think is an appropriate exchange between two professional individuals. I was told, you'll see when you see. So on that basis, I was not in a position to proceed uh, with the further consideration stage last week. Could I say, I think we're now getting bogged down in a, when I said what to whom and what circumstances, and I don't think it's adding any substance to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, and I'll take your guidance on that. I think I've put on record um, how I felt uh, it should have been done as opposed to the approach that was taken. Um, again, just more on a point of accuracy, uh, at the time when it was not moved, the Department then released press releases saying that these legal aid amendments were Justice Committee amendments. They were not. They were amendments brought forward by Rachel Woods. Um, Mr Frew had added his name to them, but they were not Justice Committee amendments, which then became the Assembly. And again, it was an inaccurate press release that went out in respect of that matter. Um, on, on the substance of the legal aid and the costs associated with legal aid, the Minister is right to raise concerns about setting parameters and wanting to make sure that there isn't 
um, uncosted provisions in that respect, uh, and no member uh, would want to be uh, signing up to that. I think it is worth putting on the record, though, that um, if the Department is right, that Clause 27, as currently uh, sitting in the Bill, could cost £14 million, then there is a very real issue for the victims of domestic abuse. Um, I, I do not accept that there has been an evidence basis brought forward to say that there is a gaping hole, that it is abusers that would benefit from this. And I know my colleague Mr Frew will elaborate on, on some of these points. But the basis of opposition has been predicated upon this helping abusers. Now, many of the people that I have spoken to indicate that the abusers often already have legal aid, but they don't. Um, and to that effect, I, just, I want to put on record my thanks to uh, the women's aid in my own constituency in the Lisburn branch that I met with uh, only uh, a number of weeks ago after consideration stage, and uh, the Atlas Centre, a women's organisation, where I heard firsthand from uh, women who are facing this very real problem um, of domestic abuse and the challenges that they face. But um, th there is a real problem that if it is £14 million, this, are, this is victims of domestic abuse that are having to pay for this out of their own pocket. And I think um, the public rightly are concerned about that. The, the Minister has indicated that uh, her Amendment 3, uh, if it is unamended by Amendments I think 4, 5 and 6, uh, would reduce that exposure to half a million pounds. So it's a very significant change of 14 million to half a million, um, and that's something I suppose members is going to have to bear in mind. Um, but in, in, in all of this, I, I have approached it in, in terms of my party in recognition of this being a real issue. Uh, it has been led by other members, and the department has been responding to that. Um, but this is a very real issue that we want to, to see addressed, and we want to have it commenced. We accept that Amendment 7 today that would enable a much wider review to take place in respect of contact orders when it comes to legal aid um, is something that we would want to see. Our problem with Amendment 7 in and of itself is a two-year process which only commits the Department with bringing forward with proposals. It does not have a, an outcome in that respect other than we will then bring forward with proposals, and that is two years later. And I regard Clause 27, subject to these amendments today being voted upon, as a catalyst to ensure that this is dealt with by the Department, because all of the organisations that I have spoken to have felt let down, that there have been promises made that then have not been carried through. And we need to ensure that it is, and Clause 27 uh, will ensure, in my view, that Amendment 7 then actually uh, gets enacted. And on the concerns around legal aid, th th this minister will know, um, uh, the department will know, the Legal Services Agency has had its accounts qualified for years. I don't believe since it was formed it has not had its accounts qualified for fraud and error. And whenever uh, I look at a report that the committee received very recently, the figures indicate that when it comes to error, um, they, as a, on the lower confidence side of their estimates, their error accounts to £6.5 million. On the upper end, it is £10 million. So they strike a medium to say they believe that error within the Legal Services Agency accounts to around £8 million, around £2 million in underpayments and £6 million in overpayments. Now, I think we are in a place where victims of domestic abuse are asking for more support from legal aid. The Department is resisting um, because of the 14 million figure and has an amendment to reduce that to half a million. And yet, the Legal Services Agency, in its own figures and a report that we have, is handing out around 11 per cent of its total budget through error. Now, I would love the Legal Services Agency to be able to put its house in order to be efficient, and then we would have, in the region of uh, £6 million at least, without seeking additional funding of legal aid that could go towards funding these provisions that the, the Assembly is wanting to do. So I think the Department's case, when it comes to the protection of the public purse, would be much stronger if the Legal Services Agency was able to put its own house in order. 
And then, of course, it takes us to the issue around those who are already qualifying for legal aid. Uh, and often we will hear from the public that those that are being prosecuted for criminal offences don't seem to have a problem in being able to fund and get legal aid in respect of all of their legal uh, defence teams that are there to represent them. And so I do think we need to have a much broader review of the legal aid budget. I know her predecessor, Mr Ford, and when I was chair of the committee at that stage, did take forward uh, reform in terms of standardised fees, faced very significant resistance um, from the profession in doing it. I supported him in that process. Uh, and, and, and so you know, there is a track record of seeking to reform legal aid. But I do believe we need to be very much listening to what the victims of domestic abuse are telling us, that they need to have support. And I do want to see a much wider reform of the legal aid in its entirety, not just around this issue of contact orders. And I would be supportive of the Minister in, in bringing forward proposals that would be a more holistic reform. But I do feel that we need to have um, Clause 27 subject to these amendments. And whatever, I suppose, let me give the assurance to the Minister, whatever the outworkings of Amendments 4, 5 and 6, I will be supporting Amendment 3. I do think it gives a structure and a framework, um, but we will be reserving our position uh, on Amendments 4 and 6. We will be supporting Amendment 5 in the name of Sinead Bradley and Rachel Woods, and we are listening uh, to what members are saying in respect of Amendments 4 and 6. And I know colleagues will elaborate on that from with my own party. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Linda Dillon. Can call you and thank the Minister for open remarks. And I would concur with a lot of what the Chairperson has said, particularly around the organisations and the, and the assistance that they have been to us and the individual victims. And at the end of the day, that's what this is about. And as I outlined at the committee meeting last week, we, we talk about stakeholders and sometimes we get very much into this kind of language in this place where you, you're just talking about stakeholders and who you engage with and it, it all becomes kind of very similar type language. But when we're talking about stakeholders, we're talking about victims. We're talking about many, many people who are suffering terrible abuse. And most of those people who are going to benefit from this don't know yet that this is for them because they have not yet been a victim or they do not yet know they are a victim. So I think that when we talk about the people we've engaged with, we haven't engaged with many, many of the people who this will have the biggest impact in their lives. So we need to remember that and be conscious of it. But I do, I do have to say and place on the record thanks to Women's Aid, CARA, the Men's Advisory Project, Rainbow, there are many, many others Children's Commissioner and others who, who have engaged with us and have been really, really helpful because at the end of the day, we are here to legislate, but we have to take advice from those who know what they're talking about, and particularly from a human rights perspective, and that's what this is about. It's about human rights. So in relation to Group 1, Amendment 1, Concordia, for me, was an extremely important, whilst probably the easy, most easily agreed amendment amongst the, the committee and, and the department and I do appreciate the work the department in, did in relation to this amendment in enhancing it and again I'd like to place on the record my thanks to the Department of Justice and the Department of Education for working so well together in relation to ensuring that that amendment could come forward and that we could actually deliver something that will make a real difference in young people's lives and, and I've said it in, in the original debate so I don't need to go over that again but I do think it is important I will, have been very focused on it over a number of years, and I think that I would like that placed on the record again. And I would like to thank again the member, Sinead Bradley, for her addition to that in terms of preschool and asking the department to have that addition placed into this amendment. And that has been, I think, again, only something to further enhance. I would like to say that within our schools, and our teaching staff, we have a lot to be very grateful for. And I think there has been many, many changes over the last number of years in, in the recognition of what nurture is all about. And this is another addition to nurture. And even for those who are not young people who are exposed to domestic abuse, just having this in here, having schools aware of it, having teachers and teaching staff aware of the fact that none of us know what any young person is leaving at home 
whenever they come into our teaching facilities. I think that that's really important. It's really important for us to always be conscious around that and to be thinking about it. So Amendment 1 for me is extremely important and I would like to say thank you again to both ministers for the work they did and for the speed at which they did it to make sure that the preschool children could also be included. In relation to the DAPOs and DAPINs, which is Amendment 2, again I think this is something that was very important because something again that all members were agreed at the beginning of this process was that the current assistance in terms of non-molestation orders are pathetic. They do not do anything for victims. We see repeatedly victims going for non-molestation orders at their own cost very often because they're low paid and they're just above the threshold for being able to get any assistance. Going to court, getting a non-molestation for two weeks and being brought back to court by the perpetrator again. I've seen it in, in my own office, people, particularly women, but others also coming to me who are in this circumstance, who are at their wit's end because they can't afford to go back to court again to get another non-molestation order. And these are, these are incidents of really, really serious domestic abuse and domestic violence. And these perpetrators are being allowed access to their victims repeatedly because their victims are not in a position to protect themselves. So for me, this is important that we have this, that the PSNA can actually issue the notices so it's done immediately. We don't have to wait for a court process. But we need to ensure, and this will be referred to later in the debate, we need to ensure that the training is done right and that the PSNA understand what the tools that they have access to and how to use them effectively to make sure that they protect, protect victims. So I do thank the Minister and, and the Department for making this halfway in terms of the DAPOs and DAPINs because it was the circumstance that, that there was some resistance to this and I think the Department were open to listening and understood why it was so important to us. And we did understand the challenges that the Department had in relation to this, but they have now went out to consultation and I would be very hopeful not only that the sectors and, and the stakeholders will engage, but the individuals who I talk about who come to our constituency offices day and daily who need this help, who need to have these protective notices and protective orders put in place. Amendment 3 then is the Minister's amendment in relation to legal aid. And I don't intend to repeat everything that, that the Chair has already said around the, the legal aid issues, but this is something that the, the committee debated at great length and found it very difficult to agree around, not because we don't think that victims should have more access to legal aid, because actually that's the one thing we were agreed on. Every member of the committee believes that victims need more and additional access to legal aid. What they have at the moment is not enough. And I spoke last weekend to Women's Aid, I spoke to a number of other organisations, and I spoke to legal professionals who do some pro bono work for victims. And the reason I spoke to legal professionals who don't pro bono work is because I believed that the fact that they do it on that basis would mean that they would be a good source of information within that profession. And they did highlight that those who are respondents are being dragged back through the courts repeatedly and are being financially and psychologically abused. They also highlighted that there are issues around applicants as well, and we're well aware of that. So I understand why the member Rachel Woods wants, in, wants applicants included, and so do I, but I think it's better done through Amendment 3, through the Department's amendment, because the, we will get a more fulsome picture, and we will limit that aspect where it can be abused by perpetrators. And that's where my biggest concern lies in this, not around the money, not around the finances, because the Chair is right. There is money that can be saved within legal services, and we need to look at how that can be done. And there needs to be an overall review in terms of legal aid. And we will see there where money can be saved. This is not about money. This is about protecting victims and about ensuring whatever we put in place will not create new victims. And what has already been outlined to us by the department is that what will happen as a result of us widening it out to applicants is that who is a victim or who constitutes a victim will be narrowed. And in discussions with, as I say, both with, with Women's Aid and others, we know that if it's narrowed into something like those where there are conviction, there will be very, very few victims who will be able to avail of legal aid if that's, if that's where we come down to, because there are very, very few convictions in relation to domestic abuse and domestic violence. 
Now, hopefully, what we're about to put on into, legislat into legislature will address some of that, but it won't address all of it because we know that there are many issues. It's not just about what's there on the on legislation. It's about the victims themselves and some of them not wanting to go through that process. So there are many issues that, that challenge us around this. And I think one of the other issues, and, and we need to, I do want it said in this House because I think it needs to be heard out there in the public. People need to recognise this is not something that goes on in people's private homes that is their private business. It is a criminal act. It is the most heinous of criminal acts because this is somebody who is supposed to love you who is supposed to protect you and they are abusing you in the place where you should feel most safe. So I think that we need to have that, that said as well and we, we do need to have the legal aid issue addressed in a more fulsome way. I will be supporting the Amendment 5 in relation to removing the lower courts because whilst I accept that this created some issues for the department and they've highlighted the issues that it creates, I don't think that there's a strong enough argument around it. And it was again raised with me that there are some cases that are ending up in the high courts around child access cases, which are some of the most very serious cases where people are unable to access legal aid. Now, whether that is because that is not there for them, we haven't fully established, or whether it is just that they don't know how to access it, or what the challenges are that the Minister has outlined, I'm not really sure. And that's the reason that I will be supporting Amendment 5, which is in the name of Rachel Woods and Sinead Bradley. I think that we can't take the chance that we'll have cases moving from the lower courts to the higher courts without access to legal aid. So it's important for that to be addressed. Amendment 6, we will not be supporting, and that is based on, on what I've already said around opening it up to applicants and the concerns that we have around that creating new victims by the very fact that you will either allow perpetrators to be able to abuse this or you will narrow in who a victim is so much that it will not be of any use to the people who need it most and that is those many, many victims out there that are being dragged back through the courts repeatedly around access to their children. Absolutely. I thank the member for giving way, but does the member not agree with me that the potential misuse of the waiver will only be an issue if the department does not produce the relevant guidance and processes to prevent it from happening, and that everything that the department needs to do that is in subsection 3 of the minister's own amendment? I do agree that it's, it is within the department's role to do that, but that is exactly where my fear lies is that it will be who constitutes a victim will be narrowed so much that we will almost, if not actually be at the point of where it's only a conviction, we will almost be there. And that's going to rule out so many people that I just don't think that that is, that is where we want to be. And I certainly know that it's not where the member wants to be because obviously you, you brought this forward around the legal aid, which I do think is vital. And we know from listening to the organisations and from the victims how important this particular issue is around the access to legal aid. So I absolutely support you in your intent around this. I think that it is nothing only good and honest and proper intent around helping those who most need it. But I do fear that we'll end up helping less people by widening out the scope. That's not to say when the proposals come forward that we shouldn't then widen out the scope based on those proposals. And the member Sinead Bradley raised earlier on that faith in this House you know, and the faith of the, of the organisations and of the victims for us to deliver for them is, very, as an, is at an all-time low. Well, that's faith in all of us. Remember that. It's faith in all of us. Every single member of the committee, every single individual MLA, as well as ministers. So if we want to ensure that we deliver for them, then we all do it. We don't put that responsibility on any one individual, on any committee, or, or on any committee that only sits now, because there will potentially be different MLAs on different committees, different MLAs in this House the next mandate. But I would like to think that we have placed this on the record today to ensure that it will be honoured by any Assembly and by any members who sit in this Assembly, and that whatever proposals are brought forward to any future Justice Committee, that they will look at them and understand why they are so important to the sector. And I can certainly speak for myself when I say, regardless of whether I'm on the Justice Committee, Regardless of whether I'm an MLA, I represent my party. 
I represent my party's views. So they are well aware that I have an expectation of my party to deliver in relation to this on any future Justice Committee. It is not for me as an individual, it is absolutely for whoever comes behind me as well to ensure this is delivered, because none of us know how long we'll be here. No minister knows how long they'll sit in their department. So we need to ensure that whenever we start something, we do it with the intent that those who come behind us will complete the job. And that way, I think we really will truly regain some belief in this House and in us as individuals. Amendment 13, unfortunately, we are unable to support. And I had already given a commitment that we would not be supporting amendment 15, the original Amendment 15 around linking the commencement. And it is for this reason, what I've just outlined, that we all have a responsibility to ensure that what is in this bill is delivered on. And I, again, will give my, put my absolute guarantee on the record that as long as I'm in the Justice Committee and as long as my party has members on the Justice Committee, what is in this bill will be delivered on. Because it's only going to be as good as the rollout of it. It's only going to be as good as how well the committee scrutinises it. And we have put, and we'll speak to that in the, the next group of amendments, we have put a lot in the face of this bill around the, you know, the, the reporting and the independent oversight, which I think is extremely important, and I'm glad it's there. But we, as a committee, are the oversight of anything within the department. And we know what we have in this bill, and we know why we have it there and why it's important. So we will have a responsibility in relation to this. I do think that it is helpful to us to have somebody doing the independent oversight. I do think that it is helpful to us to have the reporting processes on the face of the bill, because that will give us the information we need to ensure that we do the best with this bill. So it is my hope that members will support the amendments that we have asked to be supported. I, I am not obviously asking members to oppose the amendments that we oppose, because that's not my, my argument to have. I just outlined the reasons that we will oppose them, but I'm certainly not asking others across this House to follow our lead. I'm just asking that you consider the points that I have made. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, can I say how not just happy but relieved I am to know that this bill has been moved today. I will go straight into the groupings um, and look at Amendment 1 on the, the new clause and the, also the information sharing with schools on 8. The amendment as presented serves as a comprehensive and well-drafted version which carries the intent contained in the Justice Committee's early, earlier motion. I believe the amendment serves as one of the many opportunities to place on record my thanks to the department officials who diligently listened to the views of committee members and endeavoured to capture them in their amendments. It may also be an opportune time to thank the Bills Office who assisted us in framing our thoughts um, on what we were trying to express on different amendments throughout the Bill. And I, I am satisfied that the committee has played a very robust um, contribution and is evidenced on the face of the bill at this stage. In bringing forward this amendment, we recognise the ripple effect that domestic abuse can have on young lives. Children caught up in an incident of domestic abuse in whatever form need support and protection. Without knowledge of an incident, school leaders and teachers will not know the child may be in need of additional support or reassurance. The need to interpret any behaviours in the context of a potential cry for help needs to be flagged up at the earliest possible opportunity. Schools and teachers can and do offer a safe, steady and nurturing environment for our young people. It is in their interest to know when domestic abuse is an issue, and it is also our duty to ensure that those same professionals are resourced and adequately to deal with such reports. Amendment 1 could be the lifeline that many life, young lives depend upon if a domestic abuse incident is unbearable. I wish to thank the Department and the Minister for following up on my request to insert the preschools, and I very much welcome the amendment as a strong addition to the Bill. Amendment 2 again 
a thorough and detailed development of the original intent. I have no doubt when operational and protective measures for victims of abuse will provide significant reassurance to those unfortunate to become reliant on their outworkings. The breadth of regulations and provisions that can be derived from this clause in the Bill are extensive. A period of two years for the operation of Clause 1 and 2 gives them an actionable time frame, and the House should also note the regulations stemming from this clause without, cannot happen without the resolution of this Assembly. Amendment 3. I welcome the Justice Minister's proposals to Amendment 3, which seeks to honour the vote earlier taken on this House to make legal aid available to those victims and survivors of domestic abuse who have been further victimised by their abuser through the court system. And regardless of the debate that, that we'll pursue around this issue, it's important to note this is on the bill, and I, have, I would hope that in supporting Amendment 3, it will stay on the face of the bill, and legal aid will become available to those victims. When the clause was placed on the bill, there was widespread agreement that more work would need to be done to refine, refine the parameters of that entitlement. And I believe the Minister's amendment does go some way to doing that, but I would add with the addition of Amendment 5. During the many deliberations and engagement with stakeholders, the SDLP were left with a very clear understanding of the effect the vexatious claims within the family court system were having on victims. The relentless stories of abusers who were using the court system to retain a control or power over their victim was and is disturbing. A common and reoccurring theme is in these instances included an abuser who had entitlement to legal aid and a victim who did not. A victim who may be in employment and in receipt of working tax credits, perhaps also child tax credits and housing benefit, is likely to be refused legal aid support, as these benefits, which we all know are not a disposable income, are treated as such. Their income calculation perversely excludes them from legal aid, and their need to respond to court cases brought by their abuser has the power to financially break them. The working poor victims, they want to work. Their workplace can be of critical importance to them as they set to out to rebuild their lives. Their jobs is the focus of their life beyond the abuse. It is the environment that builds their confidence and their contacts with normality. Their need and want to work offers much more than a financial income. It's because a sanctuary for, it becomes a sanctuary for their mental health. Supporting these working poor victims at this juncture offers them the opportunity to stay and work and represents the strongest method of public money to help empower these individuals. I would, yes. Would the member agree with me that this is exactly why this access to legal aid should not be about cost saving? Because there will be a cost saved somewhere within the system. We know that there are people who leave their jobs to be able to access legal aid because they can no longer afford to stay at work. I thank the member for the intervention, and I would agree, and I would go further. I think the social cost of not helping could be much greater, and I, I do think we should explore in more detail that reality. By not supporting, supporting them via the legal aid system, we may set victims on a downward spiral of becoming unemployed and more heavily reliant on the benefit system. It could strongly be argued by not supporting victims at this critical point in time, we are merely delaying the social cost, and which will present in different forms at a later time. Early intervention through the legal aid could offer a steady pathway to building a life beyond domestic abuse. The SDLP therefore welcomes the amendment and supports the Minister's amendment and supports it with that one further amendment required. Clause 27 sets out a clear principle in law that victims of domestic abuse who are being brought through the family courts by their abuser will be supported by legal aid. The clause as drafted, however, does not extend to the family care centre, where many cases are destined to end. Cases transferred by a judge or presented to the family care centre via a right of appeal could see many of those victims financially compromised at that point. The support they require falls at this point without the addition of Amendment 5. 
While I acknowledge and appreciate a more thorough financial assessment of income is completed on application for legal aid at the higher court, and that it is more likely that a victim will receive support, albeit with a contribution, in these circumstances, it is also true to note that the principle of support would be lacking in this part of the Bill. For all those reasons outlined, I therefore ask, ask members to consider supporting Amendment 5. I believe it is of critical importance that we consent in our offer to support them throughout the family court system. Amendments 4 and 7. The member moving these amendments will know my absolute support in wanting to move to this space and support those victims in this regard. However, given the timeline of this bill to date and the amount or lack of consideration and full thorough debate that we have been able to have on this, I am not satisfied today that we have drafted or pinned it down entirely well enough to commence at this stage. And it is with regret that we will not be supporting those amendments. However, we will work with Amendment 27A and the Minister going forward to try and encapsulate what has been attempted to be achieved here. Moving on to the committee amendment, um, which did start out as Amendment 15 and is presented today as Amendment 13. On the 7th of December, the member did not move the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill based on concerns that had been raised by her with the Finance Minister on the Friday before. I, I won't go over all of this because the Committee Chair has um, quite accurately reflected the timeline. But I will quote um, one thing in, that, in the letter where it said, we are concerned that the potential financial implications of the legal aid provision in the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill could be significant and in particular could have repercussive effect. The clause the Minister referred to was um, to have this effect as Clause 27 on the Bill as printed and could continue to have this effect even if the Minister's own amendment is approved today. In light of this new information, whilst vague in nature, it was clear both ministers anticipated the possible difficulty that might be realised via Clause 27, and if any, of any of the proposed amendments on that day would have compounded by passing the Committee Amendment 15. Committee Amendment 15 would see Clause 27, as was likely to be amended by the Minister on that day, commence alongside parts of the Bill that create the offence of domestic abuse. While the potential risks the Minister referred to rest exclusively within 27 of the Bill, the coupling and the commencement dates pr provided no space for the Minister to assess the likelihood or scale of the, the potential risk. Therefore, it was only proper that the Minister's joint communications, which presumably took a day or two to, to share, used the words could be significant. I wish to place on record for the benefit of the Minister Long and Minister Murphy that their words of warning of potential chaos did not land lightly with me. I heard them, I valued them, and I am every bit as eager as they are to urgently understand the likelihood and scale of any potential effect that may come into play. As a representative of the constituency of South Down, I take seriously my role of respecting the view of this House, acting with caution and being responsible in any proposals or positions I adopt. Despite my disappointment and the disappointment expressed by many, I, on behalf of the SDLP, immediately on that day entered into solution mode. Having heard the distressing accounts of domestic abuse conveyed to us all during the deliberations of this bill, one thing was clear. Stalemate was and is not an option. I appreciate that all those across the sector who facilitated emergency calls and meetings with me on that day and the days that followed. I thank the Minister herself who agreed on to my request for an emergency meeting and the Chair of the Justice Committee who agreed to call an emergency meeting of the Justice Committee. I thank the Bills Office who assisted me in deliberations at that time and the representatives from across the sector who shared views 
on the potential effects and on a way forward. In particular, I want to single out for thanks the family solicitor Sinead Larkin and Sonia McMullen, McMullen from the Women's Aid Federation. During my discussions with stakeholders who had so generously given up their time throughout the development of this bill, it was made clear that it served nobody if the bill was not moved. I therefore genuinely welcome that the bill has been moved today, and I put it down in no sm small part to the work that played out at committee. It must be noted that the short but ambitious time frame for commencing the bill has played a significant role in creating little room for full investigation. This may be a flaw in the process, as opposed to calling it a flaw to have to revise any established bill. Ahead of any vote on Amendment 13 and any outcome that might arrive from that division, I welcome the Minister's assurance given following my intervention on the floor of this House today. Likewise, I have satisfied myself that there is, as the Minister stated, an unambiguous legal duty for the Minister to commence on this bill. I also repeat my assurance that on behalf of the SDLP that I place firmly on record that the SDLP um, would listen to any warnings and, if they became factual, would support in any revocation that may be required. It remains our preference that commencement of legal aid would be stipulated on the face of the bill. But the dilemma was this. Could we stand by in good conscience and watch this bill not be moved at this stage today or at any later stage, the final stage? Particularly, put that in the context where we all know the domestic abuse incidents are on the rise during COVID and particularly during lockdown. Let it be clear, everybody in this House agrees domestic abuse is a criminal offence and we need it to be on the statute books as such. The SDLP, like others, present a committed, are committed to realising that the commencement on legal aid will be realised. We will, however, in a bid to ensure movement of this bill, not force the commencement on the issue in the form of Amendment 13 as it sits today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Doug Bailey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> I suppose every every conversation and uh, every debate, uh, every every clause and every amendment, and every amendment on each amendment uh, on the domestic abuse uh, bill, have all been done for the right reasons. Not a single person has put something forward for the wrong reason. It's all been put forward for the right reasons. And today, in the further consideration phase, what we're really doing is refining uh, and balancing what I think is a, is a really good bill. Um, uh, and I think we've done a fantastic job in the time frame to create what we have uh, created. Um, I think, in, in many respects, uh, the Chair and the Deputy Chair of the Committee um, have expressed my views on, on many of the, the, uh, the amendments. And I, I'm never one for just standing to talk about an amendment for the sake of talking about an amendment when the point has already been put across. So in regards to Amendment 1 uh, and Amendment 2, those points have been put across and the Ulster Unionist Party will support them. But I want to just mention one thing on Amendment 1, if I may. And it's something that I picked up on and it, and it resonated with me. And it was, it was during, I think it was during a, a debate uh, in, in the committee uh, and it was Mr Fru who, who, who explained Amendment 1 in a real term. And he explained it like this. And this really did resonate with me as to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and Amendment 1 is information sharing with schools. And he talked about that child going to school having had no sleep, possibly late for school, having no lunch when they turned up at school, and being met by an angry teacher who then brought them in, not knowing 
that that child had possibly been involved in a domestic abuse incident that night. But the absolute opposite to that is by having Amendment 1 in this, is that child already possibly traumatised by what may have happened will be met by an understanding teacher who will take them by the hand uh, and lead them in and support them. And it's those small vignettes that I got from the likes of Paul Frew and others from um, other members uh, of the committee um, which really did stay with me uh, and, and, and show me that what we were trying to achieve in regards to this bill was absolutely the right thing. And at the end of this, we will produce a bill uh, in January uh, which will be fit for purpose and good for those people who are suffering this awful um, domestic, uh, this awful crime of domestic abuse. Amendment 2 has been explained in some uh, detail. Uh, Amendment 3 uh, and 7 deal with legal aid and we have spoken about legal aid uh, and these amendments at length. Legal aid is complex and I absolutely get the sentiment where people say, well, it's not about money, it's not about how much we spend. But the reality is, unfortunately, if we are really honest, it is in some cases. And I don't mean that by saying it because we're going to deny people legal aid. But there is a reality to it. And that is, we don't have funding to be able to go round. We end up salami slicing what we have, and some people will lose out. And nobody in this room wants to be in the position to say, you lose out, but you're going to get it. So we do have to be fiscally responsible with money. I've raised this long before. I know the chair uh, of the committee has raised the issue about legal aid previously. And I know the minister knows I have raised the issue about legal aid um, previously. We are close on close on three times the legal aid bill uh, of Scotland by head of population. We are second only in the European Union to Norway in our legal aid bill. So we do have to be fiscally uh, responsible uh, and legal aid uh, is complex. So it's not just about savings, it's about understanding what and how we use the money that's available to us to make sure that we support the right people. I think Amendment 3 uh, and 7 do exactly that. Uh, I think they define it and I think they define it well. But of course there are uh, three amendments to um, uh, uh, Amendment 3 and that's Amendment uh, 4, 5 and 6. Uh, I think the arguments around Amendment 4 uh, and six uh, have been put out quite eloquently uh, uh, and um, I guess I can maybe just add to it when I look at Amendment 4 uh, and we talk about um, advice and assistance and representation whereas in the original amendment it's just representation. I, I suppose in Amendment 4 that's not defined. It's a little bit too loose. Uh, for me. Uh, and for me, representation actually covers that. I think if you go to a solicitor, uh, normally the first meeting with a solicitor is, is free anyway, and he gives you that uh, advice, and, and you should get that support. I'm happy um, with um, uh, Amendment 3 without having to amend it with Amendment 4. So, so I, I won't be supporting, and my party will not be supporting uh, Amendment 4. Amendment 5, uh, we will be supporting. Um, and again, that's been laid out uh, quite well, and there's no point me just talking for uh, the sake of talking. And, and Amendment 6, uh, we are not uh, going to be support, supporting because there is an issue about the respondent. And we all, and I've, we've said this before, we can all talk about people who we have spoken, and we can all talk about these vignettes and how they work. And I have done similar, and I have spoken to people, women who have been domestically abused who are actually being taken to court time and time again, and they don't have legal aid, but the abuser does. And it's that fine line, it is that fine balance, uh, and we cannot support Amendment 6 uh, for that uh, reason. I suppose if we go on to uh, Amendment 13, and, and previously that was Amendment 15, and I, I will be absolutely honest, uh, is I did support Amendment 15. Amendment 15 was to start legal aid when the bill came into force, and I, I did support that. 
but we did receive new information from the Minister, uh, and that was that there may be uh, a, a serious financial implication to this, uh, including a repercussive effect. That was new information. Had we brought 15 to the floor a week ago with that new information, I would not have been able to support it. I would have voted against it. And the committee, having met, and, and how we met, and when we met, have been explained by numerous people, decided that we would remove 15, that there was a danger, that the Minister did need time um, to do her checks and her balances to make sure that we would not be given uh, a, <coughs> excuse me, a legal aid bill uh, in perpetuity, that we would have um, serious financial implications on our block grant and all of the other departments who would have to chip in um, to help fix that. So we now get to the stage where we have Amendment uh, 13, which says that having said we agree that the Minister says she needs time to do checks and balances, we've literally says, OK, but you've got 12 months. Uh, and, and I'm not in that space to say to the Minister, you've got 12 months. I'm in that space where the Minister tells me that they've got a, pr a problem with it. If I agree we've got a problem with it, then I need the Minister to be given the time and space to deal with that problem. And I do have trust. I have trust in our Ministers. I have trust in the Chair of our Committee and the Vice Chair and its members and other people that they will do exactly what they say they will do. And the Minister has said that having done the checks and if there's no adverse effect, she will make sure that um, Clause 27, Amendment 3 and 7 will be brought in. Uh, and I believe her. And, I, and therefore I support her uh, in, in doing that. Um, and the reality is we don't know where we'll be in 12 months. I think that's, that's, that's what nobody knows where we'll be uh, nobody will know what will happen in 12 months. I think the Chair said that, and he's absolutely right. And I can go to the absolute extremes and say we could pass Amendment 13, and then in six months this Assembly could collapse, and 13 would be put in place, and we would be paying out what could be an excessive amount of money. I just don't know, and I don't feel the need to do it. So to me, it becomes something. Um, superfluous to, to what we're trying to achieve here. So, um, as I said in the, in the Justice Committee, we will not be um, supporting uh, Amendment 13. Uh, we will, however, be making sure, uh, and I know the Minister would expect us all to do this, make sure that she's held to her word, and that is that she will bring in Clause 27, Clause 27A, once she's done the uh, checks and the balances. Uh, and she assures herself that there will be no repercussive effects that would affect our um, block grant. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I will finish um, briefly uh, and just say that um, the work that has been done by, by this committee uh, is exceptional. And at the very start, when I did say what, every single conversation that we had was to make this bill better, it really, really was. Some of the things that have been inserted into this, I've got to tell you, just took me by surprise. I would never have thought of it. But that's because of there's a real diligence within this. And right now, at the 11th hour, what we need to do is just unite and understand what we're trying uh, to achieve uh, in regards to uh, this bill. And uh, every single thing we're trying to achieve is to make a good bill that helps people uh, of domestic uh, violence, that horrific crime. Uh, and if we cannot divide, it is a good signal to send out to those victims um, that we are standing united to support them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, before I uh, move into my main speech, I just wanted to um, address a point that um, the Chairman of the Justice Committee raised around losing a week because that of the vital information that the Justice Minister and Finance Minister brought to the Committee. Um, we in the Health Committee this summer recognised how much work was ahead of us and what we had to deal with, so we hardly took any recess. We were closed for two weeks. 
Unlike the Justice Committee, who decided to take nearly the whole summer, if you hadn't have taken those extra four or five weeks, you would be about three or four weeks ahead. Of Could I ask the member just to go back to the, the, the Yeah, clause. but I, I thought that was an important know, point. I, because I did, nobody, read, I did nope. suggest earlier, sorry, would you take a seat, please? I did make the point earlier on that we were digressing into a matter of who said what when, and I don't want to continue in that vein. It's very important business and a very moderate way has been dealt with this evening, so I'd like you to return to the uh, order paper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So many of the issues have been dealt with in the actual bill have already been rehearsed. Um, they are extremely important, but I want to focus specifically on amendments 1 to 8 and 13. I will be supporting um, 1 to 3 and 7 and 8. I am opposed to the amendments to amendment 3, that is amendment 4 and 6, and I am also opposed to amendment 13 arising from those. Amendment 1 is an extremely important addition to the Bill, particularly in the context of the time through which we are living. One of the most challenging aspects of the pandemic has been the necessary absence, either through school closure or self-isolation, of pupils from school, including preschool. This, of course, has an impact on development and education, but it, is also, it also has a particular impact on the ability of social workers and the authorities in general to detect signs of abuse in the home and the authorities in general to detect these um, at just the very moment where there is less um, ability to escape from that home. Amendment 1 recognises the importance of all education providers being made aware of incidents of abuse. Clearly in the context of this bill, that means domestic abuse. A new clause before Clause 26 will enable or require a relevant person to inform a designated person at, um, at the education provider that is not just a school, but a college or any other training facility or a preschool facility of an incident of abuse concerning a child in education or training with that provider. In our view, this renders unnecessary a subsection of Clause 28 as removed by Amendment 8. Amendment 1, as written, is important as it makes sure the enabling powers are robust in terms of what can be achieved via regulations. This is particularly important in relation to offences and penalties. Amendment 2, I believe, provides a consensus across the Department and the Committee on the explicit protection of people from abusive behaviour, and I would take this opportunity to draw attention to subsection 2. Steps or measures which may be provided for in regulations under this section are not limited to notices or orders referred to in this section. For too long, the authorities' abilities to respond to domestic abuse have lacked clarification, but this clause, as written, has the potential very much to change that. The regulations which follow on from this will also be a vital piece of scrutiny work for this Assembly. Amendment 3 is a carefully worded clause which enables access to legal aid for those who appear to be victims of domestic um, abuse behaviour and is designed specifically to ensure this goes to the victims and not to the perpetrators. It is important, in my view, to have the wording exactly as is in this amendment, and also then Amendment 7, precisely in order to ensure that this legal aid is actually available to the right people in the right way. I have to say it is my personal hope that we will be able to move early on in this debate to a much broader reform of legal aid, um, which has already been mentioned in this debate, which will manage this and many other aspects of access to justice more comprehensively and efficiently. However, I share the Committee's insistence that we have to make some progress on it in this Bill. What I would again emphasise is, is that this progress must be in support of victims, and that is why Amendment 3 is written as it is. I am afraid that Amendment 4 is unnecessary and would simply increase, increase the cost to no benefit to the victims. A similar issue applies to Amendment 5, which is again simply unnecessary, as the discretion already applies in the higher courts where the waiver has been used in the lower courts. Again, this is why Amendment 3 is written as it is and replicates the protection available already to applicants for non-molestation orders and enables fair consideration of what support is necessary and justified. While Amendment 4 and 5 are, in my view, simply unnecessary, Amendment 6 concerns me most because it is blatantly counterproductive. The practical outworking would simply be to make it easier for perpetrators to access legal aid while masquerading as the victim. I would, I would urge members to consider carefully if that is what they really Yes? Forgiving way, and I will repeat my earlier intervention. 
Will the member not agree with me that the potential misuse of the waiver is only an issue if the department do not produce the relevant guidance and processes to prevent it from happening? The, the minister and her officials have been clear that they will be taking forward what the committee have been saying and making sure that whenever they are producing the guidance, they will take full account of what the committee have been saying on these issues. Yes. I thank the member for giving way, and she is, of course, correct that we have said we would bring this forward. But the concern that we have around Amendment 6 is that if we have to so delineate between victim and perpetrator, that it could be very, it could, for example, be necessary to have gone to court against your abuser, to have made police reports against your abuser. We could actually end up excluding victims who have done neither but are absolutely entitled to the waiver, but up until that point have not taken any action against their abuser. And so the real risk is about if we define victim very narrowly in terms of legal aid, we will actually be depriving victims of legal aid but allowing perpetrators to masquerade as victims. Thank you. Um, members need to reflect that none of these amendments have been consulted upon and our focus should be on support for victims bringing forward serious issues, not for perpetrators pushing spurious litigation. I have to say that Amendment 13 is highly irregular to put in place a specific time for the commencement of legal aid provisions when it is unclear how long preparations for them will take. It constitutes poor lawmaking and serves no useful purpose. We cannot apply these provisions until guidance has been developed by legal professionals, administrative and operational arrangements are in place, and the relevant changes to IT systems have been completed. Most of, most of all, it has been clarified by ministers that attempting to pursue this could lead, in effect, to the Northern Ireland Executive and thus the Northern Ireland Repair having to cover additionally, additionally, sorry, additionally the cost of some legal aid in England and Wales. Again, none of this has been consulted upon. None of it has had the financial implications fully considered. None of it has even been checked to see if it is competent. We, we would not draft initial legislation without having done all these checks, so why would we allow it to have been amended without having done them? The Assembly must see this amendment for what it is and reject it as fundamentally poor process and potentially bad law. Mr Speaker, it is good that consensus has been reached on most of the points, and there is no question that amendments 1 to 3 strengthen the bill, enabling and requiring information to be provided to all education providers where necessary and appropriate, recognising and acting on the need to protect victims, sorry, protect people with, from domestic abuse in the first place and not just punish the perpetrators just after it has happened, and providing for access to justice for all. We do need to be careful, however, that we do not create bad law by not allowing guidance to be developed, administrative arrangements to be made and systems to be changed before new provisions, particularly around legal aid, come into operation. It is for these reasons that I commend to the House the amendments appearing in the Minister's name, but I urge members to consider rejecting amendments 4 to 6 as their focus moves away from the interests of the victims and of good law. And while we have improved the bill by adding legal aid provisions to it, members must absolutely reject Amendment 13 as it has not been financially appraised and risks the same sort of lack of proper scrutiny which led to the whole RHI scandal. This does not bear repeating. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Paul Frew. Speaker, uh, so uh, can I just say that I've enjoyed my time on the committee. I've enjoyed my time scrutinising this bill, and I do believe very much so that the members within and contained within that committee have made a massive positive difference to this bill. And. Uh, in a positive way, as best I can, I wish that the department would have been more forthcoming with their amendments so that the committee could have done its work in good time instead of the delays that the member opposite talks about just there now. I will, I will commence then by thanking the department and the minister uh, for, moving, for moving this bill, this stage. Last week it was in doubt. Last week, it was in doubt. I never thought that the Domestic Abuse uh, and Family Proceedings Bill would have been put in jeopardy and delayed as it was because of amendments that the committee sought to put down in order to strengthen the bill. 
And that really worries me, Mr. Speaker. And I suppose, as I have walked through this journey along with the committee members and this assembly, I have seen good things. I have seen positive things. I have seen scary things. I see things that have puzzled me. I will get to those later. But what I have also seen is a curtailment of the democratic process that horrifies me. Horrifies me. And I will talk about that a wee bit later. But I will thank the Department then for moving this bill at this stage and the Minister, uh, of course, for bringing forward the amendments early between consideration stage and further consideration stage. That is what a committee would expect. And that is what a committee had sought during the summer months but was not forthcoming. And I would ask the member to reflect on that and look back on the history of the good work this committee has given to this assembly floor. Um, would the member give way? Yes, I will. Yes. Thank the member for giving way. I regret not giving way to the member for South Belfast because I, I recall she did ask to give way on this. Um, the member will know that uh, at no stage did the Justice Committee take a, I'm not sure the exact term of phrase, but didn't do its work throughout the summer months. Quite the opposite, we did. Indeed, the Minister herself praised the committee for the excellent work that has been carried out. So I understand there's this narrative which the member has cr rightly picked up on that uh, this member from South Belfast, and I, I admire her desire to defend her minister, that's adm admirable, but let's not let facts get in the way of truth. I think but, I want, look, we're going to end up opening this up again to what I would consider to be a bit of nonsense, to be quite honest with you, because we all know what we're dealing with here. There's been tremendous work done between the department and the committee. Everybody understands that sterling work has been done. The stakes here are quite high. The objective is to get measures in place which will help victims of domestic abuse out within our community. So let's go back to the task of doing that today without any further immoderate suggestions that who did what when. As I said, I don't want to be listening to that again the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I agree completely with your sentiments. Uh, so I will move on. I would like to thank the committee, Clark, and the staff of the committee for their excellent work over the, the, the months, uh, the duration of the time that we have took to scrutinise this bill. And I would also offer my thanks to the Bill Office uh, for their sterling work and advice uh, to this committee at this time. And all of us, as a team, Minister, Department, write down have made this bill much better, uh, a much better bill for victims going forward. And I commend the process, the democratic process, and everybody in that part uh, that deals with that. Uh, can I just go straight to the amendments of this bill as we see fit? Uh, and again, it's already been mentioned a lot here today, with Linda and Doug, around the information sharing with schools. This, this has always been a no-brainer. And this is something that the committee caught very, very quickly. And probably was disappointed that it wasn't on the face of the bill to start with. So we were determined to make sure that the committee voice be heard. And when we did put down our amendment, we tried to give as much latitude to the minister and department as possible. And so I commend the department and the minister then for bringing forward a very fulfilling, a very robust and a very thorough amendment uh, with regards to information sharing uh, with schools. And of course, as I've already said, I welcome the fact that they came early. Because when they came early, the department then could ask the, the, the committee what they thought of the amendment. And then when we brought it back to the department, the department were gracious enough to amend uh, their amendment before they inserted it. So we have been able to include not only schools, but also the colleges and other uh, and, and, and nursery provision at the younger age so that it gives a more wholesome and complete uh, package with regards to the care that needs to be provided to young people who fall victim to this heinous, heinous crime. They don't necessarily have to be the direct victim, but if, if a child experiences or feels the aftermath without even realising it, this has a tremendous impact on children, and it will affect their lives for the rest of their lives. And that's something you cannot get over. You cannot get over this, not even if you see it directly, but even if it in, impacts you indirectly. 
you, you cannot get over this. So this is a very important piece, and as Doug has said, rightly said, we need, the ch- we need the child to be surrounded by caring, loving people. And there's nobody I could think better in that role than the teacher. And so it's vital that this amendment be passed today and be included in the bill. Uh, moving on then to Amendment 2, uh, again, I, I repeat what I've said about the Department and the Minister, bringing amendments to the, to the committee quickly and then us being able to assist the Department, because that's what we're there also to do, Mr Speaker, as you rightly uh, know. We're there to assist the Department also. So again, we were very keen to ensure that we give ultimate flexibility to the Minister and the Department going forward. And that's why we wanted it not to be strictly about the orders, but it could be something else other than orders. Because we do realise as a committee, as a House, that there may well be problems down the line with regards to orders. How effective they can be, uh, and and how impactful they are, uh, how hard are they to get. And there may well be different tools out there now and in the future that will lead to better protections for victims and their families. So again, this is a... This is a given. This is, this is something that we need to see and, and should see in the bill. Uh, and then we have the report. Uh, amendment 8 is only leaving out what we inserted, and that's fine because of the new amendment and new clause 1, or new amendment 1, which means is the new clause, uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker. So then we come to what is probably the crux of the matter here today, and that's uh, Clause 27 and the amendments contained within this stage. And can I say that this is the amendment that led to the delay uh, from last week, which, which concerns me greatly. Uh, and it's simply because uh, the, the Minister sent the committee chair a letter on the Sunday and then followed that up with another letter on the Monday. Uh, seeking that the committee, that the, the chairperson not move. Well, the chairperson would not have the power to make that decision without a committee backing, a committee uh, say so. So it's very important that we as a committee would have had the collective sense to meet. So it was, it was hard for me to take last week that the, the minister did not move this uh, bill. She has her own reasons for that. I respect her. Uh, right not to move. But what we know is that the Department, the Department of Finance raised the issue seemingly on the Thursday, but the committee chair only received correspondence on the Sunday. Now that, for every member, might seem a quick enough turnaround. But what the minister then was asking the chair to do within 24 hours or less isn't reasonable. Uh, so you know, we have to be fair with regards to time. We have to be fair to allow a collective body like a committee time to meet, time to assess, and time to come to a collective decision, or not. And that's what we were able to do last week. And we did, after meeting with the minister, we did remove Amendment 15 as it was at that time. But we felt the need to put down the new amendment 13, which caused the commencement of clause 27 within a year, to allow the minister time to do due diligence around this aspect. And can I say, because uh, I've listened to the minister speak in her opening address today uh, around clause 27, and the minister asks us to take her on trust. When did we ever make it in this, com- in this House about trust? It's not about trust. It's about scrutiny. It's about democratic accountability. It has never been about trust. Because trust is a personal issue. It's a personal issue within an MLA. It's a personal issue between an MLA and a minister. This House has never been about trust. It's about scrutiny, and it's about accountability and a democratic process, which we, every single one of us, MLA and Minister, should defend. Should defend. And the Minister has said in her opening remarks around Clause 27, just I'll pick up some of the things. 
She says that there's nothing to prevent abusers using this clause. And the first thing that struck me was there's nothing to prevent abusers getting legal aid. And we see it day in, day out. We are... Yes, yes, I will. Mr Speaker, the, the key point here, and indeed his colleague, the Chairman, raised this issue as to why um, Clause uh, or Amendment 6 is problematic. It is that at the minute there is a barrier to abusers getting legal aid. There is a financial barrier. It may not be the correct barrier, but it is a barrier to people being able to get legal aid. The waiver would, in effect, remove any barrier to an abuser getting legal aid, provided they claimed to be a victim. And so one of two things will happen. Either more abusers will be able to get legal aid in order to do the very thing with which Mr. Um, with Mr. Frew takes issue, which is exert coercive control over their partner, or alternatively, we will have to so specify, so tightly specify what a victim is, that it could exclude those who haven't previously taken legal action against an abusive partner. Neither of those are the desired outcome that any of us in this chamber um, are intending, and that is the difference. And Mr Speaker, that is the reason why the Minister put down the Amendment 3, which we welcomed and which we asked the Minister to do at this previous stage. There was, when, the, when the proposer of the amendment uh, or for the new clause 27, which now stands uh, part of the bill, the, the, the member, and she can speak for herself if she wishes an intervention, but she, she welcomed the minister's engagement at that time to try and make the bill better and safer. And I would support that engagement. But what we have here in this amendment, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, before I move on to the actual wording of the amendment, so, one thing I would say is this. The Minister states that she remains to be convinced that the waiver is the best way to support victims. Well, I can tell you now, Minister, it's not. It's not the best way to support victims, but it is an essential tool going forward that will assist victims. Because here's the rub of this whole issue. And can I say, why is Clause 27 so important, Mr Speaker? When I was on my feet late on that night, and I think I walked out of this building at a quarter past two, I sensed then, I realised then, by the amount of engagement, by the amount of messages, by the amount of phone calls, even at that late hour, that we had completed something quite special. I had more correspondence on that one issue, Clause 27 than I had about the whole bill. Now, I'm not saying that, that I'm not rubbishing the bill. Of course I'm not. There's a lot of good work in this bill. But this is the one issue that the bill did not tackle. This is the one issue that the bill did not tackle, that the people out there are crying out for assistance. Because this is the most, one of the most harmful tools in the abuser's hands. And it struck me last week when we were talking to Sonia McMillan from the Woman's Aid, when she graciously came to see us at short notice, when she said that sometimes the only relief that a victim's, victim gets is when their child turns of a certain age. Now, is that not a horrendous prospect, that you're trying to raise a family and you realize that you're going to be pulled through the courts year in, year out, until your child reaches adulthood. You now have a position where victims who have suffered a horrendous experience are now experiencing horrendous experiences in court of all places, and who then get to the point where they wish their child's life away till they get to adulthood so that they can get respite. That's how damaging this aspect of domestic violence is. And that's why we are determined to ensure that there are safeguards in place for victims in this regard. And it's not about access to justice. We're not trying to prevent people gaining access to justice. We're just trying to level the playing field to allow victims that same right and, allow, and to ensure that their resources, that their savings that they've worked hard for to raise their family isn't dwindled down throughout a duration of 10 years or more. Yes, yes, I will. 
thank the member for taking the intervention. Maybe we can ask the, the minister to, to speak with officials because there, there is a, a bigger piece of work even than legal aid to be done here in relation to the family courts. And I accept that as a department and as a committee we have a heavy legislative workload and probably realistically very little room to do anything else. But I do think that there needs to be preparatory work done now for the next mandate to see what can we do to actually address these issues in reality and totality rather than just trying to address it in, piece, in a piecemeal manner through legal aid and, and other means. We need to address it fully. I thank I think the member, member for that. Uh, we have to remember the Department's position on Clause 27. The Minister opposed Clause 27. The Department opposed Clause 27. And what the, what the Department brought to the Committee after consideration stage was uh, what is now Amendment 7, which is a report on uh, access to justice and allowing the level playing field. So what the Department were trying to do then, after this House had made its determination at, for, at consideration stage, was to reduce that clause from one of action to one of reporting. A two-year report, no less. And that basically means, Mr. Speaker, a delay. A delay that which would have affected victims. And when you look then, whenever the committee said no, and members of the committee said no, we're not happy with that, Minister, for the reasons I've outlined. Then, the, very good in the department. They went away and they looked at it again. And they come back then with another amendment. But it was clear, Mr. Speaker, and let me be fair, that what we have at Amendment 3, the eligibility of victims for civil legal aid, which replaces Clause 27 as it is in the face of the bill, it restricts, it restricts Clause 27 so much, so far that it seems to reduce the risk and everything else that the Minister is concerned about. Because she seems to be quite happy to move Amendment 3, not so happy to move the Commencement Order, Amendment 13. Before I go on to that, it was clear that the Amendment 3 stifles, I believe, stifles what is Clause 27, the will of this House because of the restrictive nature and the safeguards that are placed in it. Now, I know that this is the democracy, so it will be on the floor of this assembly that these things are decided. That's the reason why I think the minister should have moved her bill last week. But it will be this House that will decide what amendments see fit to be in the face of the bill and what's not. But I, can I say that I have grave concerns with Amendment 3. But I'm happy to support, because of the concerns the minister has relayed, and because that it's a step forward. Now, we ha the, the Clause 27 was vague for that reason, so that the Minister and the Department could amend. But there are Amendments 4, 5 and 6, which then go to expanding that clause or that amendment further again. And the Minister's own words uh, at the Committee, she said, if I've confined them, she said that Clause 27, as it sits now, would cost 14 million. Now, when I look at 14 million as a cost, I don't see that as a burden. I see that as the amount of money that's going out of the pockets of victims of domestic violence at this present time. Yes, I will. Yeah. I thank the member for giving way. Of course, that is not actually accurate because the 14 million um, estimate is based on the fact that, first of all, people who currently do not receive legal aid would be in receipt of legal aid. Not all of those people would be victims. And secondly, more cases will be taken because of the availability of legal aid rather than people choosing instead to enter into mediation. So the reason that the 14 million is not going out of the pockets of victims as things stand, um, but is actually additional cost burden that would be created um, by Amendment 27 when it is unamended, it is not money out of the pockets of victims. It relates specifically to additional costs that would be created <clears throat> by 
having the waiver there, both for victims and potentially um, perpetrators, and also the increased volume of legal aid cases taken. I thank the, member for her, or the Minister for her intervention, because that is a very interesting point. So what we need to know now as a House is what is the actual cost at the present time to victims. And the Minister cannot tell us that. But what she can tell us is that the top line is $14 million, as Clause 27 sits as it stands, and if her amendment is successful, that bill is reduced to half a million. Now, it's still a lot. Yes, I will, yeah. Mr Speaker, the member is incorrect. I can give him um, not the cost to individual victims because, of course, in some cases where um, legal aid is not granted, cases are taken pro bono, but I can certainly give him the differential um, in terms of how these costs were anticipated. In the year to the 30th of June 2020, LSA issued 3,036 certificates for individuals to be represented in Article 8 proceedings. According to court service data, there were at least 7,876 parties to Article 8 applications in the same period, so at least 4,840 participants in such proceedings who would not be in receipt of legal aid. The average cost of funding Article 8 proceedings for the LSA is um, around £1,009 at the Family Proceedings Court and £6,900 um, in the higher courts, and roughly 20 per cent to take place in the higher courts. So the costs are well defined. What we cannot do, Mr Speaker, is predict accurately what may be the cost in future due to the fact that this is a demand-led service. I thank the, the Minister her, for her intervention, and I will have to look back at Hansard because my mental arithmetic is not great, Mr. Speaker. But I thank her for that detail, and I think that's the first time that members of this House have received that detail. And we've been looking at this bill for how long? And we've been looking at this amendment clause 27 for how long? I rest my case in that regard. But here, Mr. Speaker, is is a, a golden opportunity. When we were able to put this clause on the face of this bill, the impact that that had on victims' groups was mighty. And they would tell you, if you were to speak to them, that they have been searching for a way, a vehicle, in order to assist their victims on this regard for years. For years. I think it was 20 years since we, they had the last chance in legislation. And that's why it's so important, important that we have a commencement order within. And victims' groups will tell you they've waited so long that they're willing to wait a wee bit longer, a little bit longer, if it means that we could get good, secure law and that the Minister can satisfy herself and the Department through due diligence that what is being expressed with regards to concern about repercussion isn't realised. And I think this amendment, amendment Number 13, the committee amendment with regards to commencement within year, one year of royal assent, affords the minister and the department that opportunity. That opportunity to a whole year to get down to due diligence. Now, there's many times when departments have to use due diligence, and I don't think any of it's taken a year. Yes, I would give way if the minister wishes. Mr Speaker, the point is, has been made already. The issue is not with the amount of time to do the due diligence. The issue is about the outcome of the due diligence. And were we to do the due diligence and find out that this had repercussive costs, it would be in primary legislation that we had to commence these, these um, parts of the bill anyway. And that is the problem. So we could walk out of here having placed something on the face of the bill that could be problematic. Um, and we would only have trust, and I know the member doesn't want to rely on trust, but we would have to trust um, the good grace of the committee to be able to find the time and be able to work through an accelerated passage bill in order to then rescind that in the next year. And given the pressure of legislation, which you will be aware of, Mr Speaker, in the next year, I think that that is taking quite a risk. It is not good practice in terms of legislation to include things within it that you know may need rescinded. That is poor practice. And if we're going to do anything as this Assembly, we need to raise the bar in terms of the quality of the legislation that we bring, as well as the amount. I think the, mem the, mem the Minister for her intervention yet again, but it, it, it betrays a, an aspect of, of her stance throughout this whole bill, and that is that this House and the members within it can bring forward amendments to any bill as they see fit, and this House will attest to that. 
And if this House decides to pass an amendment or a clause, then so be it, and that ministers should obey this House, obey this House, because ultimately this is the place that decisions are taken around legislation. It's not the executive, and it's not a minister. And, and so, on point of order, is it in order for a member to intimate that at any time in these proceedings I have suggested that I would defy the will of this House? Because I do not recall doing so at any stage of these proceedings. To the contrary, I have said I would be bound by the proceedings of this House, even though that may be highly problematic. Okay, that, that's my recollection of the nature of the discourse. Can you stick to the order paper? Yes, yes Mr. Speaker, I, I will. Uh, but on, on, the commence, on the commencement order, which is Amendment 13, and it was Amendment 15 last week, the Minister came to this House seeking preconditions, preconditions before she would move her very own bill. Now, if that's not stifling democratic accountability and debate, I do not know what is. So we move on, and the Minister... And the, Speaker, I asked for a ruling from the Chair on this matter um, on, on, during last week's proceedings. And the ruling was that it was entirely in order for me not to move the, the, that portion of the bill. And I gave my reasons to this House as to why that was the case. It was not to stifle debate or discussion. It was to protect against an unforeseen consequence. It is very unfortunate that this debate is descending and has descended part of the afternoon into a place where it does not need to go to. It is unworthy of the subject of this bill that people are becoming personalised and throwing insults at people. And I have to say, I do not want to hear any more of it. Let us stick to the order paper. There are amendments at the floor for discussion and debate. And yes, people should be robust, make their arguments as, as necessary and as they see fit, but make them respectfully and do not be interpreting for other members what they are thinking or what they are suggesting. So I am saying again today, and I want to make a strict ruling on this, I want members to stick to the amendments, otherwise we are going to have another midnight and no one out there is going to be served in the public who deserves to get a better service from MLAs. So I ask you, Mr Frew, to stick to the group of amendments that you are addressing. Thank you. Mr Speaker, I, I, I will uh, adopt that ruling uh, graciously, 100 per cent. On Amendment number three, the, members, the Minister's amendment, when she sought to come to the committee last week on it, uh, she, she, said, she says that uh, she would give the information. The information was not contained in any of the two letters that she provided the committee. So when we had a good chance then to ask uh, the Minister at the committee, uh, I had asked her for all correspondence between the two departments, the Department of Justice and the Department of Finance. Now, that was last Tuesday. We are yet to see any of that information. Now, this House is a house of scrutiny. It is not a minister or any member can say something, and they can say this clause is bad, but really we need evidence. We need proof. And we have yet, as a committee or individual members, yet to see the correspondence between the Department of Finance. Uh, there were questions posed or questions asked of the Department of Finance, and we have not yet seen or saw or read those questions with regards to the repercussiveness. And this is very important because the Minister says that if Clause 27 stands part of the bill as it is now, that this could cost £400 million to our block grant. Now, I must get this on record, Mr. Speaker. This is a very serious issue. This will blow a hole wide into the budget of, of the Northern Ireland Assembly if this is in fact correct. So it's vitally important. It would have been vitally important for the House, the members of this House, to see those questions posed by the Department of Finance, but yet they're not forthcoming. Um, and again, the Minister did say, and we're grateful for the Minister for outlining that she is seeking legal counsel and she hopes to have that before Christmas. That's good timely advice, and it's of course privileged to herself and, and herself. And that will help with the due diligence with regards to clause 27. And I wish the mem I wish the Minister and the Department well in scrutinising that due diligence and getting through that in a timely fashion, a very quick fashion, uh, for the victims of domestic violence. 
uh, because it is important. This aspect is so important. It's one of the most grievous tools in the hands of a perpetrator that you can actually use a weapon, the weapon of court, uh, to hurt and inflict pain on a victim of domestic violence. Uh, so, the cost, the Minister has been very, very gracious and given us uh, detailed uh, costings today. I will look forward to reading for them back on Hansard, uh, and that's very, very important. Uh, one other aspect I would like to raise, Mr. Speaker, and it's, the Minister raised this at the committee last week, where she did say that she thought that even, even with this bill, which is her own bill, that with her getting the support of the executive to move this bill, the Minister maintains that the executive party should support the bill. I agree with that. But that the minister thought that members should be whipped to support amendments or to vote against amendments, as she seen fit if she was resistant of that. Now, can I say that I see that as a grievous impact on the democratic process? Because I'm here to make a bill better. And that's why I put my name to some clauses. And you know something? Yes, I will. I will give one. Of course. I mean, it really would be helpful if the member is going to persist, despite being asked not to do so, to quote and more, more accurately misquote what I say. I said that it is in executive guidance on the handling of bills that a minister must write to executive colleagues seeking their support to amend a bill to resist an amendment to a bill or other such changes that are of a substantive nature to the bill. And it is for parties in the executive to ensure that there is, and I quote, sufficient support on the floor of the chamber for those decisions of the executive to be carried. I did at no time mention that parties should be whipped in any shape or form. Just before, before Mr. Frew, you continue, I'm actually very tempted to suspend the hearing or the session for as long as I think is appropriate if this continues. So I'm going to say to you that and every member in this House is entitled to have their say on the matter under debate. That's within scope, of course, of this topic. So I want you to return to the scope of the debate without adding any additional narrative around that which reflects on any other member, including the Minister. Um, so, therefore, that is the ruling, and I do not want to have any more cross arguments among two members. We are sitting here for two hours, and six members have spoken thus far. And I think that is not doing service to the matter that we are discussing in hand. And I do not want to have to really repeat that again. So, Mr. Frew, please continue on your contribution. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, with regards to the groupings and the amendments, as I have out outlined, uh, it is very important that this House supports the commencement of Clause 27 in no, whatever shape it falls, whatever shape it comes down, because this House ultimately makes the decision. This House makes the decision as to what Clause 27 looks like, and it is very important, Mr Speaker, that there is a commencement order placed on this, because this is one of the biggest issues that is facing victims out there. and They have been let down in the past so many times. As my colleague Linda Dillon said earlier, it is incumbent on every single MLA, every single member of this House, to pass good, robust legislation that will make a difference to people's lives, not less, no less, the victims of domestic violence and their families. And I plead with the members here today that Amendment 13 is critically important in, in, in providing that assurance, that confidence, and the ability of victims to protect themselves in the court of law. A very scary place for most people. A very scary place indeed. This is at least affording them a level playing field against their perpetrators to ensure that they will have the same protection. And if they have to battle in court from their child being aged four to aged 18, so be it, because at least they will have been afforded that protection with regards to the level playing field and their resources, their much uh, hard-earned 
money, their savings will not be dwindled down to zero, to nit, and at least they will be able to provide a good life for themselves and their family and their children. It is vitally important that we carry on our task to make this bill even better and to make sure, and we all have an influence. I would support the right for any MLA in this House to bring forward amendments that we could then scrutinise and we could then debate. And we all, as individual MLAs, have good ideas. We're all on the ground. We all see what happens. We all see what happens to our constituents. We all see what happens to victims. We should be able to input into that decision-making process. We should be able to engage in debate, robust as it may be, in order to make this bill better. And I commend uh, the Amendment then 13 to this House. Uh, I support Amendment 1, the, amend the Minister's Amendment. I support Amendment 2, uh, which replaces uh, Clause 26 as it stands part of the bill. And I will support Amendment 20, sorry, Clause 27 in whatever guise it takes, because I believe that's a win. And it's a win not for members or political parties or ministers of this House, but it's a win for the victims out there who have been grievously trying to change this for so long, and here they are within a whiff of success. And let's give them that success. Let's give them something. Let's give them the assurance that they yearn for, those people who have suffered grievously over the years. I have met them. A lot of the members here have met them. This is what this is all about. This group of amendments is all about Clause 27, most of it anyway. And I plead with this House, please support Clause 27. Please support the commencement order. And let's get it done. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. Emma Rogan. Um, not to rehearse all that's already um, been said this evening, um, I'm going to speak to support um, Amendment 1. Um, it was probably one of the most simplest of amendments that we looked at, and we welcome um, the Minister's Amendment on Operation Encompass. Our party has been raising the importance of Operation Encompass from the very beginning of this bill's legislative process. My colleague, Linda Dillon, I think raised the issue at every single committee meeting that we had. Um, Linda insisted that it was very, very simple, but it was an effective tool that the PSNI could use when dealing with a domestic abuse incident where a child has been involved. Operation Encompass is an information sharing mechanism which allows the police to communicate with designated persons in a school um, to inform them of any incidences of domestic abuse which involves a pupil at that school. Domestic abuse has been identified as an adverse childhood experience and can lead to emotional, physical and psychological harm. Operation Encompass or the information sharing with schools aims to mitigate this harm by enabling immediate support and helping it make a child's day better with something very, very simple like asking them, are you okay this morning? Key to this is providing a secure and sympathetic environment to children. The Chief Constable himself raised Operation Encompass when he gave it oral, oral evidence to the committee in February, where he advised he wanted to see it brought to fruition here. A pilot within my own constituency of South Down on the, the Operation Encompass is due to take place shortly. This has the potential to drastically improve the lives of many children across all schools. The Assembly approved the Committee's amendment in the consideration stage, but following discussions with the Department's officials, it became apparent that further work was needed and it was done and that the amendment could be strengthened. And I believe Amendment 1 today that this, this is what it does. The officials presented an overview of the amendment to the Justice Committee and following discuss discussions, the committee recommended expand on Amendment 1 to include preschools within its remit. It is to the Department's credit that they move swiftly and efficiently and have ensured the preschools are now included within the Amendment 1 that is in front of us today, and I support Amendment 1. Thank you. And I call Cara Hunter. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for being here today. Um, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak also uh, in support of an important piece of legislation. I would like to focus my remarks in particular uh, to Amendment 1, of which my party colleagues and I are fully supportive as it regards uh, information sharing with schools. The impact which domestic abuse and violence in the home has on children and young people cannot be underestimated. 
As Bernardo's and the NSPCC have stated in their very helpful briefing uh, ahead of this stage of the debate today, children are the hidden victims of domestic abuse. Experiencing domestic abuse in the home is considered an adverse childhood experience. Even if a child does not necessarily witness the abuse itself, growing up in a home where domestic abuse is happening impacts a child's development and mental health in both the short and long term. The raised voices, the unspoken hostility and tension. Many children exposed will develop signs of psychological distress and can be affected in all arenas of, of development, emotional, social and cognitive. Being aware of the symptoms and the developmental impact is a crucial stage to raise here in the Assembly today, as I feel Amendment 1 takes a very key and positive step in protecting children by liaising with their teachers to give the full picture of what is really going on at home. I welcome the Amendment 1 brought forward today, and I would like to thank Sinead Bradley, my colleague and our Justice Spokesperson, for raising the issue of including preschools and the Committee for including them in today's consideration. While this legislation and its implementation would be welcomed at any time, in a way it seems even more pressing than ever that we act now, given what we have heard in the recent months with the rise in domestic abuse, as people have had to spend far more time in their homes as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions. In its report, Not Just Collateral Damage, Bernardo states that the long-term impacts of domestic abuse include the potential of youth offending, risk of harmful sexual behaviour, future cycles of abuse and, of course, a severe impact on mental health. As a passionate advocate for better mental health care and, more importantly, early intervention, in meeting after meeting, which I have with mental health groups and charities, it's evident that what we see all too often is that nothing can compensate or substitute for a secure and loving childhood, free from abuse and fear. Mr Speaker, as a society and as elected representatives, we have a responsibility to do all that we can to protect the vulnerable in our society. Children and young people growing up in homes which experience domestic abuse are, of course, amongst the most vulnerable of all. I hope that this legislation here today will go at least some way to allow us to do more to protect children and families who suffer from domestic abuse in their homes every day. Thank you. And I call Gemma Dolan. Um, I rise to speak in the first instance in support of Amendment 2, which relates to Clause 26 and places a responsibility on the Justice Minister to make provisions for domestic abuse protection orders and notices within 24 months of commencement, aimed at protecting and supporting victims of domestic abuse. Clearly, the whole bill is about protecting and supporting the victim in one way or another, and domestic abuse protection orders and notices are one way of doing that. I must commend the Department for the facilitation of the Committee's concerns when it comes to Clause 26. The Minister intends to bring forward detailed primary legislation to provide for domestic abuse protection orders and notices, and therefore rejected the Committee amendment at consideration stage, but thankfully the Department has brought forward a substantial amendment which we will be supporting. One particular element of the amendment that I am supportive of is that the regulations must include provision to the effect that steps and measures are for protecting persons who are at least 16 years of age and are to apply in relation to perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of abusive behaviour who are at least 18 years of age. This was raised with the NSPCC, who were keen to ensure that under 18s are not drawn into the criminal justice system for breach of an order and wish to see a more child centred approach being taken where the perpetrator is a child that is under the age of 18. Where a young person is experiencing abuse and the child is engaged in harmful behaviours, the response should be child-centred, seek to prevent further harm and pr promote rehabilitation in order to challenge and change this harmful behaviour. It is of vital importance, however, that we do not wait until a young person reaches this point before interventions are needed. As I and others have made the point in this chamber already, the operation of this bill needs to be accompanied by education for our children and young people on healthy and positive relationships. The provision in relation to complying with the extent of the order that could capture behaviour carried out elsewhere, but which must have a base back in the north, has also been expanded upon. Further revisions have been made to strengthen the provisions and make it explicit that requirements, including restrictions or prohibitions for notices and orders applied to children of or living with those for whom protection, notices and orders are made. I am also speaking in favour of Amendment 7, which relates to a new Clause 27A. 
This puts an obligation on the Department of Justice to lay a report before the Assembly no more than 24 months after the bill comes into play, setting out proposals for reducing financial costs to be incurred by a victim of domestic abuse, or preventing so far as reasonably possible proceedings from being initi initiated unduly against a victim by a perpetrator by virtue of having access to funded services. Domestic abuse does not discriminate in terms of income, background or perceived social standing. However, this amendment will be beneficial to the low-paid, low-income victims. There are many victims who, at present, may not qualify for legal aid because they are just above the current threshold, but who cannot afford legal representation themselves, the working poor. Those who are earning just above the breadline, but still face many financial struggles. It's important that we put in place adequate support for these people, and I would like to see this issue addressed as part of the Clause 27A review. Access to justice is incredibly important for everybody who needs to obtain it. As I said at consideration stage, the success of legislation depends on its effective implementation, and therefore I call on the Department to make it a priority to action their obligations outlined in these amendments. Thank you, and I call Gordon Dunn. Mr. Speaker, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak today on the further consideration stage of this domestic abuse bill. There has been a considerable amount of work done to allow us to get to this advanced stage, and I very much welcome the significant steps forward that have been made on such an important piece of work. We share the regret as expressed by the victims' support groups that we did not reach this stage last week in the House. It is important, though that we get this legislation right, and I am glad today that this allows us to, get, to advance this important piece of legislation with the way forward. <clears throat> we all, I believe, share the same aim of strengthening our domestic abuse legislation to better reflect how widespread this appalling abuse can be right across Northern Ireland, better supporting victims of domestic abuse and getting more offenders brought to justice. I believe that is a desire, and that was certainly reflected during the consideration stage in November from right across this House. <clears throat> we must remain committed and focused on ensuring the legislation fully covers all the potential forms of this abuse and that it can be dealt with effectively and efficiently. And I believe this bill rightly recognises that domestic abuse today can be so much more than physical abuse. <clears throat> Excuse me. The bill also introduces important and very timely measures to support children who are so often innocently caught up in domestic abuse situations. Children can sometimes be the forgotten victims of domestic abuse and can be used and abused so tragically in unfortunate situations, sometimes which is sadly becoming an ever and growing problem in society. Even since the consideration stage of this bill, we heard the shocking figures released from the PSNI to the BBC on the 26th of November 20 that six women in Northern Ireland have been murdered since 2015, despite previously reporting their violent partners to the police. This is very alarming development, and the statistic, along with the revelation that domestic abuse now accounts for 19.1 per cent of all crime recorded by the PSNI, is further recognition if it was ever required of the need for to strengthen our domestic abuse laws. It also very much reinforces the need for action, which was so clearly and passionately presented through our committee evidence sessions, with many stakeholders, including victims and victim groups, victim support groups, who are so often at the cool face in tackling this most cruel and horrific form of abuse. I believe Amendment 1, which will widen out the information sharing with schools, including preschool settings, is a positive step forward and one which should help to protect children who may have so inadvertently become victims of domestic abuse. Education providers now can be much more than just a formal school arrangement, and I believe the widened approach within Amendment 1 allows a level of flexibility to include a non-school body which provides education or training of any kind, including within preschool and college settings. <coughs> Excuse me. Education settings can play a valuable role in supporting children and young people through what can be very difficult days. However, this information sharing would be, have to be ca carried out in a very sensitive and professional way to ensure that ch 
the child is not made to feel more vulnerable, and this should help schools better understand individual circumstances and needs of a family who may be experiencing some form of domestic abuse. <coughs> Excuse me. The introduction of protection measures to protect the person from abusive behaviour, as outlined in Amendment 2, will be another positive step forward, and I believe that the this is required is a required desire from the PSNI to get progress on these delivered. I think that the desire for progress was also reflected during the consideration stage with various stakeholders and many felt there was a need to strengthen protective measures for abuse victims beyond non molestation orders, which many believe to, <coughs> do not go far enough to protect vulnerable victims. I also welcome the public consultation, which was launched earlier this month by the Minister, to enhance legal protections for domestic abuse victims and ensure short-term protection from all forms of domestic abuse. There has been a considerable amount of debate around the costs and potential legal costs around legal aid. I do welcome the commitment contained within Amendment 7 of a report around the availability and affordability of legal aid. Unfortunately, many victims of domestic abuse are unable to access legal aid. This can sometimes be as a result of complex financial arrangements with their partner or former partner, which can often deny the victim the much-needed support through the very difficult legal proceedings. This can sometimes result in the perpetrator getting better support than the victim, which is wrong and needs to be addressed. I welcome the long-awaited progress to date on such an important issue, and I really do trust that we will continue to see further progress through the House as we seek to further support victims of domestic abuse, so many of whom sadly continue to suffer in silence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, thank you. And I call, before I call Nicola Brogan, I just want to make the point that uh, as this is Nicola Brogan's first opportunity to speak as a private member, I would remind the House that it is a convention that a maiden speech is made without interruption, but I would advise that if you choose to express views that might provoke an interruption, however we, however we will determine that, you are likely to for, for, forfeit this protection. So I call on uh, Nicola Brogan, and can I say you are very welcome to the Chamber. Thank you. Uh, Gary Margaret, can you hear um, Ms. Owner and Mordew, a Lord Slevin Shaw and you, it is an honour for me to speak here today as a representative of West Tyrone. I'd like to first of all take this opportunity to pay tribute to my predecessor, Ms. Catherine Kelly. Catherine worked tirelessly for the people of West Tyrone. As an MLA, she stood up for the rights of children and young people throughout the North, and she campaigned for an overall fairer society. As an activist in West Tyrone, Catherine worked incredibly hard for the local community. Throughout her time as MLA, she was at the fore, helping the most vulnerable in our society. So I would like to thank her for all of her hard work and wish her the very best in the future. As one of three Sinn Féin MLAs in West Rhone, I am grateful to have the support and guidance of both Declan McAleer and Malisha McHugh, alongside our MP Orla Begley. I look forward to working closely with them, our Sinn Féin Council team and all elected representatives in our constituency and indeed throughout Ireland. I am a proud Tyrone woman and I am proud to represent the brilliant and diverse community of West Rhone. I will do all that I can to ensure that their voice is heard in this assembly. My focus in the time ahead will be working for the completion of the Struhl Educational Campus in Oma. It is an executive flagship project which will help regenerate Oma Town and will bring huge educational benefits for our young people. I welcome the fact that Arvali School and Resource Centre is already on site as part of the first phase and I look forward to having Oma High School, Oma CBS, the Academy, the Sacred Heart College and the school that I attended, Loretto Grammar, on site soon. I also want to focus my efforts on ensuring that rural schools in West Tyrone are kept high on the agenda and are properly supported. Um, I will pay particular attention to those children within our education system with special educational needs. This is a matter that is close to my heart, and I think we can do more to support these children, their parents, teachers, classroom assistants and coordinators to ensure that no child is left behind and that they are all given equal learning opportunities. As an MLA for West Throne, I will represent all of the citizens in this area and I will champion the issues which will improve the lives of my constituents. 
I will work alongside all elect representatives to ensure the delivery of the A5 upgrade and the rollout of adequate broadband provision. Of course, however, the enormous cloud of Brexit hangs over all politics on this island and these islands. Already in my own constituency, there is a palpable sense of apprehension. Brexit was imposed on us against our democratically expressed wishes. Brexit will challenge everyone in this assembly in the time ahead. The narrow, inward-facing agenda of the right-wing English Brexiteers offers nothing to our people. As an Irish Republican, I am committed to a very different society, an inclusive, modern and outward-looking Ireland that puts our workers and our families first and is built on equality and respect for every one of our citizens, a society that celebrates and is enriched by its growing diversity. Society is changing and politics is changing. I want to be part of that agenda for change for the people of Throne and for the people of Ireland. As the MLA for West Throne and as a Sinn Féin activist, I will play a full and enthusiastic part in building a new, inclusive, tolerant and united Ireland. Turning now to the very important issue of the domestic abuse bill, as a Sinn Féin spokesperson for children and young people, I urge members to support um, amendment number one. Domestic abuse incidents have a devastating effect on the lives of our young people. I believe this amendment demonstrates the importance of raising awareness of domestic abuse within schools and the educational settings. Um, none of us truly know what goes on behind closed doors. We cannot take for granted that all children have loving and caring homes. This amendment should act as a guide for staff within the school setting to be mindful of that. Domestic abuse is recognised as an adverse childhood experience, and we know that ACEs can have a hugely detrimental impact on a child, both during childhood and later in life. The impact of domestic abuse often follows children and young people into their school setting, where of course they spend so much time. This is why Amendment 1 is of such vital importance. It is intended to provide a smooth process to allow for the rapid exchange of information to a designated school staff member which will help teachers and other school staff to provide a more compassionate and caring environment for those children who most need it. It will allow them to make positive interventions to help improve, to help improve a child's welfare and to help mitigate the wider effects of abuse on these children. It is of concern to me that this amendment is only relevant to people in school um, up to the age of 18. Many of our young people with special educational needs stay in school until the age of 19. I hope that the PSNI will work closely with schools to fully support our young people with special educational needs. Um, it is important to start a conversation with our young people to teach them what a healthy relationship looks like, to break the pattern of domestic abuse when witnessed in the home. The education setting should work closely with groups such as Women's Aid, Men of, Men's Advisory Project, NICI and the NSPCC. In conclusion, can I ask members to support this amendment? Thank you, Cora Maggot. And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too am glad that we are here today at further consideration stage. And from the outset, I want to give a bit of a pre warning. This will not be a short speech. I would firstly like to acknowledge and commend the Department for their proposed changes to the committee amendment made at consideration stage in dealing with the issue of Operation Encompass, encapsulated in Amendments 1 and 8. At consideration stage, I, alongside other members, had mentioned that we do need to look at the inclusion of other educational settings where children and young people attend, such as preschools and nurseries. And I'm glad that after raising this at committee with the department, that this minister is bringing forward the relevant provisions today. To proceed with the legislative gap in Operation Encompass between children who attend primary school, which is within the big school or campus, and those who attend nursery or preschool away from it would have been a mistake. Not all preschools are attached to primary or post-primary school, as all of us will know, and there shouldn't be an arbitrary distinction of where a call could be made by the PSNI for the sake of children's well-being after an incident. Early years, as we know, is a crucial developmental time for children, and I welcome the necessary detail included in one. With regard to Amendment 2, I did raise this at committee, um, and I'm still a wee bit uneasy regarding the approach taken around age limits. I recognise the view and position of the NSPCC and the Children's Commissioner in relation to injunctions against perpetrators or alleged perpetrators under 18 years of age, and I wholeheartedly agree that we should not be criminalising young people. But could the amendment leave victims who have suffered abuse perpetrated by someone of that age with no recourse to a protective order that would prevent contact from a perpetrator that is 18 years old or older? It begs the question. Is there an intention to provide these victims with a different kind of protection? 
and if so, what does this look like? I am speaking here with reference to subsection 5b, 1 and 2. It is my understanding that this wording means that a 16-year-old victim would not be able to access a protective order against their 17-year-old abuser. So, this means that a victim of abuse can get protection against a perpetrator that is 18 years old but not 17 years old, or perhaps the protection is available to them will be different. So I simply ask the question for future consideration, why should this be the case? Does this distinction exist in the case of, say, non-molestation orders or any other form of injunction currently available? And if not, is there a particular reason why? Let me reiterate, I fully understand the views of Nikki and I agree that the criminal justice system should not be the first port of call for children and young people. I fully support looking at more effective, holistic approaches, but we cannot leave victims without protection. Those are two very different things. A protective injunction against an alleged perpetrator of domestic abuse is not simply a case of criminalising a young person, and the measures and mechanisms that could be developed can be done so in a way that prevents criminalisation entirely but to leave the gap in protection is a concern. As the Department ably demonstrated in their rationale for lowering the age of parental responsibility exclusion, a person aged 16 or 17 can be prosecuted for domestic abuse. They can join the armed forces, they can get married with parental consent, and I would also point that they can work full-time, leave their family home if they wish. Why a person aged 16 or 17 who can do all of these things, it must be stressed, be prosecuted for domestic abuse via this bill as it stands, cannot be subject to a protective injunction to prevent them from abusing their victim is baffling. So I would like to ask the Minister to outline, consequently, how those victims will be protected, especially in the case of a young couple. So I would appreciate the Minister outlining what protections would still exist in her summing up on this group and what the Department will do going forward to develop effective, holistic approaches for addressing abusive behaviour amongst our children and young people, and whether they will commit to working with children's organisations to ensure that the best possible system is in place. Moving on with regard to victims and survivors' access to legal aid, I would like to first speak to Amendment 7, then move on to Amendment 3, and the amendments listed in my name and Sinead Bradley's, and I am glad that she too saw the merit in not excluding the lower courts. Mr Speaker, I'd like to place on record the origins of Amendment 7 and the new proposed 27A. Following the consideration stage of the bill and the addition of now Clause 27 that was opposed solely by the Minister and her party, the Department's initial response was to ignore the will of the House and attempt to change the entire purpose of Clause 27, from giving victims access to legal aid to simply producing a report on victims' access to legal aid. As myself and other members of the Committee made clear to officials, this was not what the Assembly voted for at the consideration stage of the Bill, and the Department's proposal appeared to fly in the face of the Assembly's rules on admissibility at further consideration stage. I and other members of the committee welcome the suggestion of a report to investigate and bring forward possible solutions to the issue of victims and survivors of abuse being dragged through the courts and having their finances drained by their former perpetrator. However, a report would be of little use, bring little comfort to those that would encounter, su encounter such horrible circumstances between now and when any such proposals are fully implemented. So I was relieved when the Department eventually departed from their initial position in relation to Clause 27, which I always stated was not a fully comprehensive solution, but something that could make a real difference until such time as more detailed measures came into place. That is the origin of Amendment 7, the proposed new Clause 27A, and it was initially drafted by the Department to prevent 27 from coming into force to prevent victims and survivors from getting access to the legal aid waiver and to kick the can down the road. Let that be known to the House. I fully welcome the provision in this bill to conduct a review into the availability of legal aid for victims of abuse, but not as an alternative to Clause 27. It is not an either-or situation, nor should it be. A report about the issue in a few years' time would never have sufficed compared to a limited measure that actually deals with the issue. There is also another very important point to make about Amendment 7 and the new proposed Clause 27A, which is already apparent from the debate and came to light at the session of the Justice Committee held on the 1st of December. 
That is the convenient role that Amendment 7 plays for the Minister and her Department in their attempts to gloss over the deficiencies of Amendment 3. Amendment 7 and new Clause 27A is the crutch that officials have lent on and it is one that has been relied on today in attempts to mask the problems with Amendment 3. The argument put forward is that if vic victims are missing out, that it will be captured in the report and the Department will bring forward proposals to fix that. But, Mr Speaker, Amendment 7 does not and cannot in any way justify the shortcomings of Amendment 3. It is not a credible position to claim that you know something is not going to work for victims, but you'll keep an eye on it for a year after it comes into effect, then suggest some solutions. And I do not need to remind the House that we have gone through an election by then and entered a new mandate. So I would urge the House first and foremost to reject the idea that Amendment 3 as drafted is palatable or acceptable in spite of its shortcomings because of Amendment 7. That is not a credible position and in fact I believe it is an insult to the very people who will not be able to access the waiver if Amendment 3 as drafted is made. Yes, I support new Clause 27A. Yes, this is exactly the kind of provision we need to critically assess the operation of Clause 27 and how victims can be protected further anyway. Yes, this work needs to commence as a matter of urgency. Ideally, we shouldn't have to legislate for this. It should already be being done. I will. Um, as the member is well aware, I also agree that we don't have to legislate for this because, of course, the point that I made um, in the consideration stage was that we should do this by regulation. And it is all well and good um, for members to say what should already be being done, but when we know that it is not happening, um, the, the role uh, that I have as Minister um, over the last number of months is to ensure that it happens in future because I cannot rewrite history. So this could have been done by regulation. It would have been a simpler, faster process. And and it would have allowed a more agile response when we saw the uptake um, of any changes that were made. But the, the House has made its choice that we want to legislate for this in primary legislation. I accept that. So what we are now trying to do is ensure that there is sufficient flexibility in order that we are able to respond to new gaps which may be there. It is not correct to say that we expect that uh, number three will not, Amendment 3 um, is deficient. But we know that these things in test and trial and error in the courts will often find that there are gaps or loopholes, and it is those for which we wish to be able to report and bring forward subsequent corrections. Thank the Minister for her intervention, and I do appreciate that uh, in responding to gaps, and we must plug them, so that's why I am supporting 27A. None of this is an excuse for the problematic approach evident in Amendment 3. So before I go on to discuss Amendment 3 in detail and address then my own amendments, I would like to remind members that Clause 27 is about helping victims and survivors of abuse in family proceedings, and it is confined to the orders listed in Article 8 of the Children Northern Ireland Order, namely Child Contact Orders, Occupation Orders, Prohibited Steps Orders, and Specific Issue Orders only. This must be reiterated as, for some reason, it keeps causing some confusion. I also feel it is also important to state again that Clause 27 is about victims and survivors. It is about helping them financially. It is about helping those working people, single parents with children, who are pushed into poverty because of legal fees. This is what Clause 27 is about, and it should not be forgotten in this debate. Victims and survivors should be front and centre when members come to decide how they will vote on these amendments. And whilst I appreciate that the Minister and others are concerned with costs and risks, as am I, there is a balance to be struck between these issues and how we best support victims. So I do not agree with the approach that has been taken in Amendment 3. The proposed new Clause 27 is all about limiting costs and risk to the detriment of the very people that the Bill seeks to help. I will. If uh, her amendments don't pass, there is in reality a, a piece of legislation which says you can't get justice uh, if you can afford it. I thank the member for his intervention, and I do think that this is again something that we need to look at. And it, 
uh, Shania Bradley had, had spoken at it at length at committee about the unfairness that the system is, that there's those who can afford justice and those who can't. And then these are the people that we're trying to encapsulate with this amendment in terms of legal aid on child contact, those who are just over the line but can't get access to legal aid. I will. Would the member accept that the characterisation um, by Mr. Carl um, of justice being the case that you can afford, you can access it only when you afford it, stands at odds with actually what other members have said in relation to the issue of how high our legal aid bill is when compared to other jurisdictions? Think, and for that reason, I think, sorry, Minister, I think that you're straying into a debate which is unnecessary. The member made a comment and. Whatever about the veracity of it or the substance of it, for that matter, it doesn't require an answer from yourself at this moment in time. So, Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, firstly, as firstly, as Amendment Three as it stands, it will create an arbitrary distinction between victims simply because they are either taking a case or defending one. The minister's amendment will mean that only victims that are the respondent to proceedings will be granted access to legal aid through the waiver of the financial eligibility limit. Those who have to appeal decisions or initiate proceedings in order to protect themselves and their children will not have access to this waiver. In my view, that is unfair and unnecessary. When I asked officials on the 1st of December to confirm whether, under the Minister's proposed amendment, the waiver would only assist a victims who are being taken to court by the perpetrator, and it would not help victims that need to take a case against their former abuser, even on appeal, they confirmed that this indeed was the case. The Department and the Minister may think that it is acceptable to make a distinction in terms of access to legal aid through the waiver between a victim that is defending a case and a victim that has to initiate proceedings in order to protect themselves and their children. I do not. All victims and survivors of domestic abuse should be able to access the financial eligibility waiver for the purposes listed above. That was the purpose of Clause 27, and there should be no such distinction between victims simply because they are taking or defending a case. Amendment 3, as drafted, means that some of the very people that Clause 27 would help no longer benefit. I am speaking here of the single mum who requires an occupation order to prevent her abusive partner from returning to the home, or the victim or survivor who needs to appeal a child contact decision to prevent further abuse by the perpetrator. All these people would miss out under the Minister's Amendment 3 and new Clause 27 as drafted, and that's simply not good enough. As a consequence of, or linked to, the condition that the victim must only be a respondent to proceedings, the Minister's Amendment also includes a stipulation that legal aid will only be granted for representation, and it will not be granted to a victim for advice and assistance from a solicitor. According to officials, this would not be required if the client were only a respondent to the proceedings, but it was unclear if advice and assistance actually covered legal costs for attempted mediation between parties or even pre-proceedings. I will. I can clarify that point, Mr Speaker. Um, advice and assistance does not extend to mediation. Um, it does not extend, and the, the clause to which the member refers would not extend to mediation. Furthermore, um, all of the advice and assistance that a person would require that would be covered by the waiver in, is included um, with advice and assistance. So this essentially double counts advice and assistance, both as part of the waiver and then as a separate clause. I thank the Minister for her intervention. I am still unclear about the duplication, so we are just putting it on the face of the bill as it was in, in Clause 27. But the absence of the provision for advice and assistance is yet another attempt to re restrict the scope of 27 and reduce costs, with the effect that the victims and survivors of abuse will see less and less benefit from the waiver, or indeed its actual uptake, which has already been affected by the changes previously made to legal aid. And I do not agree with this approach. The other major problem with the met I will give way. I thank the member for giving way. It is correct to say that it is a cost-saving measure. It is not correct to say that it would have any impact on victims because, as I have already stated now, I think three times during the debate, um, the issue of advice and assistance is already covered in the waiver and therefore victims would receive nothing in addition um, to what they would receive under the waiver, but solicitors may be paid a second time for providing the same basic advice and assistance. I thank the Minister for her intervention. I'm unsure about the 
solicitors being paid for a second time, surely that's something that would have to come from the legal services agency um, and would need to be looked at through their own processes to make sure that that didn't happen. The other major problem with Amendment 3 is the issue of limiting the waiver to the lower courts. And this will mean that the most vulnerable victims and those who have suffered through multiple cases of long, drawn-out proceedings, the very people that Clause 27 speaks to and tries to help, will lose out. This was again confirmed by departmental officials on the 1st of December, when I asked them whether the waiver would no longer apply to any case in the higher courts. Even when a case has started in the lower courts, and the victim could be granted legal aid through the waiver, this would effectively be taken away from them if their case was referred upwards. According to officials, and I quote, when the case is referred from the, from the Family Proceedings Centre to the Family Care Centre or to the High Court, the waiver would no longer apply. That is according to the Minister's amendment. Mr Speaker, cases that are referred to the Family Care Centre or to the High Court are the very cases that involve the most vulnerable victims and survivors of abuse. Cases are often referred to because a victim would be struggling with their mental health, for example, or because what the courts term an implacable hostility between partners or the two parties involved. Officials confirm this, that with regard to such complex cases, move to the higher courts that involve serious allegations of offences or where a party to the proceedings may be suffering from serious mental health issues, the waiver would not apply. This leaves most vulnerable without access to the waiver, again, the very people that Clause 27 seeks to help and is totally wrong in my view. We cannot leave these people behind. They are victims and survivors of abuse with most complex needs and they should have access to the financial support that is available through the waiver. When I pressed the department on this point, their response was, and again I quote, we would need to look at what other protections might apply in respect of the rep hire and the ongoing proceedings. But the principle would be that the person is not less favourably treated when the proceedings transfer to the higher courts than they are under the existing scheme. Mr Speaker, needing to look at what other protections might apply is not good enough for members here at further consideration stage of the bill, nor is it going to help victims when this bill and these provisions come into effect. Without anything in the Minister's amendment to state what other protections will apply, the only conclusion that we can reach at this stage is that victims will be less favourably treated when the proceedings transfer to the higher courts. Yet another reason why Amendment 3, as drafted, falls short. So to, to address my amendments, in short, they solve the problems that I have outlined with Amendment 3 and the Minister's proposed new Clause 27. They are victim-focused, victim-centred, a, a way of looking at this issue, and also balances the concerns around costs and other risks. They are all also interlinked, and I hope members read them as such. Amendment 4 is linked to Amendment 6 and returns the scope of the waiver to cover the costs of legal advice and assistance for the victim, not only attempt in attempted pre-proceedings, but if Amendment 6 were made, it would mean that the victims and survivors can access the necessary financial support to get the help that they need from legal professionals prior to initiating proceedings. As any solicitor will tell you, advice and assistance are key in complex law cases, particularly those that um, involve Article 8 orders. And members, people just don't go and take child orders without serious consideration. It's a really big deal and needs a lot of advice and assistance to get them there. Victims and survivors of abuse should have recourse to financial support for this and should not be excluded from this waiver. Amendment 5 removes the restriction of the waiver to the lower courts, thereby granting victims access to legal aid in the higher courts. For all the reasons that I have just outlined, this is essential to ensure that the most vulnerable people do not miss out. And I would like to say again that the Family Care Centre is treated as a higher court. I do not accept the argument that widening the scope to the higher courts is not needed because a different financial eligibility test applies. There will still be victims and survivors that will miss out. Nor do I accept the assertion that the Director's current discretionary powers, which again I highlighted earlier on and had asked the Department for examples of their use, to be told that they have never been used and might provide a solution. Therefore, we do not need to widen the scope to the higher courts. 
I will. Clarify, Mr. Speaker, um, the advice that was given was actually that they had never been used in these circumstances. So that is a, an important distinction. And the purpose um, of, of the advice and guidance um, in terms of what we would bring back to committee um, in terms of providing guidance to um, the LSA is in order to allow those to be used in these circumstances. Thank the Minister for intervention and I do apologise. Um, these are the circumstances in which we are discussing and they have been clarified that they have not been used in these circumstances, but I do apologise for the record to put that on. In fact, this discretionary power and Clause 27 are not mutually exclusive. So the House can approve Amendment 5 and the Department can still work with Legal Services Agency to develop a better system to support victims using the discretionary powers, if that's required. Without Amendment 5, we have no baseline from which to work. No safeguard, no guarantee that people won't be disadvantaged when their cases move to the higher courts. Amendment 6 effectively removes the condition that the victim has to be a respondent in the proceedings. And as I've explained, this restriction is inherently flawed from the perspective of those victims that need to seek orders in order to protect themselves and their children. It is illogical and unfair to suggest that, for example, the same victim of survivor would be granted access to legal aid only if a case was taken by their former abuser and not if they needed to appeal a decision that allowed that same perpetrator an opportunity to further the abuse. I do not accept the argument that this condition effectively deals with the issue of fraud or perpetrators posing as victims in order to get access to legal aid through the waiver and initiate proceedings. If someone is determined to misuse the waiver, they will misuse it. Limiting its scope to clients that are only respondents in proceedings will not prevent that. If a perpetrator was determined to misuse the system, they could also do it by claiming to be a victim when defending a case in line with the Minister's amendment. The Minister's proposed solution to stop perpetrators claiming to be victims does not solve anything in that regard. I will. Thank the Member for her generosity in giving way. The point that we are trying to stop um, with this is people initiating cases in order to maintain unwanted contact with a former partner. So an abusive partner repeatedly going to court to initiate legal action against a partner um, who no longer wants that contact. So the issue of someone pr pretending to be a victim to gain a waiver to defend an action doesn't actually fulfil that criteria and doesn't actually have any relevance to this discussion. The purpose of limiting, limiting it to those who are respondents ensures that it is only those who are brought to court unwillingly, repeatedly by a former partner, would have access um, to the, the waiver and that we wouldn't essentially be opening the gate to fund um, abusers who then might use legal aid to bring more cases against their estranged partners. Thank the Minister for intervention. But it do you think that people are going to be taking those cases anyway um, as a form of abuse? That happens now and it will continue to happen in the future. What this is is to level the playing field when it comes to financial eligibility for legal aid. So the Minister's proposed solution to stop perpetrators claiming to be victims does not solve anything in that regard. It just limits the opportunities for it to occur and in doing so limits victims' ability to access legal aid when they need it. The way to deal with the risk of perpetrators abusing the legal aid waiver is not to limit the scope according to which, the court, which court the case is heard in or whether the client is a respondent or has initiated proceedings. These risks can effectively be managed through careful consideration of how a client's eligibility is assessed, what is applicable information, and that is for the department to provide, as outlined in the Minister's amendment. If the, I will. Thank the member for giving way, and you have been very generous with your time. One of the concerns I raised is this: this is exactly where it goes to the heart of that. If we limit who a victim is so tightly, and we know that's what's going to happen, you know that with the best will in the world, we know that's what's going to happen. Who a, who a victim is is going to be limited to either where there's a conviction or where you're almost in that circumstance. We're actually creating a bigger barrier for victims. And I, I did speak with, with the organisations who represent these people, and I asked them, how can we most, because we're we're, this is not perfect, I accept it's not perfect, which is why 27A is so important. So how can we help the, the largest number of victims? How can we give the most help to victims out there? And is it by limiting who a victim is, or by limiting to respondents, because that's what, where the initial intention around this, this issue was within the committee. And they did say, do not limit 
who is a victim, because that is where you would potentially limit the amount of people that can access this. Thank the member for um, her intervention. And Mr. Speaker, I did tell you that this would be a long speech. But in terms of addressing Ms. Dillon's point, the Minister's amendment creates an arbitrary small group of potential victims. And we see that through the financial details that have come forward. And it is up to the department to ensure that their own guidance and checks are in place. And I agree with the argument put forward by officials that these detailed eligibility proposals do not belong in primary legislation. They should be developed in close consultation with those in the sector and victims and survivors themselves. That is the best way to prevent the misuse of the waiver. So if the department spent time consulting the PSNI, PPS, Public Prosecution Unit, social workers, solicitors, education authorities, health professionals, support organisations and victim survivors, they would be able to develop the necessary guidance and processes that the Legal Services Agency need to ensure the swift, sensitive approval of valid applications and the effective prevention of the abuse of the waiver. That is already provided for in Amendment 3 and New Clause 27, which states under subsection 3, Guidance under Section 3 of the Legal Aid and Coroner's Courts Act, Northern Ireland 2014, must describe the basis, particularly as regards applicable information about the commission or alleged commission of an offence involving domestic abuse, on which the director may be satisfied, as mentioned in Regulation 101A of the Civil Legal Services Financial Regulations, Northern Ireland 2015. So whilst this provision could be strengthened, to ensure that it does not result in a rigid tick box exercise as it stands, the department will have the freedom and license to develop something that works well for victims and limits misuse of the waiver. Mr Speaker, from my perspective, the House has a simple choice to make. They can vote for Amendment 3 as drafted, knowing full well that it falls short in helping victims or they can pass amendments 4, 5 and 6 and allow victims the access to legal aid that they need with no artificial or unfair distinction between them. Passing these amendments will not prevent the Department from developing the necessary guidance and processes that legal services agency need to prevent the abuse of the waiver, and I am deeply disappointed by the level of fear-mongering and derisory responses to my attempts to get more support for victims into this bill and deal with the issues that arise from the waiver. All of what the Minister claims may happen with regard to perpetrators claiming to be victims in order to access legal aid and bring cases against their former victim, increasing the number of cases, costs and so on, will only happen if the Department do not put anything in place to prevent it. And everything that they need to prevent it is in subsection 3 of Amendment 3. So I would ask members to support the amendments in my name, 4 and 6, and also the amendments 5 that have been tabled by myself and Sinead Bradley. This will ensure that the legal aid waiver can be accessed by those that desperately need it. Mr Speaker, turning now to the committee's amendment 13 on the commencement of legal aid, this is also my first opportunity to place on record how disappointing that it is that we're having this debate today, when it could have happened last week. Now, the bill will not get to final stage and then re receive royal assent until the new year, and it's frustrating for everyone that has, has a stake in this legislation, those that have worked very hard to get to this point, and the victims and survivors that need it. I understand the serious concerns around repercussiveness that emerged at the 11th hour, and I, of course, do not in any way endorse the risk that Northern Ireland's block grant could be reduced in order to cover the costs of legal aid in other jurisdictions. I made that very clear la last week at committee. It is simply unfair and unjust. However, what Amendment 13 is really about and why I support it is to ensure that victims and survivors get the access to legal aid that they need. In my view, 13 would never have come about if the Minister and her department had been constructive and engaged with but with us properly about the legal aid provisions to work. Mr Speaker, the Minister and her department have continually sought to stymie the provision, voting against it, seeking to remove it, dilute it or alter it, now attempting to restrict it so the very few would benefit from it. At times I have been made to feel belittled in my attempts to get this provision into the bill and to work out some of the issues arising from it. Indeed, on a separate uh, amendment, I was told that it was unusual for such an amendment from a backbench MLA or MP to end up in legislation. 
even though that it is the right of every member to seek to amend and improve bills. I will. I thank the member for giving way, and, and again, it leads to my point about stifling debate and democratic accountability, and that's a very dangerous place to be. I thank the uh, for, member for, for his Sorry, would the member just take a seat a wee second? The member may have missed some discussions early on in this debate, and I don't want to have subjective interventions or commentary, which is unnecessary, adds nothing to the subject that we're debating. So I would ask you now to return to the uh, subject matter in hand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will. Since the legal aid provisions were added, the only thing that I've heard is in relation to cost implications, and it's the same today in the Chamber in this debate. Risks and costs, costs and risks. What about the risks faced by victims and survivors of abuse? What about the cost to them of having to fight these legal cases against their former abuser? What kind of message is it to send out to victims of abuse when the bill was only agreed to by the executive, according to the minister, because there were no cost implications? To suggest that if the executive's budget is off limits to respect to measures that will help victims and survivors of abuse is not good enough. It's also unrealistic. I will. Mr Speaker, the issue was not that there would be no cost implications. The issue was that those cost implications would be able to be contained within the department um, and its budget, that we would be able to manage any such cost implications. I'm quite sure, Mr Speaker, um, that had we sought additional funding, as we have for other measures, that we would have been able to consider that in the round with the Department of Finance. However, the bill as it stood was something that we believed that we could contain within the budget that was set by the department. And that is what is expected of every Minister, because the Department of Finance has limited resources and money taken from one department will inevitably impact on the same victims that we're funding through another department. I thank the Minister for intervention. I think the committee then have a job going forward in our budget scrutiny to reallocate budgets to appropriate places. The lack of sensitivity to the actual issue and emphasis on costs is misplaced. This is about victims, and it's why I find the Minister's comments last week in relation to RHI on steroids as deeply regrettable and unfortunate. There was never any need to make any comparisons with the botched subsidy scheme that benefited many privileged people in society. And throughout this entire process, I've been fighting for and seeking to help some of the most vulnerable. Mr Speaker, the opposition to Amendment 13 can be summarised in a very clear and succinct way, and it boils down to the fact that there was always a desire to retain the option of never commencing or implementing the provisions with regard... Oh, sorry, sorry, Minister. Just to... Look, Rachel, let me try to draw your attention to an intervention I had to make a while ago. I don't want to return to it again. If I have to return to it again, where you're interpreting the Minister or any other member's uh, opinions for doing or reasons for doing things or taking certain actions, then I will not allow you to continue your contribution. Uh, on a point of order, Mr Speaker, I believe that I have now on at least three occasions in this chamber given my assurance that that was not my intention. Is it in order for a member of this House to essentially accuse a minister at the dispatch box, given um, their, their time to the, the, the Assembly and Chamber, of lying to the House, because that is essentially what has just happened? Well, I will reflect on the precise wording that has been uh, used, but I have made it clear that I am not prepared to listen to much more of this this evening. Um, so I have made it clear to the member who has sailed very close to the wind, I can tell you, and I am not prepared to allow it to continue on. So, Stick to the order paper, stick to the clauses, stick to the amendments, and uh, we'll all get through this uh, in a more moderate sense. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the minister claims that this is about repercussiveness, but the committee was provided with little evidence to back up the assessment of potential risks, and so many questions remain unanswered. Why have the figures and estimated costs fluctuated so much? How can it be claimed that something might cost over a billion and then 400 million to 500 grand? How have these protected, projected costs been calculated? What is the breakdown of the figures and where is the referencing? And I would like to know what assumptions have been made in the numbers. If there are differences between legal aid systems here and in other UK jurisdictions, then how would this be allowed to develop given the risk of repercussive costs? How many legal challenges has there been in relation to differences across regions, and what effects? I will. 
I think the whole point of the reason why the, the Minister didn't move the motion last week and why we've reached this position is because she wanted her um, departmental officials time and space to do the due diligence to work those figures out. And that's why they, the, the precise figures are not here at present. Thank the member for intervention. And I don't have the figures. Uh, the committee hasn't been provided with the figures. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, there are so many questions that still have not been answered to an adequate level of detail. We do not have a sufficient assessment. I, I think I've been very generous with giving way throughout. I would like to finish. That, that's, not, that's not a point of order. Oh, sorry, Minister. It's not a point of order. Um, it's not a point of order. Mr. Woods, to finish her remarks fairly quickly and certainly without any interpretation of anyone else's contribution as to their motivation or reasons why they put forward propositions. So uh, I want to, as I say, remind you that if I was a victim of domestic abuse watching this and listening to this debate this afternoon, I'd be quite disturbed by some of the behaviour of a small number of members. Now, let's not abuse this debate any longer. And continue on, Ms. Woods, your remarks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You'd be glad to know I only have a couple of lines left. But in the absence of such, I consider the committee amendment, which decoupled the commencement of the legal aid provisions from the new offence, and gave the department 12 months to carry out the due diligence that they need to, in order and properly implement it, is a significant compromise. I will. I want to thank the member for this. Um, I, I just missed her closing commentary on her amendment six, and I've been listening very carefully, as I said at the start, in reaching a position on amendment four and six. And I just want some clarity in respect of this amendment six. And I commend the member because she has pursued this um, vigorously, uh, and it's an important debate. Your amendment six, Miss Woods, um, in your view, does that address? the concerns being raised about the abuser um, benefiting in respect of legal aid. And in effect, what Amendment 6 is doing is removing uh, 1AA, which is restricting this to respondents in proceedings. Intervention, and yes, that's what it does. Um, but it also then has the minister's amendment, subsection three, to clarify the departmental guidance. So it sets out the criteria that the department can then use to assure themselves that it is not uh, perpetrators posing as victims in order to access legal aid. So it ties in with the minister's amendment, subsection three. I will. The minister, or the member for giving way. Can I also ask for? Uh, clarification on regards to Amendment 6, whereby it will, it, will, it will interact very well with regards to a victim who now has to take a case to appeal. And that means that your amendment will not then rule that person out of receiving the assistance that they had enjoyed at the previous lower court. Is that correct? Am I reading that right? Thank the member for his intervention. That is correct. That's why I said at the start that all three of the amendments tabled in my name should be read together as they, you know, they square that circle. So, to finish, Mr. Speaker, I fully support the committee amendment and I believe that we should take the opportunity now rather than wait more years to tell us what we know. We must do all we can in this place to give hope to those that have a little left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, members, I propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting for 10 minutes until 6.50 for comfort breaks. The sitting is by leave suspended.
Okay, members, we now resume the sitting. And I call Jerry Carl. Mr. Speaker, um, my comments will be brief uh, and just for, for the benefit of the House, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm not, I won't be criticising uh, or undermining or calling the question the motivation of the Minister, uh, even if I do disagree with some of the points that she, and amendments that she is uh, advocating. Uh, and I think, obviously, it's the duty of me uh, as an MLA, uh, and an MLA that's not an executive, to, to criticise all legislation, including this before us. Um, so thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I rise to speak in favour of, of all amendments in Group 1, uh, except for Amendment 3 uh, from the Minister. Uh, and I'm very glad that amendments have been submitted by, by private members, um, by other MLAs, which would strip away the more restrictive elements of the Minister's uh, proposed provisions for legal aid. I have been troubled, but, uh, as others have been, by the language used to justify these limitations, uh, which seem to focus uh, exclusively or primarily uh, on affordability. And, and I was shocked, Mr. Speaker, last week to hear the, the Minister refer to the potential costs as RHI on steroids. Um, we have, haven't been provided, uh, or certainly I haven't been provided with a figure to back up such a claim. The figures provided uh, by the Minister earlier today, I believe, uh, were nothing close to RHI. And I believe I will give away, yeah. The comment that was made was in respect specifically of the repercussive nature um, of this in the UK, and therefore it was not about the cost of legal aid, which is a justifiable cost and part of the safety net that is there for those who are on low incomes. It was about the potential repercussiveness and the best estimate we have been able to achieve um, in terms of the committee and the time available um, is around um, £400 million. And that was the, contra the contrastive message I made when I referred to it as being like RHI on steroids, which was also a botched um, scheme, which led to significant potential costs being carried by the block grant. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for, uh, for her clarification, I suppose, but I do think it was an unhelpful, unhelpful comment last week. Um, and the idea to suggest, or the possibility of suggesting, that uh, the scale of domestic uh, violence, uh, if it is anything like uh, the cost of £650 million, pounds, that the, fir the first response could be or should be that the money isn't there, uh, rather than having an approach to say um, this is a massive major issue in our society and let's put the investment uh, into tackling it and ensure people have the support uh, to do that. Um, I will, yeah. Thank the member for giving way. And, and I actually agree with you in relation to the, the, the £400 million or the £600 million, whatever it is, is, is crazy money. But that is in relation to the repercussive nature, which would mean it would not be spent on victims of domestic abuse here. It would be, we would actually effectively have money taken out of our block grant that would go to England, Wales and Scotland. It would not be, it would not be for here. So that's where the issue actually arises. But I, I agree with the member in terms of we shouldn't be looking at how much it costs. We need to be looking at how do we protect these people. But we certainly, as, as an executive here could not take on the responsibility of looking after victims of domestic abuse across the, across the water. I thank the member for uh, intervention and, and obviously ignore <laughs> my comments. I put on record my, my views on them. Um, and I think, Mr. Speaker, the, the same arguments around affordability uh, do creep out or creep in uh, to justify limiting legal aid to the lower courts. Um, and this would be, in my view, an unnecessary, uh, unnecessarily blunt. Uh, and restrictive approach, uh, claims uh, that support already exists in the higher court, I think were helpfully at, uh, dismissed or challenged uh, this morning by uh, Rachel Woods um, when she inquired how many times that support had been accessed, and, and none was the answer, I believe, that was given. Um, therefore, claims that it can, legally it can be uh, accessed uh, for the higher courts would be essentially doubling the budget for uh, such support uh, are also dice because you can't obviously double none, uh, which is why I'll, I'll be supporting Rachel Woods uh, and Senior Bradley's amendment uh, number five, Mr. Speaker, to weigh in the scope uh, of legal aid provision. We do not, and nobody should, uh, support a hierarchy of victims which arbitrarily divides people, denying some access to vital uh, funding and support. The cost to society of not uh, breaking down barriers for victims to report seek support and escape domestic abuse is obviously massive and it consequently uh, takes more investment to overcome because services supporting these women 
uh, uh, needing uh, need additional funding uh, down the line. And this assembly, Mr. Speaker, should be focused uh, wholeheartedly on providing whatever support it can to those who need it now. And if it saves uh, money down the line, then obviously all the better. I will also, Mr. Speaker, support um, Amendment Number Six. Um, the argument for, for it has been well made by uh, Ms. Rachel Woods already, and I will not take uh, up, up time repeating uh, much or many of those arguments, but I will say this, that the idea that we should not support this amendment because it might allow access to aid for those who would wrong, wrongfully or wrongly claim it is not one that I could go along with. Uh, for me, it echoes the, the mantra or that idea that uh, in order to prevent benefit fraud, we should stop uh, uh, benefit provision for many, many people. And again, I believe this is a blunt and restrictive response uh, to making sure uh, victims of domestic abuse have access to aid whenever they uh, need it. Um, well, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I appreciate it. And I actually ag I agree with the member's comments that if, if, if this were just about costs, that's exactly what you would be saying. Victims of domestic abuse are not responsible for, for, for those who fraudulently access legal aid. However, what do we do about the new victims that are created by those who do abuse the system? It's not the fact that they get the money. Get the money is one part of it. But how do we protect, how do we protect the victims or potential victims of those who then do misuse it? That, that's where my concern is. Yeah, it's a fair question, <laughs> Member, and I don't have the prescriptive proposal. I mean, uh, Rachel Woods made some suggestions, and I think uh, a lot of that was, uh, falls the responsibility of the minister. Um, and I think there needs to be provision put in place, or as much provision as possible, to ensure that that uh, doesn't happen. Um, Mr. Speaker, the minister obviously correctly endorses amendments in front of us today, which would guarantee regular reporting to make sure this bill uh, is doing what it intends to, uh, to do, and would allow her and her department to make uh, adjustments to provisions where necessary. And I say that we should hear today, at the very beginning of this law, uh, ensure that we are making uh, every support and every aid available uh, to victims. And if issues about funding are identified, as the minister claims or suggests, they will be, or maybe by the reporting, then there should be adequate opportunity to correct and address them. Uh, before us today, Mr. Speaker, we have a chance to support women and children who are victims of domestic abuse by properly funding access to justice. And concerns about the legal aid budget will be dwarfed uh, by impact on many other departments' budgets if we don't tackle these very issues uh, now. Uh, and, Mr. Speaker, it's worth. Um, Emphasising and, and, and stating uh, for, for, for my party, uh, we, we stand with groups, and I'm sure others do, groups like uh, Women's Aid on this issue, and that is to say the provision should be as wide ranging uh, as possible. And indeed, uh, we share their fears uh, that some elements of this bill uh, will not be commenced, and therefore I will support uh, Committee Amendment number 13, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and just in, in, in conclusion, and uh, I think the Minister obviously has. Uh, emphasised or appealed uh, for members to, uh, to trust the department to ensure this is commenced and, if we cannot, to support uh, the law. And this is not meant as any slight on the minister uh, or the department, uh, but I think it is worth saying that any cursory reading of the committee minutes on the bill uh, would paint the picture of members being told certain things were not possible in this bill, which are now written uh, into this bill and endorsed by this House. So, with respect, I would support efforts in the amendments uh, which I stated, which do guarantee commencement written uh, into this bill, and therefore support, like I say, Mr. Speaker, all amendments in this group uh, apart from Amendment 3. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister of Justice to wind. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank members um, for the contributions that have been made um, to this debate and also to the bill. To the Chairman Paul Given, the Deputy Chair Linda Dillon, Sinead Bradley, Doug Beattie, Paula Bradshaw, Paul Frew, Emma Rogan, Cara Hunter, Gemma Dolan, Gordon Dunn, Nicola Brogan, and Rachel Woods. Um, and finally, Jerry Carroll. I also want to take the opportunity, if I may, Mr. Speaker, to congratulate Nicola Brogan um, on an excellent maiden speech um, made in the House today and welcome her to the Chamber officially. 
having made her speech. I'm sure she won't get such easy passage on the next occasion she speaks, but nevertheless, I have to say um, it is always good um, to see someone choose a debate as important as this one in order to make their first contribution um, to the business of the Assembly. And I very much welcome um, that it was this debate that you selected. There are a number of positive changes being, forward, uh, being brought forward in this group of amendments, Mr Speaker. Amendment 1, along with Amendment 8, will see a more robust enabling power to help us introduce information sharing powers for the introduction of an Operation Encompass model. This will give schools an early indication of where there has been an incident the night before, ensuring children can be better supported. And I want to thank the committee, and particularly Linda Dillon and Sinead Bradley, for their work on this matter, and to colleagues in the Department of Education for their assistance. Linda and Sinead both um, campaigned on this issue, both in terms of getting Operation Encompass included in the bill, but also um, in terms of what Sinead um, had asked for was to include um, nursery schools specifically within the bill. And I think that that is a wise um, and a timely um, intervention. And I also wanted to take this opportunity, if I may, just to provide Emma Rogan with an update uh, with respect to the rollout of the pilot, which she referred to that's happening in her constituency. Operationalisation of Operation Encompass um, is being considered and progressed via a multi-agency task and finish group. This includes officials from a local domestic and sexual violence partnership, education, health, justice, police and the safeguarding board for Northern Ireland. The Down sector of the Newry Morn and Down District Council area has been selected for a pilot study, Catchment Zone. This is based on schools in the southeastern area having undertaken training at the Women's Aid Helping Hands programme. That has raised awareness around domestic abuse and includes an Operation Encompass model approach, providing a good basis for a pilot study where consent will be sought for involvement. Any further rollout obviously will need to take account of the findings of, uh, findings of that pilot, but I think it is a very important first step in terms of rolling out additional support, um, particularly to children who are vulnerable um, after being subjected to or witnessing domestic abuse in the home. Amendment 2 similarly strengthens the enabling powers that would allow us to bring forward domestic abuse protection notices and orders which are currently being consulted upon. It also ensures that if this power were to be used, that it would not be limited to those notices and orders, but that other measures could also be considered. Gemma Dolan had asked particularly um, about the opportunity that we would take to move this forward in the miscellaneous provisions bill um, and how we would intend to do so. I have been clear in my intention, Mr Speaker, to provide for new protection provisions in the future miscellaneous provisions bill. Given the complexity of the issue, I believe that primary legislation is the correct place for this to be brought forward. And as Mr Gordon Dunn acknowledged, on 7 December um, I published consultations proposals on this setting out a way forward in detail. This has also been discussed with our voluntary and community sector partners. Given timings of the consultation, other work pressures and the target date for introduction of the miscellaneous provision bill, these measures will be brought forward as amendments ahead of consideration stage. And we will do so at the earliest possible juncture to ensure that the committee have the opportunity to scrutinise those amendments um, fully as we would wish them to do. I trust that the Justice Committee and the House will support me in developing and progressing those measures in due course. Mr Speaker, Rachel Woods also asked in relation to the issue of notices and orders um, about those who are under 18 and what protections um, would be given to young victims and indeed um, how young perpetrators could be handled. The approach taken reflects the approach adopted in the domestic violence and protection notices um, orders that this House approved in 2015, as well as the rest of the UK, including England and Wales, where they have similar age thresholds for the application of the offence. The NSPCC have indicated that a threshold of 18 plus is better than the alternative of 16 plus. The Children's Commissioner also accepts the rationale for this threshold. A threshold below 18 would mean that children could be criminalised for breaching an order where an offence may not have occurred. Also, there would be concerns about making a young person homeless in the absence of an, event, an offence having occurred. There is also a need to ensure that in all we do across the justice system, we adopt a child-centred approach in as far as is possible, taking account of the needs of victims as well as addressing abusive behaviour. Youth, agency, uh, youth justice agency officials have also advised that any response should be commensurate with the young person's age, maturity, needs and understanding. Where a young person is experiencing abuse and a child is engaged in harmful behaviours, the response should be child-centred, seek to prevent further harm and to promote recovery. 
Youth Justice Agency staff are also trained to recognise and respond to issues of domestic abuse, whether a young person is a victim or a perpetrator. They are required to negotiate the procedural and process requirements of safeguarding systems as they impact on children and adults, while supporting service users to engage with a range of support requirements and safety plans. Specialised interventions are delivered as part of any community or court-ordered disposals, often in collaboration with other statutory and voluntary organisations. In terms of those who display harmful behaviour, there should be a coordinated approach by the health and social care trusts, the police, the public protection arrangements in Northern Ireland, the public prosecution service, victim support services and youth justice bodies so that relevant professionals from this sector can understand the risks a young person may pose to other young people. This coordinated response should include working with the young person whose behaviour has been harmful and those working with the young person who has been harmed. Consideration should also be given to whether such a young person who abuses others should be subject of a child protection case conference if they are considered to be at risk of continuing harm. Furthermore, non-molestation orders or protection orders would continue to be available in relation to 16 and 17 year olds. Mr Speaker, I have also sought to set out for members the risks associated with the amendment on legal aid which was introduced at consideration stage. I want to be absolutely clear that my reference with respect to RHI was with respect to the potential repercussiveness of this, not with legal aid costs themselves. Legal aid is a vital part of the social safety net that allows everyone equal access to justice. It is something that I believe is important, it is something that I, um, that I defend, and I believe that we should protect um, and guard. And that requires us to make such changes to legal aid as are properly thought through and developed um, with good policy intent. I am hopeful that the improved provision proposed as Amendment 3 and the supplementary commitment to develop new and better forms of protection provided by Amendment 7 will provide that sensible basis on which to progress the ambition that we all share to protect victims of domestic abuse in the best way we can. I want to put on record my thanks to Doug Beatty for both his sensible and his sensitive comments in respect of the need to consider how we target resources and, crucially, where that money will come from, from to fund new commitments. It comes from budgets that also support victims in other ways, Mr Speaker. And so what we implement in one place in this House has implications for budgets in another. And we must all, with good intent, be conscious of where the money comes from and how it is spent to ensure that it is targeted at those who are most in need. Giving effect to the waiver and developing further protections through Amendment 7 mechanism will require extensive evidence gathering and engagement work. And I look forward to working with members, the Justice Committee, and most importantly of all, Mr. Speaker, with victims of abuse, as together we develop policy proposals that can make a genuine difference to people's lives. The provisions envisioned by Amendments 4 um, and 5, to some degree, are, in my view, unnecessary. They step on the toes of existing protections and interact ambiguously and at times illogically with existing statute. In the event that they are adopted, remedial amendments to legal aid statute will be required to ensure that they function correctly and don't give rise to contested, unfair or unclear outcomes. I trust the committee will work constructively with us in the department in that regard, um, should that eventuality arise. In reality, however, I want to make the case around Amendment 4 and 5 because I do believe that they are different. Amendment 4 does not add anything for victims. Amendment 5 attempts to do so. There may be better ways to achieve it, but it at least attempts to do that. And so, whilst I will oppose Amendment 4, I will not be pushing Amendment 5 to a division, Mr Speaker, because I do not believe that that is necessary. In respect of Amendment 4, I want to set out I will, yes. Thank you for taking the intervention. I just want clarity around one issue in relation to this. We were told by the officials and committee, if I recall right, in relation to mediation, that mediation services are not provided in cases of domestic violence, and that is the intended course of action in relation to domestic abuse also. So is mediation ruled out in these cases anyhow? I just, I just want clarity around that, if the Minister. 
It isn't that mediation is ruled out. The question is how people um, view the issue of advice and guidance, and that does not equate to mediation. And that, I think, has been slightly overegged um, in the discussion, and I'm hoping to set out clearly uh, what we're actually talking about. People, um, in respect of Amendment 4, it is important that we understand exactly what the waiver does. People can get all the advice and assistance they need to defend proceedings under a representation lower certificate. A victim doesn't need a separate certificate for advice and assistance if a vexatious application is issued against them. They need something more tangible. They need representation at court, and that is what the waiver covers. In this way, the waiver is directly analogous to the non-molestation waiver that also extends to representation only. There has been no request to extend that waiver in those purely protective measures, and it would therefore be illogical to extend the waiver to advice and assistance in matters regarding issues such as contact. Access to Justice Northern Ireland Order 2003 says, representation means representation for the purposes of proceedings and includes a all such assistance as is usually given by a solicitor or counsel in the steps preliminary or incidental to any proceedings, and b in the case of civil proceedings, all such assistance as is usually given, so in arriving at or giving effect to a compromise to avoid or bring an end to any proceedings. And I hope that that clarifies for um, Ms Dillon and indeed others. Um, that giving effect to a compromise, essentially finding mediated outcomes, is covered within the waiver. There is therefore no need for the extension of the waiver to cover advice and assistance. And so I ask members to resist this amendment because it costs money, yes, but it delivers nothing additional to victims who are at the heart of what we are here to do this evening. With respect, Mr Speaker, um, to Amendment 5, the question has been asked about the higher tier courts, and I want to specifically address that. Ms Rachel Woods has asked um, how often waivers have been used, and as I have said, they have been used. They simply haven't been used in these circumstances. However, these protections have been deployed in divorce and ancillary relief proceedings, in public family law proceedings and a variety of other contexts. So it is not true to say that they have not been used. What I am proposing and what I have committed to do is to ensure that the discretion can be deployed in a clear, structured and public way to ensure that victims of abuse have access to the representation they need to protect themselves from their abusers in private family law cases at the higher tier. The Director of Legal Services is able to use his existing discretion to provide appropriate protection in these cases, and I have already made clear that I intend to task my department with developing a framework that ensures that this is done in a structured way that gives clarity to everyone about the support that is available and how it can be accessed. I will, yes. I thank the Minister for giving way. I appreciate it. All of those waivers that the Minister has outlined. Are they different from what is in England at this current time? And if they are, why then is the Minister concerned about the repercussiveness of further measures? Well, I am concerned about the repercussiveness of further measures because we have not had the time to do due diligence on the legal aid provisions. And that is why putting in a commencement date in the bill would be foolish, because it could end up in a situation where, having done that due diligence, if it proves to be repercussive, that we would have to go ahead and commence. It is not the case, and I have said this again both to the committee and in the chamber, it is not the case that every deviation um, from what happens in England and Wales will lead to repercussive implications. But how we do that, how we do that is critical in avoiding repercussive implications. And we have not had the opportunity, because of the manner in which these have been brought, to be able to secure um, our, our to be able to secure um, ourselves the adequate knowledge and due diligence to be certain that that will not be the case. So it is not simply to say that th there will be no repercussive implications. It is to say that we will be able to look at those as we proceed with the bill. And I will also again repeat, Mr Speaker, that it is my intention to commence both the, the abuse offences and the legal aid provisions at the same time, permitting, of course, that the, league, the due diligence that is done on this comes back and tells me that there is no repercussive implication. That's the will of the House, Mr Speaker, and I am bound by it. 
I want to set out my concerns um, also in relation just to Amendment 5. Um, however, as I have already indicated, it is not my intention to divide the House on this matter. I would ask members, however, to reflect on what I say on Amendment 5 because it does have consequences. It is unnecessary and it can bring both confusion and delay. First of all, there are two very different financial eligibility tests which exist for funding before the lower and higher courts. A waiver is basically a very simple but crude tool. It works well for high volume decisions with relatively low value, where speed is the main consideration and therefore it is appropriate in the lower tier. Higher court cases are less frequent and much more expensive, both for clients and the legal aid fund. In these circumstances, a much more considered approach that gives regard to individual circumstances of the applicant and the case is required. This is what representation higher discretion allows for, and with both provisions in place, there is a risk that an applicant will be unsure of what their entitlements are, unclear about what information they need to provide to access their entitlement, and critically will be left wondering if they are to be granted a waiver, whether they might have been better off with another form of protection. Having two schemes in place to do essentially the same thing does not help people. It adds confusion and muddies the water in what is an already very complicated situation. Additionally, by linking Article 8 applications to other family proceedings in the higher courts, it effectively will bring the waiver into play in cases other than Article 8 applications and thereby expose the legal aid fund to an uncertain cost pressure. However, as I have said, despite those reservations, I do not intend to resist Amendment 5. I will simply leave it to members to consider the arguments that I have set out. Finally, on that group of amendments, the member, uh, Rachel Woods, also mentioned the issue of occupation orders a few times um, in her contribution. I want to be clear and for the avoidance of doubt. You cannot get an occupation order under waiver, uh, the waiver that she is proposing, or under my amendment. The member, I think, is confusing occupation orders with residence orders, which would come within the Vares um, of this bill. Mr Speaker, I am just then returning um, to Amendment 6. Amendment 6 um, is a much more serious problem. It carries with it a significant risk of failing vulnerable victims of abuse by facilitating their further abuse. If we adopt Amendment 6, we will discover later that we have voted to make more public funds available to abusers to drag their victims through the courts. Let's be clear. A respondent to proceedings cannot drag anyone to the courts. It is only the initiator who can take that course of action. And therefore, by saying that you will not fund respondents at this time, that you will fund respondents at this time, but not initiators um, of these at this time, that ensures that we can prevent abusers from dragging their family through the courts. We cannot and must not allow that to happen. And so I am asking members to oppose Amendment 6. The Chairman, Mr Paul Given, and I want to thank the Chairman and members of the committee again for their support of the scrutiny of the bill, raised a number of very key points which I want to address because I think they, come, I think they are most pertinently addressed um, under Amendment 6. With respect to the very real point that Mr Given and others made about victims who are already subjected to a situation where a perpetrator gets legal aid due to their means, and the victim doesn't because of their means, and we all acknowledge that that can incentivise such vexatious Article 8 proceedings. However, my concern... I will, yes. I just want to clarify some of the language that's been used through this debate and previous debates, just from my own mind. Um, there has been references to perpetrators, and quite refer rightly, references to victims. Will the Minister clarify what she means by a perpetrator? Are we talking about suspects because a suspect is not a perpetrator until they are convicted in a court of law? Or is the perpetrator she's referring to in this case someone who's already been convicted of domestic abuse and are continuing that abuse through the court system? Because it, when we're passing criminal legislation, it is important that we understand that our job as legislators is to make a law which protects, as strange as it sounds, the suspect and the victim until the suspect becomes or may or may not be found guilty. Once they're found guilty, they're a perpetrator. 
The issue here is, Mr. Speaker, that this is not about criminal proceedings, so this would not affect, if you like, those who are accused of a crime. The issue here, Mr. Speaker, is about those perpetrators of domestic abuse who may not have been found guilty of a crime, but are still nevertheless perpetrators of domestic abuse or violence against a partner, who would be able um, to argue that they are a victim and use the waiver to then further abuse their partner by dragging them through the courts repeatedly. So it doesn't, I'm not referring to those who are, if you like, before the courts uh, with respect to charges for domestic abuse, because that is dealt with in a completely different set of circumstances. This is about civil um, legal aid and family proceedings only, um, in which I'm referring to perpetrators in that regard. With respect um, to that point um, with Amendment 6, my concern is that regardless of means, a perpetrator who claims to be a victim of abuse will be able to claim the waiver and use legal aid in order to repeatedly return the victim to the courts. Amendment 6 therefore expands the availability to perpetrators to exercise coercive control in that way. If we are, as I believe members intend, intend to act to reduce this form of abuse, then we should not allow an additional route for perpetrators to be created. The only alternative means to prevent such abuse, and I think the Vice Chair Linda Dillon rightly explained, would be in some way to more strictly define a victim, and indeed um, her colleague uh, Mr O'Dowd has suggested that, for example, a conviction um, for domestic abuse would, uh, would absolutely define a perpetrator in law. However, were we to say that a victim coming before the courts seeking legal aid in family proceedings would first of all have had to secure a conviction against their partner in order to be able to get this legal aid waiver for their <coughs> civil proceedings, then we would be limiting the scope of, this waiver, of the waiver way beyond what was the intention of the House. And therefore, I believe it is important that we have flexibility that where there may be other lower level evidence of domestic abuse in a family situation, that those those victims would still be able to claim the waiver in terms of domestic abuse. But where we have no alternative if Amendment 6 goes ahead, we would have to be much more stringent in how we defend abuse. Indeed, in Rachel Wood's own comments, she said that it was a matter for the Department to draw up such rules and regulations that would ensure that couldn't happen. But the, the unacknowledged consequence of that is that genuine victims would then be excluded from the waiver. So, um, from our perspective, Mr. Speaker, it is important that we make this wide enough to capture potential victims of domestic abuse, but that we make it narrow enough that we don't allow those who would use this to further perpetrate abuse on a partner are excluded. And the way to do that is only at this stage to cover those who are initiating or who are respondents to, um, uh, uh, to respondents to proceedings and not to those um, who are initiating. Amendment 3, however, allows us to develop proposals for circumstances where victims, and they will often rightly need to obtain legal aid to commence proceedings in future. Paul Given and others also queried further, Mr Speaker, um, about the £14 million and where the level of that comes from. And I think Paul Frew asked, um, should it not better come from the legal aid fund than out of the pockets of victims? So I just want to take a minute just to explain where the figures came from. In the year 30th of June uh, 2020, the Legal Services Agency issued 3,036 certificates for individuals to be represented in Article 8 proceedings. According to the court service data, there were at least 7,876 parties to Article 8 applications in the same period. This means there were at least 4,840 participants in such proceedings who are not in receipt of legal aid in the year to the 30th of June 2020. The average cost of funding Article 8 proceedings for the LSA is £1,009.14 at the Family Proceedings Court and £6,973.59 in the higher courts. Roughly 20% of cases take place in the higher courts. Under the provisions currently in the bill, the proposed waiver would, apply, would come to apply in most Article 8 cases. Based on those numbers, the cost of funding an additional 4,840 participants each year would amount to some 10.6 million annually. 
In addition, the availability of legal aid to fund Article 8 work to people who would previously have been financially ineligible can be expected to generate extra applications to the court, as I have just described. Each case coming before the courts will also be complicated by allegations of abuse, about which the court will need to make findings of fact in the course of the proceedings, adding delay and further cost to the system. These effects in combination might be expected to add a further 10 to 20 per cent, or £2 to £4 million pounds, to the total cost of funding Article 8 proceedings. These effects, therefore, have the potential to increase the annual cost of Article 8 cases from the current level of around £8 million to as much as £22 million per year, i.e. an extra £14 million, with no available means of assessing where it will fall within that range. Importantly, the great majority of these costs will arise from an inability to target support on victims of abuse who are seeking to defend themselves against abusive partners. Much of this potential cause could only be avoided by giving the LSA the means in legislation to target support where it's needed. Legal aid is a scarce resource, and an important one, Mr Speaker, used to ensure access to justice for vulnerable people in some of the most trying circumstances they will ever face in their lives. It is critical that we focus it carefully on those who need its help, and I believe the current provisions fail to do that. So with respect to the savings and the estimates provided to the committee and where they come from, it is not just from funding people who aren't victims, it is also by not funding litigation that would otherwise not occur, and I hope that that answers uh, Mr mm -hmm. Given's question. Paul Given and Doug Beattie also both made reference to legal aid spending more generally, and I, want, I remain committed to addressing the two audit qualifications in the latest LSA accounts. The LSA is actively taking forward a range of measures to address those qualifications, and I welcome the Comptroller and Auditor General's recognition of the progress which has been made in addressing those audit qualifications. I also note um, that the Comptroller and Auditor General has commended uh, the work um, on fraud and error, has a number of different strands, and knows that it will take time to develop. Landmark progress was made with the introduction of the Legal Aid Management System during 2019 and 20. However, other elements of the work programme continue to span a number of financial years. We remain focused on this work and on driving down levels of fraud and error because it is absolutely the case that we care about the impact of the spending of public money and ensuring it is directed to those most in need. I have already indicated um, that in our report, we will look specifically at the need for support of those victims who may need to initiate Article 8 proceedings. And I believe that there is scope within what I have suggested in the amendments brought forward in order to do that. Finally, in relation to Amendment 13, I have given a commitment to the Assembly that I will commence these provisions in good time following the completion of a due diligence process to understand their impact, provided that it is safe to do so. I will share that analysis that informs the decision uh, with the committee, and I am happy to face scrutiny in this House in due course in respect of the decision to commence or not commence the provisions. Amendment 13 is therefore wholly unnecessary. Its only effect is to replace a straightforward mechanism with a deeply cumbersome one that, if needed, might eat up valuable Assembly resources and time in what remains of this mandate. Finally, Ms Wood stated that the Department had failed to provide the committee with any estimate of the costs or to why they had varied with respect to repercussiveness. As my colleague Paula Bradshaw rightly stated, that is because due diligence has not yet been completed. A fulsome explanation of this, the crudeness of the estimates that we were able to provide and all of the other attendant issues was provided to the committee. And I am happy for those members who are interested to read Hansard rather than detain members further here tonight by repeating it into the record. In addition, if it becomes clear that those provisions are not safe, we will need action by the Assembly to prevent exposure of financial risk, or worse still, to prevent further harm to victims, using up that scarce resource to which I referred. Mr Speaker, I have indicated now in writing and here today many times in this House that I intend to commence the legal aid provisions to the Bill unless there is a repercussive implication. However, to be tied in law to do so irrespective of the outcome of that due diligence is bad law, and I would urge members to oppose it. I have also given an undertaking to the committee that should those provisions prove to be repercussive, 
I have heard what they have said with respect to the outcome of legal aid and the provisions that they wish to make, and we will return to the committee with such proposals that will allow us in a safe way to implement the intent of these measures without um, exposing us to repercussive costs. I am asking members once again to accept those assurances and those contained in the Law Lords ruling of 1995 and vote against Amendment 13. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, I understand why many victims and many who work in the sector are concerned that we will not deliver what is promised in this chamber. They are not the only people who doubt us in this matter. This discussion first started in 2016. And yet it is now 2020, and three years of delay happened while victims and others were unable to access justice in a way that was intended. I understand, therefore, the desire of the Assembly to do whatever is possible to help victims who are facing appalling and devastating cruelty and threat. But, Mr Speaker, I share that desire, and I am confident that every member of this House does likewise. This is why I made this my first bill when I came into office. It is why I have driven this matter hard throughout the year. And it is a great disappointment to me, Mr Speaker, that it has become a contested issue, because in fact it is one I think at the core we are all united around. I am confident, Mr Speaker, that if people support the amendments that I have indicated tonight um, and oppose those which I have indicated, I will oppose. We will, in a responsible, measured and properly targeted way, find the best support possible for victims. I will. Thank you. Mr Forgiving Way, um, and again, uh, forgive me for just taking you back to Amendment 6, and it was something that I had asked the proposer of the amendment, and I know you are about to conclude. It is just to assist me in, in reaching a, a final view on this. The, the, the key issue that I am looking at in respect of Amendment 6 is um, to try and address the concern you've raised that abusers would benefit. And I'm trying to point out where in Amendment 6, which my reading of it does nothing but remove that a client is the respondent in the proceedings, it retains in legislation that the director has to be satisfied around what a victim of abuse is, and that uh, retains in your Amendment 3, which would be the new Clause 27, the subsection 5 in terms of the guidance which would pr provide the outline of all of that. Where does an abuser still slip through the net in that context? Mr Speaker, I, I, I addressed this issue a few moments ago, but if you will indulge me, I'm happy to repeat it again. The, the, the reason why an abuser would be able to, to slip through the net is because whatever, whatever rules we put in place to guide the discretion uh, which legal services can apply, can either be very stringent, in which case it would potentially also exclude victims, um, but also it would exclude perpetrators. So we could say, for example, you will only be entitled to the waiver if, you have a convic if the person um, who is calling you to court um, has a conviction for domestic abuse, or if that person has an arrest record for domestic abuse. As members of the committee, and indeed members of the House will be aware, there are a multitude of reasons why those who are subjected to domestic abuse do not take proceedings to court, do not report incidents to police, and are fearful of doing so. Whilst we want to break that down, there will be those, for example, who will have sought advice and guidance from women's aid, but have opted not to report to police the abuse that has taken place. For us to leave it so wide, um, that we weren't able to, to restrict it to that would mean that an abuser, by making a call to an organisation, could then claim, well, actually, I I'm not an abuser, I'm the abused. And so we could end up in a situation, because it is about the initiation of proceedings, where abusers were able to use legal aid to drag their partner through the courts. That happens already. You made that point very clearly um, in your contribution. The difficulty is that at the minute it is constrained by people's access to legal aid, which is constrained by means. This would remove that barrier and therefore people would be incentivised who wish to torture a partner to be able to take legal aid and do it at public expense. So by removing the, the requirement to fund other than respondents, we are saying anyone being taken to court 
um, against their will, against their wishes, by a, a partner um, in family proceedings who claims that they are a victim of domestic abuse will be able to access the waiver. But anyone initiating proceedings would not, because you can't drag people to court if you're a respondent. However, what we have also done um, in the other amendments is say that we will bring forward an alternative provision that will allow those cases where um, a genuine victim needs to take a case, initiate a case in the courts, to be able to do so in a way that will be much more tightly regulated, and I accept that, but will exclude the possibility um, of large numbers of abusers being able to abuse that particular waiver. And so that's the core issue around all of this. The removal of respondents from this is something that I have raised with practitioners and others. And whilst all recognise that there can be very good reasons why someone has to go to court um, and has to initiate proceedings if they are a victim of abuse, most recognise most recognise that that can be dealt with in a different way, but that by opening the waiver to those who initiate abuse would essentially make the situation worse and not better. So, Mr Speaker, in conclusion, as I have said, I understand the reservations that members of the public um, will have around trust in this place. I also understand the desire of the Assembly to do whatever is possible to help victims, and I share that. I believe that the best way to do that, Mr Speaker, is to support those amendments that I have indicated um, I will be supporting and to oppose those which I will oppose. I believe that we can then work together to make proposals in this bill which will make a real and tangible but also a positive difference to the lives of victims. And it is victims of abuse that are at the heart of all that we have done in this chamber today. And on that note, Mr Speaker, um, I am concluding my remarks. Thank you, and thank all the members for their uh, contributions. Um, moving on to the voting. Um, so, Amendment 1. Amendment proposed before Clause 26 insert new clause, information sharing with schools, etc., as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 2 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 2. I beg to move. Amendment proposed leave out clause 26 and replace with the new clause protective measures for victims of abuse, as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 3. Already, has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 3. Beg to move. The amendment proposed leave out Clause 27 and replace with a new clause eligibility of victims for civil legal aid, as printed on the Marshall list. As Amendments 4, 5 and 6 are amendments to Amendment 3, we will need to dispose of them first before returning to Amendment 3. Amendment 4 has already been debated, and I call Ms Rachel Woods to move formally Amendment 4. So moved. The amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 3 insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 4 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we no? No. Aye. No. Aye. 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 Clear the question will be put in three minutes. Can I just remind members to uh, continue to uphold the social distancing in the chamber? We're still on camera and we're still being viewed.
Okay, order members. Order members. Please resume your seats. Before I put the question, I'm obliged to say this. I would again remind those members present that if possible it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. Moving swiftly on. The question is that amendment four be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary no. no. Do we have tellers? Okay, members. Tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll. Tellers for the nose are Paula Bradshaw and Kelly Armstrong. And before the assembly divides, I want to remind you that, as per Standing Order 112, the assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind you to ensure that social distancing continues to be observed while. And taking, while the voting is taking place, and please be patient at all times and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies, the Sammy will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors, please. Secure the doors.
Okay, members, order members. Could I ask the clerk now to read the result, please? 81 members voted. 25 members voted aye. 56 members voted no. The amendment is negative. Thank you. And the amendment falls. And sorry. Oh, sorry. Over again. Uh, amendment five, which is also an amendment to amendment three, has already been debated. And I call Ms. Sinead Bradley to move formally Amendment 5. So moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 3. Leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that the Amendment 5 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 6, which is also an amendment to Amendment 3, has already been debated. And I call Ms. Rachel Woods to formally move Amendment 6. So moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 3. Leave out and insert uh, words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 6 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. 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 Aye. Clear lobbies. I have been advised by the party whips in accordance with Standing Order 113.5b that there is an agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers? Order members, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the ayes are Jerry Carl and Rachel Woods. Tellers for the noes are Paula Bradshaw and Kelly Armstrong. Again, I remind all members to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide ayes to my right, noes to my left.
Okay, secure the doors, please.
Order, members. Uh, could I ask the clerk to please read the result? 81 members voted 25. 56 members voted no. The amendment is negatived. The amendment is negatived. We now return to Amendment 3. The question is that Amendment 3, as amended, be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Amendment 7 has already been debated. I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 7. Beg to move. Amendment proposed after Clause 27 insert new clause proposals as to availability of civil legal aid as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 7 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 8 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 8. Make to move. Amendment proposed to Clause 28, page 14, line 36, leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 8 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to the second group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 9, it will be convenient to debate Amendments 10 to 12 and 14 to 17. And I call the Minister of Justice, Naomi Long, to move Amendment 9 and to address the other amendments in the group. Minister. Mr Speaker, I, move, I beg to move Amendment 9. This relates to the data collection provision at Clause 29 of the Bill. My amendment removes the reference to the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals Service. I consider this to be legislatively inappropriate given that the court service is an agency of the Department and would otherwise require the Department to be giving guidance to a part of itself. I can, however, reassure members that the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service is an integral part of the discussions that are being held with PSNI and the Public Prosecution Service around the opera operationalisation of the offence and information that is to be gathered. Along with these entities, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service will be made aware as to the information that is to be provided and what is expected from it. The absence of a legislative reference will in no way diminish that, that position. While members may ask why this approach differs from the approach in the training clause at Clause 30, it is important to remember that the provision in Clause 29 is permissive, that I may issue guidance. There is no duty and it would involve my department advising itself, which is illogical. The requirement in relation to the training provision is quite different as it places a duty and obligation on my department to do something. Turning now to Amendment 10, we are all in agreement on the need for and importance of training for those that are involved in the operationalisation of the new offence. This will be key to ensuring that the offence works as intended and that it can be seen to be as effective as possible. I indicated at consideration stage I had concerns about Clause 30, which as it stands would require me and my department to ensure that sufficient mandatory training is made available to police and criminal justice agencies on an annual basis. As I have advised previously, neither I nor my department can interfere in the operational independence of these organisations. It is not for the department to dictate to other independent entities as to their operational procedures and requirements. Indeed, I would be stepping outside my ministerial powers. Amendment 10 instead places the duty onto the PSNI and the Public Prosecution Service themselves, given their status as operationally independent bodies rather than on the department. The amendment also provides that the duty would apply to any additional public body which could be specified by the Department in regulations that has functions within the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. The duty for training next staff remains with my department due to its agency status. They would, however, still be named on the face of the bill. The amendment also places a duty on my department to provide training to staff of any additional agency of the department that has functions within the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland and which the department selects in connection with this section. The requirement in relation to training would be to provide such training as is considered appropriate for those that have responsibility for dealing with cases involving domestic abuse and to ensure the effective discharge of those responsibilities um, in relation to these cases. At the outset, I consider that the core agencies dealing with the new offence are covered. It is important that the provisions focus on those organisations with key responsibility for criminal proceedings on domestic abuse and aggravated offences. 
This will also ensure that operational partners are equipped to investigate the new offence, bring forward prosecutions and facilitate convictions. While the training will be mandatory and annual, ultimately responsibility for it and its effectiveness needs to rest with the operational bodies and should be determined on the basis of operational need. I would thank the committee for agreeing the approach that is set out in the amended provision. On training, there is also a requirement to report on the level of participation for the organisations covered, which is included in both the training provision itself, that is Clause 30, and the reporting provision, Clause 32. Members will wish to note that work is currently being progressed by both PSNI and the Public Prosecution Service in conjunction with our voluntary and community sector service partners as to the form that training will take. This training will make use of operational guidance, which will supplement the guidance that my department is currently developing under Clause 28 of the Bill in conjunction with our voluntary and community sector partners. Provision in relation to reporting on training is also provided for in subsection 3A of the clause dealing with reporting on the operation of part 1 for completeness. Amendment 11 again builds upon and further refines the committee amendment relating to independent oversight. The structure of the clause has been refashioned in part recasting the provisions. Those related to guidance have been refined to refer to making recommendations on the content and review of guidance. Provision is included that the report be, that is to be prepared must contain an assessment as to the effectiveness of Part 1 and must include recommendations on its operation. A report is to be prepared annually, with the first report to be completed within two years of Chapters 1 and 2 of the Act coming into operation. I consider that there is merit in this, given that it will take a period for the new offence to bed in and for numbers to be meaningful. The amendment also makes provision in relation to laying of the independent person's report at the Assembly and for the clause to have effect for a minimum period of seven years from the day on which Chapters 1 and 2 come into operation. <clears throat> Where the Department brings forward regulations, the functions may cease after this period. Amendment 15 provides that Clause 31 comes into operation the day after Royal Assent, enabling the appointment process to be established ahead of the new domestic abuse offence coming into operation. As I noted at consideration stage and during my previous discussions with the committee and chairs, I am reassured that this function does not need to entail an entirely new entity. Rather, it is a function that could be undertaken by, for example, the Criminal Justice Inspection or any new Victims of Crime Commissioner. In this respect, there have been helpful discussions with the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice in Northern Ireland. Turning now to Amendment 12, this builds on Clause 32, with changes largely to refine some of the language around criminal proceedings so that this more closely aligns with practice. The reporting period is also somewhat broader to reflect that the offence will not be introduced at the start of a financial year, therefore assisting with the time period for data collection. Reference is now also made in relation to the domestic abuse offence and data by reference to police districts. The provisions in relation to guidance have also been refined to refer to issuing, review and revision of guidance, given that the guidance will have been developed through a multi-party task and finish group involving statutory and voluntary sector partners ahead of the offence coming into operation. Provision is made that there are ongoing reporting requirements, with each reporting period three years after the previous one. The amendment also provides that the reporting requirement would no longer apply if regulations to this effect were brought forward, with the earliest that these can be brought forward being 10 years after the domestic abuse offence comes into operation. It is considered that at, the point the offence will be, at that point the offence will be well bedded in, and that reporting at that point should take the same form as for any other offence. This is of course something that would have to be reviewed further at that point. That aside, information and data would continue to be made available on key offence statistics, such as is currently the case in relation to a wide range of offences. The last three amendments are technical, albeit important. Amendment 14 provides, provides that Clause 27A will come into effect the day after royal assent is secured. Turning to the final amendment, Amendment 16 allows for the short titles of the Bill at Clause 39 to be amended on foot of changes to the Bill at consideration stage. The previous reference to family proceedings in the short title will therefore be replaced by civil proceedings, of which family proceedings are a part. A similar change is made in the long title by way of Amendment 17. This will make reference to regulating the conduct of civil proceedings in particular circumstances and provision for connected purposes, again in line with the changes that have been made to the Bill. 
Mr Speaker, that concludes my remarks on the amendments being considered in this grouping, and I look forward to hearing from members. Thank you. Thank you, and I call the Chairpartner of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Amendments 9, 10, 11, 12 and 15 all relate to provisions that were introduced to the Bill by the Committee at consideration stage. The Department uh, provided the Committee with its proposed text of these amendments, and the Committee requested a number of changes to ensure the provisions retained their original purpose and intent. The Department responded positively to the Committee requests, and we are therefore supporting the amendments today. In relation to Amendment 9, the main change to Clause 29 is to remove the reference to the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service. The Department highlighted that the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service is part of the Department, and therefore it is considered legislatively inappropriate to retain the reference given. It would require the Department to give guidance to itself. Officials did provide assurance that the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service is fully involved, together with the PSNI and the PPS, in the discussions that are being held around the opera operationalisation of the offence and the information to be gathered, and it would be made clear to the court service what is expected from it and uh, the information that is to be provided. Uh, while the committee is of the view that the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service has an important role to play in ensuring that appropriate and robust data is collected to fully and properly assess the operation of the new offence, and it is consistent across the various criminal justice agencies, of which it is one to allow for the tracking of cases and analysis at each stage of the process. It accepts the reason for removing the specific reference in the provision to the Courts and Tribunal Service, given the assurances provided by the Department and, again, uh, by the Minister today. Uh, moving on, uh, Clause 30 currently places a duty on the Department to ensure that sufficient and appropriate training is made available to allow for the effective operation of this legislation. The training is mandatory for all those involved in the disposal of domestic abuse cases in policing and criminal justice agencies and must be provided annually. And the Department must publish the uptaking of training by each relevant organisation at the end of each annual reporting period, given the importance of this to the effective operation of the legislation. The need for such training to fully understand course of control and the needs of the victim was emphasised by the article in the Belfast Telegraph last Friday, and I welcome the confirmation from the police service that it is currently developing a new extensive domestic abuse training package for all frontline officers. Uh, members had sympathy with the point that the Minister made regarding it being more appropriate to place the duty for training on the police and the PPS, respectively, in relation to their personnel rather than the Department. And I indicated during the consideration stage debate that the Committee would be content for the wording of the provision to be tidied up to reflect this. Amendment 10 does this. When the Committee considered the first draft of Amendment 10, members were concerned that the Department had removed the requirement to publish the uptake of training by each relevant organisation on an annual basis and the provision for training for criminal justice agencies other than the Police Service, the Public uh, Prosecution Service and the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service to allow for the effective operation of the Act. Uh, the Department has now reinstated both these requirements to the satisfaction of the Committee, and we are therefore able to support Amendment 10. Turning to Amendment 11, which replaces Clause 31, following discussions with departmental officials, the initial wording of the amendment has been revised to more accurately reflect the intent of Clause 31.1b for the independent person to review, report and make recommendations in relation to the operation of Part 1 of the Act, and also that they should advise and make recommendations uh, in relation to the content and review of guidance under Clause 28. The Committee is therefore satisfied with Amendment 11 and also welcomes Amendment 15, which will enable the Department to establish the process to appoint the independent person ahead of the offence coming into operation. In relation to Amendment 12, the wording builds on the provision in the Bill and refines some of the language to more closely align with criminal proceedings and practice. The Department initially proposed that the amendment should provide for the reporting requirements in Clause 32 to cease after nine years, rather than remain open-ended. However, at the request of the Committee, uh, this was removed. The amendment to the clause now provides that after the initial report, each reporting period is three years after the previous one. There is also provision for the reporting requirement to come to an end at the earliest 10 years after the offence comes into operation, and this can only be done by way of a negative resolution regulation, uh, which will have to be considered by uh, the committee. 
If regulations are not brought forward, the reporting requirement will continue indefinitely. The Committee is of the view that this is a pragmatic approach to adopt and is content with Amendment 12. <coughs> Excuse me. The Committee also supports Amendments 16 and 17 that make changes to the long title of the Bill and the short title at Clause 39 to properly reflect the changes that have been made to the Bill. Speaking uh, just briefly, Mr Speaker, uh, in my role as a member of the Assembly, First, let me take the opportunity to uh, commend Nicola Brogan on her maiden speech. I always admire a member who decides to introduce a degree of controversy. Um, on this occasion, uh, we decided to let it go, but on the next occasion, I suspect members will wish to, to have that debate. But I have no doubt, given the way that she spoke, she will be able to equip herself very well and articulate her position. Um, she is a Tyrone woman. I am a Lisburn man born and bred, but my family are all from Tyrone, so we share that commonality at least. Um, but I certainly wish her well in her time in the uh, Assembly. Uh, I will, Mr Speaker, at the final uh, stage of the bill, uh, commend all of the organisations and individuals in more detail. I just wanted to again put on record my thanks to our own committee staff the work of the, the Bill Clark that advised the committee and indeed the Assembly staff uh, for their support um, to the committee uh, and getting us to uh, this stage, and I'll elaborate on that at final stage. Uh, and I suppose finally, um, because this is likely the last time I get a chance to engage with the Justice Minister as we break for recess, and I know there was a member, Mr Speaker, in this House, and they indicated um, well, at least I'm sure the minister hopes it's the last time we might talk before uh, Christmas. But there was a member in this house who kindly offered to provide marriage counselling, uh, and I always take the view in relationships it's usually better that they work it out themselves. So let me be the first, because in any relationship it takes somebody to take the first step. I do, in all sincerity, want to uh, wish the minister well uh, over the Christmas period. Uh, I, I do um, thank her for the engagement. At times, I know it might appear hostile. Maybe that's how it feels for others. Um, but iron does sharpen iron in that respect. And the democratic process has brought forward a better piece of legislation, even at times when it might seem uh, difficult to get uh, to that point. Uh, and I know we are at that Christmas time where we uh, remember the new birth. Uh, and I know the minister is familiar with the good book, and there is a little verse there that talks about there being a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Now, I, I know the minister would wish to embrace at this stage, but because of COVID-19, we're not able to do that. So, uh, but uh, I do uh, wish her a peaceful Christmas, and let's hope that we have a good new year. So, Mr. Speaker, to that end, thank you. And uh, on that note, I might actually advise members that we're organising a hybrid uh, carol service this in the coming few days. You might be invited along if you continue to behave yourself. Um, I call Linda Dillon. I just don't know how to follow that. Um, I'll keep my remarks very, very brief. Just to concur with, with the chair, and obviously, I mean, in the, at the final stage, we will say more, but I would like to, to also place on the record the hard work of, of all of the committee, the minister and our officials, and obviously our, our committee staff and the bills clerk, who has had great patience, I can tell you, I'd say, with all of us. But um, everybody has worked very hard, and, and they've worked very hard because we believe in this bill, and that, you know, the chair talked about Christmas. And we all know that Christmas is a particular diff particularly difficult time for those who actually suffer from domestic abuse. So our thoughts will be with those people over the Christmas period, those who are stuck in their homes with their abusers and potential abusers. So just, just to say that for me, and, and I won't go into any detail, the Chair has covered the detail around these amendments, so there's no need to go into that any further. But I, I would say that these are extremely important amendments, whilst they may not be as contentious as some of those in the first grouping, they were really, really important to this committee because the first grouping is probably about trying to get the, the, the abuse bill right, you know, making sure that we have an actual offence on the books that will deliver for victims. But this grouping is about ensuring that the rollout of it is right, that the training is right that it's implemented in the best possible way so that it actually delivers for victims, and then reporting on that to ensure that where there are gaps, and there will be gaps, 
there's no, you know, we, we've worked really hard on this, but we know it's not perfect. Nobody, nobody in this chamber, I think, would believe for one second that it's going to be perfect. So the reporting on it and the independent oversight will be really important for what we do next. Because I know from my own point of view, and I, and I, I would absolutely believe that it would be the failing of, of, certainly of the rest of the committee, but I, I would say for everybody else in this chamber, this is not the finish for us. This is only the beginning. Domestic abuse has not even begun to be dealt with, and the offence is only one small part of it. So whatever committee you're on, you will be playing a role in dealing with this. Whatever part you play or role you play within this chamber and within this house, you will have your part to play on this, because this definitely is only the beginning of how we start to deal with domestic abuse. And we've all talked earlier on in, in debates and in the previous debates around the importance of education. And I just want to say it again to place it on the record. Education is vital, obviously, in terms of the training and those that will be rolling this out, but education on what a healthy relationship is. We don't want people to be found guilty of this offence. We want them not to commit it in the first place. And education is the only way that we'll stop that from happening. Educating our young people on what a healthy relationship is. And the conversation about telling young women how to look after themselves and protect themselves needs to stop. We need to be telling those who could be potential perpetrators or abusers in the future. You watch how you behave. You stop doing what you're doing. Not look after each other and, and, and keep those who may become victims safe. Stop the people who may become the victim makers. So I, I really think that education from, from all angles and from whatever way we can do it, and for me, Operation Encompass, as we talked about earlier, was part of that, because we know that the perpetrators of the future are the victims of yesterday. And they're, they're caught up in a cycle that nobody has protected them from, nobody has saved them from, and nobody has intervened in. So as an assembly, I hope that's what we will do. And I hope in the future, whenever they're reporting on this offence, that actually the numbers of people who are using this in the courts does not go up. It initially will. That's, that's obviously the way this will happen. It's, it's a new, new offence, so it will go up. But I hope at some point when we report, we start to see those figures coming down because we haven't just taken a very narrow approach and dealt with this as a criminal offence, but we've actually decided we're going to make a real change here and we're going to make real change for the people who need it most. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, and like the previous speaker, I will keep my comments brief on this. Um, ultimately, the, the Chair, and I thank the Chairperson for the Committee for Justice for so succinctly um, outlining the Committee position, and I think that was a fair and thorough assessment. Um, there are many things that the Committee teased out along the way. Training, oversight and reporting were three that made it. And members of this House will know and members of the committee will know that long conversations happened on many other issues that sat on the fringes or for some reason didn't progress at this stage. And ultimately what these three, um, these three important tools do is they sit with a framework that is the offence of domestic abuse. And, and that is the key objective at the initial stages of this bill. But I, I do think it's important that much of the conversation around issues that we didn't um, manage to progress or get to this stage are not completely outlined, that they still can and could come into play. Because once we have the training in place, and the Scottish model is the perfect example of showing us how important it is to get that piece right, then the oversight piece, there have been, um, the, the bill, I, ironically, while good, has not been the best process, and I think that has to be admitted by all. Um, while we were all very eager in our timeline to see it across the line, it did create very short windows of opportunity for us to be able to scrutinise and find detail and, and be able to come to this House fully informed as we should be. And the oversight role in this is the tool that can say some of these things have been carried on this bill on a promise. And if that's the case, we need somebody who's going to hold up and say, well, have those, has everything that was intended come to fruition? And that's why I think particularly at this late stage, the oversight role is starting to have perhaps more importance um, than originally, even though the intention was good as does the reporting. I think the reporting piece 
is basically the, we, we cannot anticipate every situation or every eventuality and we do have to have a reporting mechanism in place because that will be the critical tool in the future that will talk to us if we need to have additions, amendments or where resource should be directed to make this bill as good as it can be. And, and I don't want to appear screwed skipping over Christmas, but my mind quickly runs at this stage to the final stage. I don't want there to be any obstacles in the way. And I hope that the conversations in this House this evening and the actions of members in this House will give sufficient um, assurances to the Minister that there can be no stalemate on this. We do need a domestic abuse offence on statute as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, and I call Doug Biddy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't actually going to speak, but since I'm on my feet now, um, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll just address, um, which has not been a laboured process. I've got to say, it's been it's been a it's been a hard-fought process that we've gone through, um, uh, and I suppose we have um, focused a little bit on on the. Uh, on, on the legal aid, but there's so much more into it. In this particular group of, of amendments, I think we had a real success uh, in the training piece, um, and particularly in making sure that the training is, is an, annual and it's mandatory, uh, and it's going to be um, registered so we know what's taking place, so we can actually see if it's, if it's working. Uh, and that was done through collaboration from uh, the, the committee identifying uh, what it believed needed to happen, to engaging with the Minister and, and her um, officials, to the Minister coming back with, with an amendment to the amendment that we put in. And that's a good process, and I think that's the right process. Uh, and I think that's where um, I, I really see merit in the way that we've gone about this. And yes, we can say that people have got tetchy um, on certain issues, and they're tetchy on certain issues because it's important to them. They are not touchy on certain issues purely because they, they want to be obstructive or, or anything like that. I think it's, they really ha, have got a buy-in to this process, uh, and that is why it feels like they are being touchy. But if you just stand back a little bit, I suppose, and just try and look at what we are trying to achieve, it, this is a high-stakes game that we are in in many ways. In fact, the word game is the wrong word to use, but this is high stakes because if we had got this wrong, if we get this wrong, uh, it is people who are suffering domestic abuse uh, and their children who are going to suffer it. That is, that is men, that is women, and that is their children, teenagers and, and below. So, it, you know, it is, it is high stakes, uh, and I think we, we, um, we have to remember that. But we're drawing to uh, the end of this process, and in drawing to the end of this process, not just here today, but certainly uh, the, the, the final stage, uh, I honestly believe that all of the work that um, uh, we have put in, be that as a committee, be that as an assembly in general, be that the minister and her staff, uh, we will really be proud of what we have produced at the end of the day and it will help people who are in an extremely difficult position. So um, I will certainly be, and my party will be supporting uh, this second group of amendments. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Paula Bradshaw. I am just rising to say that we will be supporting all the amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul Frew, follow that. <laughs> Mr Speaker, you put me under so much pressure. Uh, can I just say that uh, this, grouping, this grouping here exemplifies exactly the relationship that we should have between committee and minister and department. It is the best model, best practice, acceleration that we could ever give. And by, what I mean by that is this. This bill, ten years ago, would have been unthinkable. If someone had said 10 years ago that we'll have to legislate for coercive control, nobody would have thought it possible. And I'm talking about MLAs, I'm talking about members in the street, I'm talking about victims' groups, and I'm talking about the judiciary. But we are in the cusp of making history. And so the minister, the department, the committees, and the members of this House should feel a sense of achievement that we can move this bill in the way we have. And I said at the second stage, I encouraged members to consider putting forward amendments that they seen fit to produce, because MLAs are people on the ground, 
they have constituents, they see victims on a weekly or daily basis, and they will know what they need to achieve in any given bill or legislation. And can I say, Mr. Speaker, that I am, I am satisfied with the content of the amendments and the context and the calibre of the amendments that come through on data collection, training, independent oversight and the reporting of this operation. And why are those aspects so important to this bill when they're maybe not so important to other bills or legislation? And it's simply because for the first time we have legislated or we are legislating for coercive control. And that's vitally important. Other jurisdictions are having to go twice at this. I suspect some will go three times at this. And I'm not saying that this bill is perfect, but with the reporting mechanisms, with the data collection, with the independent oversight, it means that we will get the best stab at it. And if we have to change or amend, we can do so in the future with the confidence of knowing that that data and that information and that oversight will be in place. And we will be able to move forward in confidence together, both minister, department, committees and assembly to make sure that we make this bill even better, that we protect even more victims. And that we and, and Linda Dell makes a very valid point about the seismic change that must take place out there with regards to us getting the message to the perpetrator. I agree one hundred percent. Whilst we must protect the victim, we must also change ways. We must also rid as much as possible the scourge of domestic violence and coercive control. And this is our best stab at it. And that gives us, and it should give us, a sense of achievement and satisfaction. But we must never lose sight of the people at the heart of this bill, and that is the victims and their families, both uh, fathers, mothers, and children of the victims, who feel and walk this journey with their relatives on a daily basis, who worry sick for the victims of domestic and violence and coercive control and the abuse that they suffer, who have tried their best to support their families through thick and thin, and who at times will feel completely and utterly helpless. This bill is also for all of those organisations, Women's Aid, MAP, all the other organisations, too many to mention, that are required and needed in this society today. I wish it wasn't so, but they are so much needed, and they do sterling work. This bill is for them, for, to help them, to arm them, and to support them in their works and what they do to supporting victims. I say this is a good day. I say this, we move on with confidence, and we get to the final stage as quickly as we can, and we deliver for the victims of domestic violence and, and coercive control. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I call Emma Rogan. From the beginning of this process of the, this bill, the need for adequate training and resourcing has been a core theme. Whilst we all um, agree that this legislation provides a drastic step change in our approach to tackling domestic abuse by ensuring the new domestic abuse offence more accurately encapsulates the horrors of domestic abuse in order for the legislation to be effective, it is crucial that we get it right in terms of training. Given the new offence relates to a course of behaviour, this will require the exercise of judgment by the police when they gather evidence and when attending incidents of domestic abuse. Therefore, a clear understanding and recognition of the behaviours associated with non-physical abuse is of paramount importance. This will be new to many of these officers, but if we are to properly protect victims from abuse, then a huge amount of responsibility will fall to these officers, and it is crucial that they are supported in their efforts and properly supported. Throughout our discussions with the officials, it became apparent that this clause would be strengthened, and I believe that the Minister's Amendment to 10 does this, and I am happy to support it. It will ensure that legally ensure that legally training must be provided to personnel within the PSNI and the PPS and any other body that has functions within the criminal justice system in connection with this offence, including the courts and the tribunal service and any other agency of the Department of Justice. It will ensure that such training must be provided at least annually and that it is mandatory. With regards to Amendment 11, the independent oversight, 
Independent oversight of the implementation of this legislation will bring a wide range of benefits that will be of such importance that this legislation is rolled out until it is fully embedded. It will make it mandatory for whoever is responsible for the independent oversight to report annually on the implementation of this legislation. And as has been said before, th this, is, this is new and, and we have are, are trying to get this right at, at this stage where other legislators and other, other jurisdictions are going at it time and time again. We are trying to, to get this, this done right and, and get it done first time. Further still, it will provide a crucial oversight on the content and the review of guidance, the importance of which has been and presumably will be again emphasised by other members. Independent external oversight has a number of advantages, including being able to review the operation of the legislation in great detail to ensure that it is operating as it is expected, and where it isn't, the recommendations will play a crucial role in making interventions where necessary. It can help monitor and review performance. It can ensure accountability of the department and of, of the agencies involved with dealing with domestic abuse incidents and prosecutions. It can collect, disaggregate and widely publish data which would help spot emerging patterns and trends. And it can build confidence among the organisations that support victims of domestic abuse. I note the Minister's intentions to begin work with a view to the introduction of a victim's, victim of crime commissioner, which may well carry many of the same functions as an independent person with responsibility for the oversight of this legislation. However, we cannot wait until a commissioner is in place. We have no timeline for this yet, and before we review the operation of this legislation, nonetheless, independent oversight and a victim's commissioner should complement one another rather than duplicate the work. And I welcome this. Thank you. And I call Sean Lynch. I get a, a can call you, and you'll be glad to know I'll try and keep this as short as possible. I'm going to specifically just uh, address my remarks uh, to Amendment 10. As a member of the Policing Board, I have a particular focus on the PSNA, who will play an absolute vital role in this new legislation. The new domestic abuse bill will mark a step change not only in how we deal with perpetrators of abuse, but also how we protect victims. Police officers are often the first responders to, uh, to incidents and who are responsible for gathering and collating evidence must be adequately supported in their efforts. If a perpetrator physically lashes out, um, out can often leave marks, bruises, cuts and scars. However, many forms of abuse are part of the new offence are more difficult to spot as perpetrators behave. Behaviour is often subtle and covert. Therefore, police, prosecutors, uh, judiciary must have a clear, thorough understanding and recognition of the behaviour associated with non-physical abuse. This is precisely why training will play an important role in the effectiveness of the implementation of this legislation. This is a point that has been raised time and time again by our party and many other parties, by victims and victims' organisations, and by many other stakeholders. So I'm glad that we are able to allay those concerns by including Amendment 10 in the Bill. Police officers, prosecutors and the judiciary are very capable of making this legislation a success. However, they must be supported in their duties. Amendment 10 will ensure that training must be legally provided in the PSNA, the PPS, the courts and tribunal services, and any other body that has functions within the criminal justice system in connection with domestic abuse. We all want to see this legislation be successful, not least those who will be on the front line protecting victims and tackling perpetrators. It is only right that we equip uh, personnel with the right tools and acknowledge um, to, and the knowledge to do so. I commend and support Amendment 10. Thank you, Gormagat, and I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak briefly on this positive group of amendments, as much as I would have liked to have said has already been covered. And just to concur with the comments made by the chair, the vice chair, and other members of the committee to get us here today, um, as well as crucially thanking the minister, her department, the committee staff, and the bill clerk, who have all done a fantastic job with us. Again, I wish to express my immense thanks to my researcher, who has done an outstanding job for me. I would like to speak on Amendment 9, the training requirement, which is absolutely crucial to this bill, especially when it becomes an act and something I have pushed for for months. In my view, for training for the PSNI, PPS and Judiciary is absolutely critical to the effective implementation of this legislation. And as I said at consideration stage, this has been fundamentally important in the effective rollout and adoption of the Scottish legislation, the so-called gold standard. Amendment 9 changes the former committee amendment, now clause 30 of the bill, to put the onus on the PSNI, PPS and Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service to provide training as they consider appropriate for their personnel and staff to allow for effective discharge of their responsibilities in relation to this. And whilst this is a difference to what the committee amendment had done, placing a duty on the department, I still think it holds merit. I am glad that this is forming part of the bill now at further consideration stage and has the backing of the Justice Committee. Other wording has tidied up the clause, which I also welcome. I would again raise the fundamental issue that goes hand in hand with training, that is the sufficient allocation of resources for this to happen to the fullest and most appropriate way for staff within those organisations and bodies. I would also urge again for all members of the criminal justice system to be trained fully in this new offence, including the judiciary, just as it happened in Scotland, whereby the Judicial Institute commissioned training for all judges and sheriffs. Indeed, the courses also gave participants an insight into the impact of criminal behaviour on victims and children. Before the Scottish Act came into force, newly appointed sheriffs and summary sheriffs had received training specifically on the issue of domestic abuse as part of their mandatory induction course. Specific training on domestic abuse issues have also been incorporated as appropriate into other training courses focusing on family cases, vulnerable witnesses, courtroom technology and sentencing. And I would welcome that this would happen as a matter of urgency in order to roll this out in much needed legislation as best as we can. I welcome the Department's changes to Amendment 12 and the fact that reporting will not end automatically, as was previously envisioned, but the Assembly will now have a scrutiny and oversight role in determining when this requirement will cease. Originally, the Department had drafted this with a sunset provision, and I understand that there may be a future scenario where these monitoring and evaluation exercises are no longer required, but it shouldn't happen automatically. And I welcome the Minister adopting part of the previous amendment that I had brought on reporting on consideration stage and including the requirement on aggravation as outlined in 1, 8, 9 and 15. Amendment 14 as well, the work on the report and re proposals in relation to the av availability of legal aid for victims and survivors will commence straight away and that's also very welcome. To finish, Mr Speaker, I wish to reiterate to those people who we are trying to legislate to and protect if you are at risk of abuse or a victim of a domestic abuse, please reach out. Please make a call or contact someone. Contact the amazing support organisations that are there, to the police, to your health professional or GP, or to somebody that you trust. And if it's an emergency, please call 999. Please do not continue to suffer in silence. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and just to, I suppose, um, refer back um, to where we are with this. Um, as members are aware, Amendment 9 will remove um, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals um, service from that uh, body's advised about data collection, given that that would simply be a reiteration of my department advising itself and would be a bit of a legislative oddity. Amendment 10 deals with training and responsibility for this will now sit with the correct organisations. I appreciate in particular Sean Lynch's contribution on this as a member of the Policing Board. Um, and I think it's right that the Policing Board should have their role um, recognised in terms of scrutiny um, of operational policing. Amendment 11 allows for independent oversight function, providing annual reports and recommendations to the Department on the effectiveness of Part 1 of the Bill. Amendment 12 provides for a departmental report on operation of Part 1, providing a range of data and information rela relating to it. Taken together, these ensure that we can effectively consider how the offence is operating and any changes that may be needed. 
Members are, of course, aware that any legislation, once it is in operation, may not necessarily work exactly as was anticipated. And so it is important that we are able um, to consider the impact of the offence, how it is being implemented, and what changes, if any, are needed in order to refine it. Amendments 14 and 15 deal with commencement, while Amendments 16 and 17 adjust the long and short titles of the Bill to better reflect um, the amended Bill. In concluding, Mr Speaker, um, I want to thank all of those who have participated, um, not just in this debate on Group 2, um, but in all of the debates on the way through um, this Bill. I want to thank them for engaging with this um, particular issue, um, and I believe that as a result of that engagement with justice partners, with the committee, with the voluntary and third sector partners, and most of all, with those victims themselves who came forward and spoke directly with me and with the committee about their experiences, it is hugely important that they did so, Mr Speaker, and it has helped shape this bill for the better for them and for the victims who have not yet been able to access protection under the current law. Mr Speaker, this legislation is hugely important to me and to the members of this House, but most of all, it is important to those who are affected by domestic abuse. I want to thank my departmental officials, committee and, uh, the committee members and committee officials, your own staff and indeed other members of this House staff for facilitating what have often been quite long um, and uh, time-consuming debates. Mr Speaker, as we are all um, turning our minds to Christmas, and I think we've even had something of a Christmas ceasefire, which is quite retro, it feels like the 80s, um, but I just want to wish the Chair and the committee um, a very peaceful and a very safe Christmas. I hope that Santa is generous um, to them and to their loved ones, and that they get some good rest, because, Mr Speaker, we have plenty more legislation where this bill came from in 2021. I also, um, though, Mr Speaker, as we do think of Christmas, I want to remember those for whom home is not a safe place. I want to think about those for whom Christmas is not a time of peace and rest and joy. And I want to assure them that we will return to complete this bill at the earliest stage possible in the new year. And in the meantime, I would appeal to those who suffer in silence to speak up, to seek help, to seek protection. You are not alone. You deserve protection, and the police and our statutory and voluntary partners are there to help at Christmas, just as at any other time of the year. Do not wait. Make the call. Take that step. Keep you and yours safe this Christmas and at all other times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, and for your concluding remarks. And amendment proposed to clause 29, page 15, line 21. Leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that amendment 9 be made. All those in favour say aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. Amendment 10 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 10. Beg to move. Amendment proposed leave out clause 30 and replace with a new clause training within relevant bodies, as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 10 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 11 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 11. I beg to move. Amendment proposed leave out clause 31 and replace with a new clause independent oversight of this part as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 11 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 12 has already been debated and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 12. Beg to move. Amendment proposed leave out clause 32 and replace with a new clause report on the operation of this part, as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 12 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 13 has already been debated, and I call the Chairperson of the Committee for Justice, Paul Given, to move formally Amendment 13. I beg to move. The amendment proposed to Clause 38, page 32, line 27, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. Aye. No. 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 Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
Okay, members, order members, please resume the seats. Okay, members, thank you. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. Aye. Do we have tellers? Do we have tellers? Okay, members, tellers have been appointed as follows. Tellers for the eyes are Paul Fru and Paul Given. Tellers for the nose are Paula Bradshaw and Kelly Armstrong. And before the Assembly divides, I want to remind people that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I also remind people to always ensure social distancing continues to be observed while the division is taking place. Clear lobbies, the Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
result in impact. Clerk, please read the result. 69 members voted, 25 members voted aye, 44 members voted no, 11 members who voted in both lobbies are not included in these results. The amendment is negatived. Okay, the amendment falls. Amendment 14 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 14. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to clause, to clause 38, page 32, line 27, and certain words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 14 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 15 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally Amendment 15. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to clause 38, page 32, line 27. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 15 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 16 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 16. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to clause 39, page 32, line 33. Leave out and insert words printed words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 16 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 17 has already been debated, and I call the Minister of Justice to move formally. Amendment 17. I beg to move. Amendment proposed to a long title. Leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 17 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes the further consideration stage of the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. And the bill now stands referred to the speaker. And can I also add thanks to uh, all of the other thanks that were issued earlier um, to all of our staff in the business office, the usher services, Hansard, the Assembly Broadcasting, Urest, and our officials in the speaker's office. And on that basis, then uh, could I ask members now to take a raise. We move on to the final item on the order paper tonight.